retail trade. Kind of parsing through the numbers for the late breaking earnings news, and we'll cap things off with our third financial of the morning. It's not a big bank, but rather the world's biggest asset manager. Uh, shares of BlackRock higher by roughly two percent right now, just over seven thousand shares of volume. This is the parent company of products like those iShares exchange traded funds, also Life Path target date funds, amongst others. They reported profits and revenues that both topped estimates. BlackRock was helped along by continued strong markets that led to an increase in assets under management, which in turn leads to more 
fee income from those. By the way, those assets under management did hit a record $10.5 trillion during the quarter. That's up $1.4 trillion from last year. Now, for more on that story, be sure to tune in to Squawk on the Street later on in the 9 a.m. Eastern Time Hour when BlackRock CEO Larry Fink joins for a first on CNBC interview. Becky, that's the current state of play. Still going through the numbers. I'll send things back over to you. Okay, Dom, thank you very much. And again, folks, if you want to take a quick look at the Dow laggards, J.P. Morgan is at the top of that list right now. It's down by about 3.5%. The Dow was in positive territory. The Dow yeah, was Becky. when we started the show at 6 a.m. You can see that things have taken a turn for the worse. The Dow looks like it's down by about triple digits. J.P. Morgan Chase down by 3.5%. Chips were already putting pressure um, not just on the Dow but on the NASDAQ as well. Intel, you can see, is off by about 1.7%, followed up by Salesforce and Apple. Right now, with more reaction to J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo earnings, David George joins us. He is Baird's senior research analyst. And what did you think looking through these numbers? Because even though both of those bank banks beat on both the bottom and the top line, you are looking at uh, both the stocks selling off. Yeah, that's right. Good morning. Uh, fr from our perspective, in terms of the stocks, keep in mind that, that both of these names have had big moves uh, so far in 2024. And, and I think there was an expectation that uh, both companies were going to guide up, uh, Becky, with respect to net interest income. So um, I think that there was some hopes, particularly out of J.P. Morgan, that we were going to see a little more upside uh, as it relates to net, to net interest income. And, and unfortunately, we didn't get that. But again, uh, the quarter was fine. Credit quality was good. Markets, businesses were good. They did beat Q, uh, Q1 on both top and bottom line. So I think it's important to have that perspective that the quarter was good, uh, but at 2.4 times tangible, uh, Becky, from a valuation standpoint, the market simply won and more. David, is that... Um, That's what you think, buddy. It's overpriced, you we beast. We got the CPI numbers on Wednesday that showed consumer inflation was hotter than expected. You got PPI yesterday that showed producer prices not hotter than expected. Exactly. If you're going to raise your net interest income, it's going to be on the idea that you are much more convinced that the Fed's not going to raise rates anytime soon. That, that may just be a step too far for any of these banks to jump to that. And by not saying it, maybe they're just being conservative and playing it smart. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I was just going to say that, that I, I do think they're being conservative. Uh, but, but again, that, that the hope springs eternal, particularly with uh, uh, forward expectations with the Fed. And as you mentioned, expectations have been incredibly volatile. So I think in both cases uh, that there is some conservatism in place, but this is simply a situation of, of some profit taking after very strong moves in both of these stocks. From our standpoint, both of them are very crowded uh, in the investment community. So uh, a little bit of softness today is, is not particularly surprising given, again, those guys were just a little light, I think, relative to maybe what uh, market participants were hoping for. We haven't heard from Citi just yet. We will be hearing from them later today. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Citi, which is your favorite of these three? We're neutral on uh, both J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. Um, Wells Fargo, we were uh, big bulls on for uh, the last couple of years, and we downgraded it earlier uh, in the first quarter simply on valuation. And J.P. Morgan, we've been uh, neutral on over the near term for the same reason. Our preference, Becky, has really been in that regional bank group, the valuation and risk reward trade-offs, and from our standpoint at least, is much more attractive. Stocks like Comerica, Truist, Key, Huntington um, look much more attractive on a valuation basis relative to the mega caps, which from our standpoint are much more crowded and, and a lot more expensive. You didn't mention City. Yeah, we don't cover City, so I can't really give you anything there. Uh, my apologies, but uh, again, that's no, our that's view. That's good to know. I, I wasn't sure why it was left out. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't like, oh, they really stink or, oh, they're really great. <laughs> so, uh, David, thank you for clarifying, and thank you for talking through these results so quickly with us. Sure, thanks. Good morning. Meantime, when we come back, uh, U.S. steel shareholders getting set to vote on the big plant takeover by Japan's Nippon Steel, but the Steel Workers Union has some issues, as you know. Longtime steel industry executive uh, Dan Demetrius is going to be joining us. He's in that camp and he's been speaking out on social media. He joins us after this.
Welcome back to Squawk Box. Shareholders of U.S. Steel will vote today on the planned takeover of the company by Japanese firm Nippon Steel. This comes amid the Steelworkers Labor Union opposing this buyout. Our next guest says the deal should not happen regardless of the vote. Joining us right now is Newport Chairman uh, Emeritus uh, Dan DeVico. Good morning to you. You've been uh, relatively outspoken on this issue, but uh, we'll give you the, the floor and the mic to make your case. What's your problem with this deal? Morning, Andrew. Long time no see, long it's time no talk long, to. It's been a while. Great to I have understand. you here. It's great to be on again. I understand Becky is with you this morning. Hi, Andrew. Yes. Right? Hi, Dan. Hi, Becky. Listen, the first things first, okay? Today's a Friday, right? And throughout my career, I celebrated Red Shirt Friday, which I have a red shirt on today to honor our men and women in the military, past, present, and future. Um, and I appreciate you letting me get that uh, in. Um, and uh, as you know, I've been retired now for 10, 10 years, but still very active um, through a number of different organizations in uh, bringing manufacturing back and strengthening manufacturing in our country and our supply chains. Um, with regard to this deal, let me just say this. For too long, we've allowed ourselves to, 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 to see our manufacturing sector become decimated uh, in this country. For decades, the steel industry has been under attack from illegally traded steel. Uh, we've won numerous, hundreds of trade cases, many of them against Nippon. Nippon is probably as guilty as anybody in undermining the strength of the U.S. steel industry over the decades. Um, and I'd like to make one very important point. No U.S. steel company would ever be allowed to buy Nippon Steel. If we approached Nippon to buy them, and heaven be surprised, they actually agreed, the Japanese government would never allow it. Never. Um, you just can't do it. There's no reciprocity on things like this. Um, and uh, it would be ridiculous for us to allow basically a state-driven Nippon Steel, uh, Japan Inc., if you will, to come in here and buy up one of our largest U.S. steel makers. Dan, the Wall Street think, Journal, yeah. let me just finish, the Wall Street Journal would never write an editorial about the fact that the Japanese wouldn't allow us to buy Nippon Steel, all right? There would be no talk of protectionism. There'd no, be no talk of isolationism. There'd be nothing about uh, any kind of protectionism, okay, or any other ism. You would never even see an article in the Wall Street Journal about it. But here you got the Wall Street Journal and others saying, oh no, we should let this happen. So Dan, let me just play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, and I'm actually not sure even personally where I stand on this, but I, I'm, there is an argument to be made that the United States is different than Japan. It's hopefully very different than China. Uh, it's different than a lot of other countries. And uh, that one of the things that makes the United States such a remarkable country is that we are open and hopefully open oftentimes to investment um, from around the world. And in this case, we would be open uh, to investment from an ally. This is not China, for example, or, or uh, some type of adversary of ours. What do you make of that argument? This is not a political issue. Okay, this is not that, that we are attacking a friend, because Japan is a friend. Um, as you well know, throughout my career, I've been involved with a joint venture with our Japanese partners, Model Kogyo in Japan, called Nukori Model Steel. And as chairman and CEO, we've had, I, I can, we continued that relationship to this day, um, and it's been a great relationship. This is not anything against Japan per se as a friend or as a trading partner, okay? Or as, as a national or global strategic partner in a war against uh, what's building up with respect to China in the, in the Southeast and in Asia. It's got nothing to do with that. Um, what it does have to do with is us being stupid, okay? Open does not mean stupid. As you well know, I've, I've been anti-free trade for 30 years. Why? Because there's no such thing as free trade in the world. We're the only dummies that allow anybody to come into our country and do what they want. 
The rest of the world keeps us out. And they dump our product in our marketplace, flaunting the trade laws that we all agreed to. This is not a matter of open versus closed. This is a matter of legal versus illegal activities that have influenced our steel industry and helped destroy it over the years. It's also a matter of, you know, reciprocity. And it's a matter of national security. Okay? We have to have a strong East steel industry. Right. As an example. So, Dan, I don't, dis I don't disagree with that wanting to have a strong uh, steel industry or, and, and what it means for manufacturing jobs. I think oftentimes we talk about reciprocity and we say, well, if, if this country would allow us to invest in this particular kind of company, we should build it, it should be, it should be one for one. But the, the flip side to that argument is that the United States has been one of the great beneficiaries of being able to invest and open, um, open up uh, countries all over the world and do business in, in all of these places, which has benefited us enormously. Maybe not in, in, in the reciprocal way that you're describing from the manufacturing perspective, but, it, but that there has been, uh, we have been, the, it's been a, a boon over the last 50 years. And so there is this question of how do you, how do you continue to have that benefit, if you will, while also trying to keep as much manufacturing here at the same time? First off, we have not benefited. The working class, middle class has been decimated by the destruction of our manufacturing sector over the last 30 years. Um, and because of that, we no longer can make our own products. We can't make our own pharmaceuticals. We can't make our own, uh, uh, take care of our own supply chains on a number of different issues, a number of different products. Our manufacturing sector has been basically decimated, all right? And, and that's a failed approach. That has not been good for the United States. We can't even make our own munitions anymore. Okay, we're running out of the other shoes in the war against Ukraine, right? So my point here is that no, not everybody's benefited. In fact, it's been very destructive. It has completely undermined our ability to take care of ourselves in a world that is very dangerous. Pure stupidity allowed that to happen. Pure greed and pure mistaken ideas about how we can make the world a better place by letting our markets be destroyed by our trading partners. Okay, so it's not a matter of open. Of course we're open, but we have to be open smart. We have to be open in a way that allows us to continue to be a strong leader in the world. And we've allowed our manufacturing sector and the steel is part of it to be decimated, to be destroyed, okay, over the decades. And, and that's put us in a position where we can't fend for ourselves and we can't be the, that shining light on the hill that can be there for the rest of the world. And God knows this country needs to be there for the rest of the world today, despite our imperfections and in spite of our mistakes. Right. Dan, and it's, a powerful, it, it's, it's a powerful Please. message. Uh, we, we, we got, we uh, uh, unfortunately have to run, uh, but uh, we're very glad to both see you because your ride has been too long, uh, and to hear that message. And we will uh, see you back anytime. Thank you. Have a good time, Andrew. You too. Nice to see you, Dan. Uh, when we come back, the threat of a possible Iranian attack on Israel growing by the hour. The latest on the Middle East war and America's response is next. And later, Anti-Defamation League National Director Jonathan Greenblatt will join us with new data on campus anti-Semitism. Right now, though, as we head to a break, here's today's AFLAC trivia question. The Postal Service plans on raising the price of stamps to 73 cents. What was the price of the first stamp issued in the U.S. in 1847? We've got the answer when Squawk Box returns. I've got a guess. We'll be right back.
NBC. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. Here is the answer for today's AFLAC trivia question. The Postal Service plans on raising the price of stamps to 73 cents later this year. What was the price of the first stamp that was issued in the U.S. all the way back in, 19, in 1847? Believe it or not, the answer is five cents. The Ben Franklin stamp debuted on July 1st, 1847 in New York City. And if you compare that with the inflationary prices for everything else, that's actually not bad in terms of an inflationary price. Of course, you don't have a pony uh, that needs to deliver it these days, but there's your answer. New reports that Israel is preparing for a direct attack by Iran in the next day or two. This follows Israel's assassination of several Iranian generals last week. Joining us right now on how to put this all in context for us is Kareem Sajapur. He's a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Middle East Program. And Kareem, thank you for being with us today because there's a, a, a lot to kind of digest and figure out what's happening here. Um, these reports are very concerning that there is an attack that's imminent in the next day or two. How, how would you tell us to be uh, looking at all of this? Well, Becky, I think Iran has to very carefully calibrate its response because on one hand, if, they, if their response is seen to be too weak, their retaliation is too weak, then they risk losing face. But if their response is too aggressive, they risk losing their heads. I'm always reminded of the, the quote from Hannah Arendt, uh, who said that even the most radical revolutionary, the day after the revolution becomes a conservative because they have a lot to lose, they want to preserve what they've gained. And likewise, the Iranian regime controls a you know, vast nation state with a lot of oil wealth. Um, and their supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, is one of the longest serving dictators in the world. He's been ruling for three, four decades now. And I think it's unlikely he is going to risk a, a full-blown war with Israel. What is Iran's objective here? You know, the, uh, the ideology of the Iranian revolution, you can really distill it down to essentially three things now. Number one, they want to try to evict America from the Middle East. Number two, they want to replace Israel with Palestine. And number three, they want to try to bring down the U.S.-led world order. But they've always done this uh, via proxy, meaning when they either uh, attack um, um, U.S. outposts or, or they go after Israel, it's via their regional proxies, whether that's uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, the Shia militias in Iraq. Uh, up until now, it's been unprecedented. They would launch an attack from Iranian soil against Israel, inside Israel. But we should see things differently this time around? There's a more likelihood that this would be a direct attack? Certain risk is now um, uh, greater than before. At the end of the day, as I said, Mahmoud Iran, a 84-year-old team leader who has had long-time strategic, strategic doctrine of you know attacking the United States, Israel, via proxy. Now, want to risk the stability of his own game. Uh, I, I would like to see, uh, for example, uh, attacks on Israeli embassies in the Arab world, perhaps, and Jordan. He knows that Israel is a very those embassies, so if they were to uh, attack one of those embassies, the risk of killing the diplomats is low, so therefore the risk of retention is low. It would be a symbolic victory for Iran. It would win propaganda points in the Arab world. Those are the type of things that I think more likely than Iran launch attacks from its own territory inside of Israel. So, uh, Kareem, we are losing. We're taking some hits with the feed, but I, I hear what you're saying just in terms of uh, thinking that an attack on the Israeli embassy in Jordan would be more likely because that's closed and it could potentially win some points um, in the Jordan, Jordanian streets. Um, again, that's Kareem Sajapur joining us to talk a little bit about this huge threat and kind of imminent uh, warning on a potential attack. Meantime, uh, when we come back, a lot more on Squawk, the state of the consumer and where they are spending money. And then later, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy hitting back at regulators of Big Tech is handling the pressure from the FTC and the DOJ. We'll talk about that as we take to a break. A look at this morning's leaders 
on the NASDAQ. Squawk Box coming right back after this. Squawk Reuters reporting now that Apple lawsuits bid to throw out a mass lawsuit that was brought in London uh, on behalf of over 1,500 app developers over its app store fees. The case, with up to roughly a billion dollars, alleges that Apple charged third-party developers unfair commissions of up to 30% on purchases of apps or other content. This has been an ongoing debate, just a different one in this context about what's happening in London. But we will see uh, where any of these cases land, but obviously the U.S. government now going after this as well. And in the meantime, the Biden administration announcing more than a quarter of a million student loan borrowers who have been in repayment for at least a decade will have their debts canceled. The 277,000 borrowers who will have $7.4 billion in debt wiped out will receive emails starting today indicating they've been approved for debt cancellation. The latest round of loan cancellations is a result of the Department of Education's recent changes and improved oversight of income-driven repayment plans and their popular public service loan forgiveness program. Controversial yep. practice, it's one that they've been um, under attack the Biden administration and there have been lawsuits that There's have been There's gonna be more lawsuits. Away. Yeah. There's gonna be more lawsuits. When we come back, how consumers are feeling about the economy. Steve Leisman has the results of the latest CNBC National Retail Federation monitor. And later, what the next round of tax reform could look like. American Action Forum President Douglas Holtz Eakin will join us to talk about his latest Wall Street Journal op-ed. Squawk Box will be right back.
10. All right, everybody, we have our early read on last month's consumer spending ahead of the government's own numbers. Our senior economics reporter, Steve Gleesman, joins us right now with the CNBC NRF Retail Monitor. Looking forward to hearing this. What's Here we go. Consumers expecting continued moderately strong spending in March spending. That looks even better when you consider that inflation, the consumer side of inflation, is flat and even negative when it comes to goods. The CNBC NRF Retail Monitor, we get real credit card spending data from Affinity Solutions. It shows retail sales, X autos and gas, that's our headline number, up 0.4%. That compares with a 0.4% gain in February. Uh, year over year remains the same at 27 And then do core retail, which takes out restaurants, and we're 0.2 versus 0.3, but don't get too excited because it's 0.23 versus 0.27. That rounding is not that big a deal. I'm calling it a wash. Um, but the, the uh, year over year did tick down. Still a strong number, 2.9% versus 3% in February. Take a look at the history, considerable volatility over the past several months. But spending has now bounced back into positive territory for two months in a row now. After that January decline, people thought maybe that January decline was the beginning of this long-awaited consumer slowdown. Well, we're still waiting for that, as you might imagine, Becky. Uh, looking ahead now um, at the sectoral breakdown, we have a pretty much even uh, uh, split here. Three up, three down. Um, total six up, six down. But the non-store retail is up to your internet, up 2.5%. That's strong. Food and beverage, that's strong, up 1.2%. Sporting goods and hobbies. Good to see that sector up strong. That's a completely or almost completely discretionary topic. But there's all your home-related stuff, furniture and home furnishings, building and garden supplies, both down in a big way in the month of, uh, of March. Um, electronics and appliances down 2.3%. It's interesting. You had a big decline in prices for both of those. Appliances could be related to a weak housing market. Electronics could be related to just some deflation on televisions and that kind of stuff. All right, despite higher overall inflation, Goods inflation, you can see here, has been flat to negative in eight of the past 12 months. You might have missed this when you were blinded, perhaps, by the the, the, the uh, shining light of higher inflation numbers. But the goods part actually has been flat or negative. Consumers are looking for value, and there's a competitive market out there, says the NRF, bristling at the idea that there's price gouging going on by retailers. But this could also mean something to think about possible margin pressure depending upon what's happening with the input costs and the labor costs. We get a piece of the input cost today. We get import prices at 8.30 this morning. Yesterday's wholesale price report suggested only modest price pressure for those input costs. This is the six-month anniversary of our CNBC NRF index. And here's how it looks relative to the census data. I'm going to say this looks um, relative to the data generally tracking it. A bit more stable, of course. We don't have to revise this data because we're using real data on the inputs from credit cards. We get the um, census guides on Monday, the retail sales report, um, and this number here is in line with where the consensus is on the census retail data. Okay, I want to take this and add it to what we heard earlier this week from the Bank of America Institute. Okay. Because they actually saw spending up for the month of March. I think it was a gain uh, on households because they're looking at real households too. They have something yeah. like 69 million households and small businesses that they're watching. Um, consumer card spending per household of 0.3% year over year in March, but that was boosted because the early year over year, month to month, 0 0.3 year over year, three of 0.3% following a leap year that was boosted by 2.9%. So they saw real big numbers in March, okay. February because of the leap. I year. think if there's 2.9, is that relative to three or two point? I'm looking at the numbers okay. right here. All right. Um, up 0.3% year over year in March. Uh, but when you adjusted it, you know what, though? It says year over year, but I bet you're right. I bet it's month over It's got to be month over month. The decline when they adjusted. I, I want to interrupt you real quick. They had conniptions, to use the Yiddish phrase, with the leap year. Right. Yeah. We, it's terrible. It's but hardly it's hard to do. You can't adjust it. Not just the leap year, but right. then you had Easter that got pulled into March, and that maybe pulled from April. Did you ever they, see the they, algorithm for Easter? Adjusted, it was actually numbers that were down. Yeah. If you seasonally. It's hard. Them. What we did, I, I'm glad you asked this, Becky. Another brilliant question. Um, first of all, leap year gave us terrible fits last month. But we actually pulled the data back before we published it to go over it one more time because one extra day on 30 days is, is, is a big number. Yeah. What we did with this comparison, and thanks to Matt Shea, who's a really smart economist, the NRF, who I work with on this stuff. Um, not Matt Shea, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Matt is his first name, but I'll get it the last name. No, Matt Shea is the president. Oh, yeah. Uh, the economist I work with. I'm just having a, a senior moment here. But, um, 
what we did is for this comparison purposes, we threw out the 29th day okay. to compare March to February, okay? And the February game for this purpose. But we didn't, if you remember- You have the Easter that gets pulled into March, which makes March on the year over year look weirder too. It does, except for I do believe that the X11 seasonal adjustment software program, I think it takes care of that. Okay. I think it does. Okay. But these are squirrely moments here for the retail index. Right now, I'm seeing 04 versus 04. Looks pretty good to me. I saw um, the split between six up and six down in the sectors and the categories with a lot of that weakness associated with housing. That makes sense to me. I still see a good amount of discretionary spending going on. What I think matters here is we're, my overall take on the economy right now is there are a lot of risks out there, but not a lot of evident weaknesses. Risks become weaknesses, so I'm, I'm worried about that we have the risk of the consumer slowing down. Right. I don't see the weakness of this consumer slowdown. Because we have been looking for this for We've, a very, how long? <laughs> a very long time. A very, a very long time. And I'll We've get you. All, all such concerns to this point. I have to get you the last name of this individual. Okay. While you're doing that, yeah. we're going to do this. We'll come on back in just a moment. Coming up, uh, Anti-Defamation League National. Mark Matthews, Mark Matthews, excuse me. Mark Matthews. That's why I got confused. Shout out to Mark Matthews. 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 Mark Matthews, the economist. In our, I'm so sorry, Mark. When we come back, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt joining us with a report card. Uh, grading universities on how they respond to anti-Semitism on campus. Find out which schools are passing and failing. Check out the futures right now. With that Dow off about 91 points, NASDAQ now down 91 points, the SP 500 off about 18 points. We got a slew of earnings reports from the big financials this morning. We'll come right back.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Let's take a look at the futures this morning because the picture has improved from where we were uh, maybe 40 minutes ago or so. You can see right now, Dow futures are still down, but only by about 65 points. There was a bigger sell-off earlier, with the S&P right now down by 15, the NASDAQ off by 80. Part of that is because of what's been happening with the financials. We got uh, reports from J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo at the top of the hour. Both of them came in with numbers that were better than anticipated, both on the top and the bottom line, but the stock sold off. In fact, J.P. Morgan was down by 3.5%, potentially on some concerns about what might happen with net interest income from here. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon saying that they expect more normalization with the net interest income, normalization meaning maybe not quite as lucrative. Wells Fargo did not increase its net income, net interest income expectations for the full year. And that was a little disappointing to the street because uh, what you've seen this week is maybe expectations that the Fed won't raise rates quite as quickly. However, that initial knee-jerk reaction has um, smoothed out to, to some extent. Wells Fargo shares are actually trading higher now. They're up by about six-tenths of a percent. J.P. Morgan shares are down, but only by, by, by about 2.1% versus what we had seen down more than 3.5% earlier. Meantime, the Anti-Defamation League is out with a report card for universities grading 85 schools on rates of anti-Semitism and campus responses to discrimination against Jewish students. MIT, Harvard, and Princeton are among those who failed. They got an F. While uh, Brandeis and Elon University receiving uh, uh, A's. Joining us right now with more on this, Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO and National Director of the ADL. So, um, you know, most people go to Harvard, get straight A's to get into Harvard. Right. And now you're, you're giving them an F. They're not going to be used to that. Well, look, it is long overdue for these universities that get issue grades to get graded themselves and how they're handling Jewish students. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, af there has been anti-Semitism on these campuses for years, but after 10-7, Andrew, it exploded. Yeah. And so that, that was the right. point of the report card was to create an objective baseline and a, like an analytic framework to evaluate how are they doing and to encourage them to do better. Well, so that was what I was going to say. This is like, I mean, now that you have this grading system, mm -hmm. have you gotten a response from these universities? Oh, yes. And are they, is it like U.S. News and World Reports, which, by the way, has, has, has perverted the, uh, the, the education system in its own way, but sure. people desperately want to be higher ranked on the right. system. So I assume people don't want to get an F, and they were hoping that next year they will get an A. Well, it's a good question. I mean, we thought about, as we were thinking about doing this, we thought about what's the best way to approach this issue? What's the best way to encourage a race to the top? And because I heard from parents all over the country, is it safe for my child to go to this school? Students would say, they're applicants. Is it okay if I go to a Harvard or an MIT? They want to know, will they be adequately protected? Will they be supported? So we thought about a ranking like that, but that's the wrong idea. For us, we want everyone to get an A. It's not great inflation, so this will hopefully push well, them to be better. A serious question. I hope they're all now, serious. Now, I know, but this is this is it. I want to just put it on the table. Shoot. You got kids? I got three. How old? Uh, 2019 and 14. Okay. So and one of them's at an Ivy League school. Right. So here's where I was going to go with this. Let's say the 19-year-old one was 17. Yeah. Okay. And let's say they got into any one of the schools that you just gave an, gave an F to. Yep. Including Harvard, etc. Yep. Okay. Which People would say, oh my God, I got my kid into Harvard. I, I, I won the, the parent lottery. I've done yep. everything right. Yep. Would you tell your child not to go to that school? So look, so again, my son is at one of the schools that did very, very badly. But the truth is, is you can't just take the entire dimensions of a university and distill it into one grade. But what this grading system does do, Andrew, is for me as a parent, it allows me to know, is the school doing enough? Are they taking action? Do they have the right policies? What's the climate like? So again, but, but, but when the parent call, oh, take yeah. the kids out of it. When the when some parent is calling you saying, "My kid's a senior. Yeah. This guy into X Y Z schools. I know they got an F on all of your your report cards." Um, are you saying to them, "Okay, go to the school that has an A," or you, what are you saying to them? What I'm saying is, go in eyes wide open. You need to know, and your student needs to prepare for what's gonna happen. Let me give you an example. I spent the day yesterday at Harvard Law School. This is arguably the top law school, not just in the United States, in the world. And the stories that I heard from the Jewish students were abominable. I heard about a student government, you know, literally throwing the rules, you know, out the window in order to pass anti-Israel resolutions. I heard about Jewish students 
who have been isolated, alienated, and I heard about an administration that's not helping them, oh, not responding to emails, not responding to phone calls, What, what do the administrators say when, when you issue a grade like You know, look, we work with Claudine Gay at Harvard, and we're talking to Alan Garber now. Some of these administrators, and I've got, you know, in emails in my inbox this morning, from university presidents saying this, and from parents right. saying this is unfair. This doesn't adequately represent life at my school. But you know what? If you don't have the right policies, Becky, if you haven't taken the right actions, if you're not supporting your Jewish students, grade speaks for itself. Let me ask you a different question. We were talking about DEI yeah. earlier in the six o'clock hour. Yeah. Because one of the things that's very interesting that just happened was that Harvard yesterday yes. decided they were going to bring back standardized tests. Saw that. And these are all, in some ways, interconnected issues. Uh -huh. Is your sense that, and, and, and you have been outspoken, I think, about just how the DEI programs, at least as constructed, don't include anti-Semitism in the right ways? We know that they don't, yes. But does that mean, ultimately, that, and I, you, can, you can see it now, the pendulum is swinging back, it right. feels like, on DEI, I think that's mm -hmm. one of the indications is this, uh, is, the, yeah. is the requirement for the SAT. Yep. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it that the DEI programs need to be shifted and adjusted in different ways? So I'm someone who believes that diversity education is incredibly important. We are better colleagues or managers or classmates if we better understand the people around us and what they've been through in their backgrounds. But Andrew, to your point, if your idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion perpetuates the exclusion of Jews, that's wrong. So DEI, as it's currently constructed, needs to be rethought, reimagined, and repurposed. Right. Look, and you're I believe okay that. D, you're okay with DEI short of that? Well, look, we live in the most multicultural, you know, pluralistic society in the world, Becky. But I, so I think, again, diversity education is important. But when we force our kids to play in the oppression Olympics, everyone loses. So some of the core tenets of what I call the DEI ideology definitely don't work, even though diversity and inclusion are incredibly important and right. needs to still be part of it. That's how I see it. So standardized testing is not something I'm an expert in, right. but I want these schools to get diversity right rather than the way they're doing it now. John Greenblatt, it's great to see you this morning. Thank you guys. Thanks for this Friday morning. All right, when we come back, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy taking aim at regulators who are increasingly blocking mergers. We spoke to Andrew yesterday. We're gonna talk antitrust after this break with a former FTC commissioner.
over 60% of the units we sell are sold by third party sellers. Um, so, you know, it's not hard to actually create software to put up an e-commerce website or, or storefront. It's much harder to get distribution and access to customers, which is what Amazon gives uh, sellers. You know, our sellers uh, on average sell about $230,000 um, in our marketplace. We have thousands of sellers who sell over a million dollars a year in our marketplace. So sellers are making a lot more money selling on Amazon than they could on their own. That was Amazon CEO Andy Jassy on Squawk Box yesterday and joining us right now to talk about the FTC antitrust suit against Amazon and the regulatory environment. Moselle Thompson, the former FTC commissioner, good morning to you. You know, Andy made some uh, pointed and fascinating comments just about the iRobot deal that was blocked and really the state of affairs as it relates to, to regulation right now, what they can buy, what they can't buy. As a result, I think you're seeing them do more partnerships, you're seeing the whole big tech universe do more partnerships. Do you see this changing anytime soon? First of all, I want to say good morning, and, and that was a great interview. I thought it was very insightful because I think that ex is exactly what industry is thinking. And they're thinking that we have to we have to be on pins and needles trying to figure out where to go from here. Um, I think that it's important to recognize that anything these companies do now are really viewed through a prism that that the, the FTC and DOJ are looking through right now. They're looking through how big tech are using their power in order to maintain their market power, their share. Right. And, and so um, they're gonna view everything, including uh, what uh, Mr. Zazzi saw was the integration of AI. You, you, you mentioned during your interview, for example, about uh, uh, the FTC is looking at AI with Microsoft and with Google and with Amazon. So I think it's important to recognize that they're gonna continue to look at this and it's not just for now. Don't forget the trial date is not until October of 2026 now. So they're gonna keep gathering information to figure out is Amazon using new technologies in order to, um, in order to maintain their market power. But it's important to recognize that and I'm not sure all regulators totally grasp this, that the technology industry is iterative, that they build on innovations that they have and they sometimes they add to that by, by acquisition or by other types of cooperation. Now, um, there is, a, uh, and they're, they're, I think they're intended to be, a chilling effect as to where, where companies can go with that right now. And I think that until the courts give them some guidance, um, they're going to be treading lightly. Do you have an expectation that if former President Trump becomes the president come November, that all of these cases end or continue? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, because for one reason, don't forget that the, the case that the FTC brought against Meta uh, was brought before this administration came in just before, but just, but before, and the FTC has taken up the, the, the flag and, and run with it. So um, the real question is, is uh, what is the balance of consumer benefit versus consumer harm? And I mentioned once before uh, in an interview uh, on CNBC that one of the challenges for the regulators here is that people really like Amazon and they really like the services they get and the way they're bundled together. So uh, as, as you pointed out in your interview, that uh, the stores are doing very well and right. that the group are, seem to be benefiting from it and consumers seem to like it. Are these good cases though? Meaning on the law, are these good cases? The, 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 the words that we heard from, Jeff, uh, from, from Andy Jassy suggested that this was overreach, that, that a lot of these cases may very well be beyond the law, that ultimately a judge is not going to side with the government. I think the FTC would, and DOJ would tell you that they are pushing the boundaries here, that they are trying to establish new benchmarks in the law. And if you look at their new merger guidelines, for example, they tell you areas that they want to grow into, and they're being tested in court. So far, uh, not, not all courts have accepted uh, their new view of what the antitrust laws are. So there's there's two things here. There's the, the law itself that, that right. is 
it's written and that is how it's interpreted and i think that everybody would tell you and they would tell you that uh the the ftc and the doj are being very aggressive here no we got to uh leave it there it's a longer conversation we have some news coming out literally uh, as we're just speaking together because citigroup uh reporting its quarterly results and i want to get straight over to leslie picker who i know has been shares uh, a little bit higher on the results which appear to be a beat on the top and bottom line uh, bottom line coming in 158 per share uh, that compares to estimates of 123 per share top line 21.1 billion dollars compared to 20.4 billion from uh, uh, the street now that is um, exclude if you were to exclude last year's India divestiture which took place in the quarter uh, that led to a $1 billion gain. If you exclude that, city's revenue actually came in 3% higher for the year. So a bit of a, a lumpy quarter as it goes through its reorganization and refocusing. Um, last quarter, if you recall, city said it would be down to 20,000 heads before the end of 2026. So hopefully we can get an update on that uh, in the call today. But we did see operating expenses increase 7% year over year and net income down year over year. It came in at 3.4 billion in the first quarter compared to net income of 4.6 billion in the prior year period driven by higher expenses, higher cost of credit, and lower net revenue. They also faced that higher FDIC special assessment to the tune of $251 million. Uh, and if you recall, as of last quarter, they started reporting in five businesses. Um, I can kind of give you the highlights of those five. Services saw revenue up about 8%. Markets uh, revenue was down there thanks largely to fixed income, which was down 10%, although equities was higher by uh, 5%, although fixed income is larger for the firm. Uh, banking revenue up 49% to $1.7 billion, and that was driven by growth in investment banking and lending, uh, those green shoots we keep talking about. Wealth down a little bit, 4%, and U.S. personal banking up 10%. And Jane Frazier addressing that reorg in the press release, she says, quote, last month marked the end of the organizational simplification we announced in September. The result is a cleaner, simpler management structure that fully aligns to and facilitates our strategy. It will also help us execute our transformation where we've made good progress as we retire multiple legacy platforms, streamline end-to-end -end processes, and strengthen our risk and control environment. So I think you can kind of see that summed up uh, in this quarter's press release, but you can see the market likes what it sees, shares up about two and a half percent right now. All right, Leslie, thank you very much. That is the third of the big banks this morning. We want to check on the futures after getting all those numbers. You'll see that there is some improvement that we've seen in the futures over the last hour, let's say. Dow futures at this point are still in the red, down by about 50 points, but they were down much more earlier before JP Morgan really had a chance to resettle things. That stock, when it initially reported earnings, was off by three and a half percent. Last I looked, it was down by just about 2.1%. Again, on lesser concerns about net interest income, maybe thinking that these banks are being a little more conservative when they're not, when they're not uh, uh, raising their forecast for net interest income this year. S&P futures right now up by about 11, or down by about 11, the NASDAQ indicated off by close to 60. Among today's top stories, Boston Fed President Susan Collins says that she sees roughly two interest rate cuts this year. She's telling Reuters that she expects slowing demand will help bring down inflation later this year. The Biden administration announcing that it will be forgiving more than $7 billion in student loan debt for more than a quarter of a million people. And Apple shares are in focus today after gaining 4.3% yesterday. That's the best daily performance for Apple shares since last May. You can see right now, down by about 23 cents. The hot consumer inflation data this week is going to talk of if the Fed should cut, run, cut rates at all this year as opposed to when. For more on this, we want to bring in Mark Lipschultz. He is co-chief executive officer of Blue Owl Capital. That's an alternative assets firm and a leading player in the private capital space with $165 billion in assets under management. And uh, Mark, thank you for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Always good to be here. So this idea this week that really kicked into high gear with the markets that maybe the Fed's not going to be cutting rates so soon, maybe rates will be higher for longer. That's pretty good news for you based on what you do. For what we do, it is. Look, our products, our business is built around stability, predictability, inflation protection. At the end of the day, our largest business, direct lending. 
is a floating rate business. So the, the higher for longer is beneficial to our investors. Uh, it's also really what our products are built for, which is to insulate investors from this type of uncertainty. I recall my privilege of being here about a year ago, we had this very conversation at that time, you know, people were talking about seven rate cuts and we're sitting where, where we sat then and sit now, inflation is a sticky animal. And so how do you protect yourself from that? And that's one of the things our products are built to do. I mean, those are, that's similar to what we heard from Jamie Dimon this morning with JP Morgan results. Just this idea that inflation is sticky, um, not convinced that we can bring it down quite as quickly. How do you prepare for that? What, what sort of areas do you all play in that allows protection for that? So where we participate most directly that really serves the investor well, at the end of the day, it's about how do we deliver a result that's good for the investor. Direct lending, clearly floating rates, so direct pass-through of interest rates to investors, and so we've seen a benefit over this. We may be the only people that woke up this week and saw this hot print and said, well, that's good news <laughs> from the point of view of our investor group. You would think the same with some of the financials too, though, because yeah. they do make more money in net interest income as a result of these things. What happens if inflation breaks and we do start to get rate cuts? How does that change the environment? I imagine we will at some point, right? Where we, I, I can't predict the course of interest rates that I'm sure of. We can look at micro data. We can look at, we have 350 companies in our portfolio. So we certainly have a lot of information to work from to see what's really happening on the ground. And what we have been seeing for this past year and continue to see is inflation is still in place. We're still seeing a lot of pressure on wages. We're still seeing the companies raise prices and prices to their customers. So eventually inflation will ease, certainly it's eased from where it was, and inflation will come down and presumably rates will moderate. And again, the power of at least our product and our approach is when you invest with our products, you're not trying to pick the answer to that. You're not trying to pick the time or the exact place. We do have a flow of product. It's true, returns will moderate when rates moderate. What's the environment for the companies, all those operating companies that you're talking about? If, if inflation is an issue, my guess is consumer demand is still pretty strong though too, and, and on the business front. The economy is in a favorable place. I, I think it's safe to say from where I sit, the economy is a lot stronger than I would have thought. So going back a year, the economy is still quite robust. We're seeing it in demand. I mean, there's certainly reasons to be a little cautious on the consumer. We see some consumer behavior getting a little more tepid, but in total, Where? At, well, in total, I think what we're seeing with consumers is just a little more caution on discretionary spending. It's, it's not meaningful in terms of impact, but if there's a place to watch, I think we obviously, of course, we all keep an eye on the consumer behavior. But in total, when we look at the 350 companies, we are not seeing any meaningful indicators of an economic slowdown. At what point though, if you were to look out at a, a calendar over the next five years and look at the businesses that you're loaning money to and the businesses that uh, others in the, it's called the, the shadow banking system uh, are participating in, is there a, a moment in which you say, you know what, these companies will not be, you know, the, when the interest rate really ticks up on them, they will not be able to operate at the same level that we're gonna either see a whole slew of bankruptcies, we're gonna see a whole slew of mergers, or something else is, is going to happen, that there is an inflection point in the impact of these interest rates. Not, it hasn't happened yet, but it, when you look at a calendar, is there a moment where you say, that just can't hold up at, this, at these numbers? So as you just observed very well, it has not happened and it's not happening today, which is Correct. to say, that we've absorbed a dramatic rise in right. rates and we have not seen any meaningful change in defaults. We've done about $90 billion in loans and our running loss rate has been six basis points. So we have not seen it. I mean, by definition, of course, there has to be some mathematical point if we were in a hyperinflationary environment where we would see companies unable to pay their bills. We're not in that place and we're not near that place. So barring a dramatic rise in rates, I don't see that, we're not measured in time, I think companies have proven a durability to this kind of environment, which by the way, this isn't such an atypical environment, right? Everyone is thinking about the rise, but the rise from zero. Zero was the strange world. And I don't think, you know, things where treasuries are in four to five range is the strange world. Mark, I want to thank you for coming in today. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Uh, when we come back, uh, what the next round of uh, tax reform could look like. American Action Forum President Douglas Holt Aiken is going to join us. And then later, Agriculture Secretary uh, Tom Vilsack is going to be with us to discuss the inflation war happening from the farm to your table. We'll talk about food prices. Spock Fox can write that. Fox. The futures right now are down. We're looking at the Dow off about 76 points, the Nasdaq down about 71 points, the S&P 500 off about 15 points. We've had a number of big financials, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citi, and BlackRock all reporting this morning. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But right now, let's talk taxes because a new Wall Street Journal op-ed uh, out, and our next guest says there's a good opportunity for reform this year and next as many of the provisions in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are set to expire. Joining us right now is Douglas Holtz-Aiken, president of the A American Action Forum, a former director, of course, of the Congressional Budget Office. He wrote uh, in the Wall Street Journal op-ed uh, with former Texas Congressman Kevin Brady. Um, what do you think the chances are? Let's just start with just handicap where things stand. Maybe it's almost impossible to because we really don't know who's in control of what or wh where they will be when this all happens. But what do you think the chances are that, that things just float and, and nothing gets done? Uh, well, first let me just say, um, I, I do want to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Chairman Brady, who was just a tremendous leader when he was in the House. And uh, of course, all errors in the op-ed are mine. I, I, let's be clear about that. Uh, um, it, I think the interesting thing about this situation, one of the reasons we wrote this is that um, 
Congress has to do something. I mean, those, those, uh, those provisions are going to sunset. The president is on record as saying no one under $400,000 should see their taxes go up. Congress would have, would have to act if he's president for that to happen. Uh, Mr. Trump is going to make similar claims. So I think the odds of complete inaction are very low. And so the question is, do you want to frame this as extend what we have or let it sunset? I think that's the wrong way to look at it. This is an opportunity to take what was a really good tax reform in 2017, something we hadn't done in 30 years, and not wait another 30 years. Continue to improve the tax code, and, and I think the emphasis should be on growth. Um, okay, so let's, you know, we let's have a real growth that, problem. Let's talk about what that looks like in terms of what do you think the corporate sure. tax rate will be uh, or should be, but let's also do it in the context of uh, an exploding debt and whether you ultimately think that it's going to be a combination of uh, lowering costs some way or another, which we don't seem to be very good at doing, uh, and somehow <laughs> raising more money meaningfully. Uh, I, I think both have to be on the table. There's no question about that. We have a, a very serious uh, threat in, in the fiscal outlook, and, and the growth in the, in the fiscal outlook are inter interrelated. Um, if you look at the 20th century, uh, GDP per capita, sort of standard of living, grew at 2.4% uh, per year. In the 21st century, it's been one4 that translates into a huge difference in people's lives, about $19,000 for everyone in the United States, and in the, in the fiscal outlook, about $1.2 trillion in revenue. So we need to get better growth. And so when we go into this issue of the Tax Cuts and Job Act sunsets, go into it with an eye toward holding on to the things that worked real well. And I think there's a really strong case to be made for expensing of uh, investment, expensing of R&D. If you do that, no matter how you want to make your company more productive, invest in your workers, invest in your uh, your technologies, invest in your equipment, you, it's on a level of tax playing field. We're not distorting any of those decisions. That's good. Uh, limiting the interest deductibility moved toward greater fairness between debt and equity. That was a good step. We can do more. The international tax provisions have been an enormous success. You know, as we said in the op-ed, in the decade running up to 2017, we lost about 10 headquarters every year. And you can remember the fights right. over those companies inverting nothing we have lost no one since this past right. there was one company that was leaving and came back so we've had some success there's some things that, that could probably be better Let, let's Doug, do that the, the last time we 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 we, we went around this merry-go-round it appeared right. that the business community was prepared or at least willing uh to take the corporate rate to about 25 percent 28 percent was too much of course but 25 percent seemed to be the number would you be willing to live with that number or no I don't think it's um, a good idea to pick one thing out in isolation and say, I gotta have that. This is tax reform. Like, you want to broaden the base, keep the rates as low as possible, distort as few decisions as you can, and ultimately improve the fairness of the tax code. Because when you take out those special provisions, you're treating equals more equally, and that's what you wanna do. Uh, if the rate ends up at 25, um, it ends up at 25. I think we got the US into the game by going to 21%, and we, and we solved a lot of our, our international competitiveness problems. That's great for American workers, and, and we need to keep an eye on that and not, not do too much in that direction. Okay, you talked about fairness um, in yep. the code. Where do you land on carried interest, 1031 exchanges, entitlement reform in terms of, in terms of uh, not, I shouldn't say entitlement reform, uh, uh, <laughs> debt to tax reform? Well, we need that. Well, that, that too, but where, where do you land on those issues? Some of which may raise a lot of money, some of which may raise a lot less money, but may actually get at this fairness issue you're talking about. I, I think I think base broadeners have to be the key, and, and every one of those that you mentioned has to be something that gets looked at seriously. I mean, as you know, um, more than half of business income gets taxed on individual returns as pass-through income. So the pass-through income provisions have to be central to thinking about tax reform. We did a good job of narrowing the difference between the effective tax rate on equity investments in the corporate sector and in the pass-through sector. But you know, the benchmark is you should tax those the same. You shouldn't distort that decision. We're not there yet. So I think there's a, a lot that can be done and that would improve the fairness of the code at the same time. Uh, Doug, I want to thank you for joining us. It's an interesting op-ed uh, and I recommend uh, no matter what side uh, of this debate you're on, you read it. Uh, so you can be more uh, informed and educated about the various points of this very debate. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. All right, when we come back, we're going to get into the inflation debate from the perspective of everyday consumers who are still dealing with sticker shock at the grocery store and other places. U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack will join us right here on set.
But next, TikTok experimenting with new features as it struggles to keep up its growth rate. We're going to talk about what's at stake, even as DC lawmakers consider a ban on the app. Stay tuned, you're watching Squawk Box, and this is CNBC. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. We're keeping a close eye on Treasury yields after the wild ride they've taken this week. A huge jump in those Treasury yields after the CPI number came out on Wednesday. It was hotter than anticipated. This morning, yields are a little bit lower, and in fact, they've dropped even through the course of the last couple of hours. The 10-year right now is sitting right at 452. The two-year is below 4.9%. It's at 489. The push in Washington, D.C. to ban TikTok seems to have bipartisan support, but now it is stalling in the Senate and the company is facing some pretty big headwinds. Julia Borston joins us with more on all of this. Julia, good morning. Good morning to you, Becky. Well, TikTok is certainly far bigger than it was when it last faced a potential ban. But now, as this week, Senator Mitch McConnell called for action towards banning the app, it is facing a new challenge of keeping up its growth. Just yesterday, TikTok did have a big win. Taylor Swift's songs returned to the platform after a 10-week hiatus. This is ahead of the release of her coming studio album next week. But TikTok and Universal Music Group, the world's largest music label, continued to be in a standoff. The label pulled its songs from the platform and accused TikTok of trying to bully it into accepting a deal worth less than its prior contract. This also comes as TikTok rolls out a new app called TikTok Lite in Europe. It gives users rewards, financial rewards, for engaging on the platform or inviting friends to sign up. Now, it's also in the early stages of experimentation with a new app called Notes that's for sharing photos with captions, though the company says there are no plans yet to make it broadly available. 
Now this experimentation with formats similar to Instagram and YouTube comes at a time while time spent on TikTok flatlined in the past year compared to Instagram's 10% growth, according to Sensor Tower. Now this is quite a change from the days when all those platforms like Instagram and YouTube uh, were copying TikTok's short form video format. Becky? Yeah, I was going to say it's a... Uh, you copy me, I'm going to copy you right back, right? This is, you guys came up with reels. We're going to come up with our version of what you do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so interesting about this Notes app. And, and look, TikTok was very clear there is a long way before we might see this app in the U.S. But it looks and feels a lot like what Instagram's for, for sharing photos with a little text and a caption. Now, of course, now Instagram is something totally different. And Reels, which is a TikTok-like feature, is very much and probably increasingly front and center, but you have to look at the fact that, you know, TikTok may have grown incredibly quickly, um, but now if it's going to keep up that growth in, in terms of its user base, it's now 170 million uh, U.S. users, it's really about engagement. How do you get people to not just spend time on the platform, but spend even more time on the platform? And Instagram is posing uh, some competition there. Invitation, the highest form of flattery. Julia, thank you. Coming up uh, on the other side of this, our last uh, breaking economic data of the week, and we've had a lot of it. March import prices, we'll bring you those next. A reminder, as we head to that break, though, you can get the best of Squawk Box in our daily podcast. Follow Squawk Pod on your favorite podcast app. You can listen anytime. If you've missed any of the broadcast this week, you get the big and best interviews. We'll come right back. Try. Welcome back to Squawk Box right here on CBC. We are about to get March import price data. Futures right now are looking down on the back of uh, some 
news both uh, in terms of the financial that we've heard from JP Morgan, Wells Fargo down. Uh, we got the BlackRock news this morning, and I'm thinking well, it's great city as well on the ticket. Uh, take a look at Treasuries right now before we get that number. Uh, Steve has it, I think, but uh, 4.530, the two year uh, now sitting at 4.9, Steve. This has been really interesting, kind of watching through what's happened with Treasury yields this week, yep. um, kind of going through. I'd love to look back at where we were for a week ago. If you just take the 10 year over the last week to see what happened on Wednesday after that hotter than expected CPI number, that was really something, um, looking through the hotter than expected CPI number. And here's what happened with yields this week. That was a huge spike. For the two year, it was even more pronounced, more than 20 basis points. Uh, what you're seeing is a slight pullback this morning, but that is after a major jump over the last couple of sessions for what we've seen. Um, again, watching through with futures this morning, uh, down wide open now, down by 100 points. Um, and this is something similar to what we saw just at around 7 o'clock when JP Morgan and the other big banks came out. Uh, watching what happened, just concerns about whether, you know, they beat on both the bottom and the top line. It's just what happens for the rest of the year and maybe a slightly more conservative outlook than some people had been hoping for. Again, if you're looking at JP Morgan shares, they have been on a huge tear, though. Um, Steve? Up 0.4%, a tick above the uh, consensus estimate. Um, but that's not the most important number. I'm going to give you that in just a second. Export prices falling 1.4%. The number that I'm most interested in, which is um, apropos the discussion we were having about retailers, how well the consumer is doing, but also what's happening with import prices and input costs to the uh, um, for retailers is non-petroleum import prices, uh, which actually were flat on the month, unchanged year over year, sorry, down, um, uh, unchanged year over year, yeah, and down 0.2%. So the issue is that at least when it comes to the importation of inflation, it's not happening. The inflation we have appears to be here domestically. And what could be happening, what is most likely happening is the, the inflation is in the service sector and being driven, I think, especially by um, labor input costs. You had those rises, by the way, in minimum wages. That could be showing up in some of the inflation that we're seeing being passed along. Um, and then apropos of the discussion you were just having on the 10-year uh, the yield, it is interesting. What we're wondering here, uh, guys, is whether or not we have reached a peak here. At f where is the top of the range? And that's the way to think about in this very, very volatile uh, bond environment that we're in right now. We were down, do you guys remember when it was below 4%? I mean, it seemed like too long ago to remember. No, it does, it does. Um, that's, even this week, it's been crazy, the jump that you've seen this week in interest rates. Um, but you had, you did have people wondering if you were going to get to 5 before you get to 3.5%. Yeah, I, I, it, it's looking like maybe this 4, 5, 5, 4, 6 is the top of that range, which would be good news. The other good news is that it is sort of uh, a kind of, I, what you would call it like a, a, an automatic braking system on the economy in the sense that the inflation numbers have been higher, the outlook for Fed rate cuts has declined, and so financial conditions have tightened up a bit, which should put some braking on the economy. Um, the bad news, I think, is for those businesses that were counting on lower rates to refinance some of that debt. The, the, remember, we're talking about risks versus weaknesses. One of the risks out there is if you remember, we hit the low rates in 2020. That's when the Fed cut to zero. That's when the corporate refinancing and the terming out began. Five years is sort of a sweet spot for where a lot of business lending happens. So what's 2025? The beginning of that five-year period. Oh, that's interesting. So look, there were some who were three years and are, or two years and experiencing that pain right now. I looked last year Everybody was talking about refinancing risk. And I looked at it, I didn't see it. So I actually came on here, I did a story. This is not something to worry about this year. But 2025. 2025, 2026. So there's this race that goes on right now, which is will the Fed cut rates faster and deep enough to bail me out as a company of the refinance risk that I have? in 2025 and 2026. That's when the big, now CRE is a different issue right now with office space. That's a whole different world because those values are down there. They could still be um, um, enjoying some of the low rates they have, but they may have to refinance into 
what looks to be right now higher for longer. But as I'm going to explain on Monday, DTs, um, I don't think you should give up the ghost on rate cuts entirely this year. Hmm. I think there are reasons to think they could still happen. But one? One is that, this is what I want to explain, um, by the Fed's own framework, even at these higher rates of inflation, they remain restrictive. And the question for Powell and company is whether or not they need to or want to or should remain this restrictive. And there's room for, I just did the whole story, there's room for them to cut back, cut back and cut down um, and still remain restrictive. And this gets to the whole debate of just how restrictive are they? I'm not here on Monday, so thank you. I'll call you over the weekend, Becky, and I'll tell you the inner, inners and outers of my thoughts on monetary policy because you have nothing else going on this weekend. Love to hear it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, JP Morgan out with some additional color around its earnings. Leslie Picker joins us fresh off the bank's meeting. Leslie, the shares are under a little more pressure, down 2.7% uh, now. Yeah, and executives were really asked about how they prepare for higher for longer rates, and Chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon spoke up and said, quote, Rates being higher on their own isn't that important. What is important is the why. If it was because of stagflation, obviously that's a negative, he says. If it's because of healthy growth, that's actually pretty good. Now, he was also asked about this week's inflation reports and how that reinforces his view from earlier this week in his shareholder letter that higher prices would prove to be stickier than expected. And to that, Diamond said, quote, one of the things I expressed in the letter was we don't pay as much attention to monthly numbers as you all do. I think he meant the media. He noted that these can be quite, uh, quote, distorted by multiple factors, and therefore it hasn't changed anything about what he said and reminded the media that he's talking about a range of outcomes, and they weren't forecasting a specific number as it pertains to rates. Diamond also spoke about the American consumer, saying that the economy is strong and consumers still have excess money from the COVID era, although the bottom half are working through that. He said, when you look at the charge off numbers from the quarter, they were historically low and now they're normalizing. So in the quarter, those came in at 2 billion. That was nearly double that of a year ago, but lower sequentially. He said, quote, obviously if you go into a recession, they're going to be higher. Diamond reiterated, he's not predicting a recession or no recession. He said that he thinks the chance of a bad outcome is higher than others think as he looks at a potential range of outcomes. We can see though, shares down 2.7% uh, on those earnings numbers from today, largely driven by some of the guidance they gave with regard to net interest income and expenses. Becky. Yeah, and, and the CFO, Jeremy Barnum, saying that forecasting net interest income has become, in his words, meaningfully harder yeah. than at any other time. Um, Interesting thing, I guess they're they're not much smarter than the rest of us when it comes to trying to figure out what the Fed's going to do next. Yeah, I think loan growth is a tricky thing for them right now because on one hand, you've got the prospect of higher interest rates, meaning that they can charge more for loans uh, in the foreseeable future. But on the other hand, if you know commercial entities and consumer entities don't want to take out loans because rates are high and they think that at least in somewhat of a near term, within the next year or so, they could go down, that obviously affects the size of their balance sheet as well and their profitability. So it is kind of a, a difficult balance at this juncture and notable that both JP Morgan and Wells Fargo maintained that guidance by and large, although JP Morgan did raise by a billion dollars its NIIX uh, markets, which they would point to at $89 billion for the full year. Um, that suggests that just because we're in this higher for longer interest rate environment doesn't necessarily mean it's this massive tailwind for some of these asset sensitive banks. Could be them being conservative too. Yeah. Um, Leslie, thank you. Great job today. Right. Meantime, we were watching uh, shares of Morgan Stanley this morning. Uh, that stock dropped more than 5% yesterday on a Wall Street Journal report that federal re regulators, including the SEC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, are investigating the bank. The report says the probe focuses on how Morgan Stanley vets clients who could conceivably launder money through its wealth management arm. Morgan Stanley declined to comment when contacted by CNBC about that report. The stock uh, now just off marginally uh, this morning, but we, um, we look at off by 6% for the week. When we come back, we're going to talk about one of the most upfront sources of inflation that Americans are dealing with, food inflation. U.S. Agric Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack will join us. 
Right now, let's take a look at some of the prices of key commodities. Coffee hitting a 30-month high. That was driven in part by a heat wave in Vietnam. Weather problems in Africa also continuing to drive cocoa prices higher. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box, and this is CNBC. back everybody we learned in this week's cpi report that grocery prices were unchanged in march compared to february year over year the so-called food at home category was up by just 1.2 percent but prices for dining out jumped by 4.2 percent year over year joining us right now to talk food inflation and much more is the agriculture secretary tom vilsack and secretary thanks for being here today it's good to be with you Let's talk first about inflation, because that's the issue that, uh, that people are watching so closely. Uh, definitely, when you're looking at the month-over-month -month numbers, inflation is down for food at grocery stores, at least. But we are looking at higher commodities prices, and it has a lot of people concerned about what's in the pipeline. Where do you think we stand right well, now? Well, in terms of commodity prices, actually, commodity prices have come down quite a bit. Um, and the result of that is, uh, I think farmers are a little stressed. Uh, you have to remember that farmers only get about 15 to 20 cents of every food dollar. So commodity prices have less of an impact than uh, perhaps supply chain disruptions, which is why I think the president's been so focused on making sure that we strengthen the supply chain. Also looking at ways in which people can better cope with whatever the inflation rate might be. That's why he's focused on things like junk fees, uh, tax relief uh, with child care, uh, child care tax credit, things of that nature, making it a little bit easier for families. Uh, he often talks about the bottom up and the middle out. 
And that's uh, basically what we're trying to do. There's a story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, just when you mentioned what you guys can do to fight inflation, the journal points out that you've got very few tools you can do to fix inflation. Well, I, you know, I think one of the things we're doing is trying to create more competition. Uh, certainly in the processing side, that certainly impacts and affects uh, food prices. I think we're trying to improve the transportation system. If you can get goods from here to there more efficiently and more effectively, uh, that's going to make a big difference. Uh, and again, I think there are ways in which the administration is trying to figure out ways to help the pocketbooks of American families. The, uh, these junk fees is a big issue. Uh, you know, I was at a meeting the other day where people were talking about uh, Ticketmaster and the cost of the service right. to get tickets to the NCAA women's basketball tournament. Uh, the uh, service charge was almost as much as the ticket. Uh, so I think that there are ways in which we are uh, making a difference. Uh, obviously, wages are up as well. Uh, we've got an economy that I think is the envy of the world at this point in time. Uh, we obviously want to continue to do that. When you talk about uh, strengthening the supply chain, how do you go about doing that when it comes to food? Uh, basically, two, two things. One, uh, creating a more local and regional food system uh, so that we're not as reliant on just a handful of uh, processing facilities, for example. Uh, we've invested uh, over a billion dollars in nearly 400 projects across the United States to expand access to processing capacity. Uh, again, strengthening uh, the transportation system uh, as we invest in uh, roads, bridges, rail systems, ports, and so forth, that's going to allow us to get product to market more quickly and more efficiently. So it's a combination of a, a, a number of things, not, none of which are easy and none, none of, of which take, take uh, can be done quickly. Right. right? They, they take time and in the meantime, the investments from the IRA could very well push inflation higher because it's money that's pouring into the economy to create jobs for some of these things along the way, but that does create some inflationary pressures. I, I, you know, one of the things that I think is missed about the IRA is the fact that it's paced. Uh, it's not as if all this money is all of a sudden showing up in the economy. It takes time uh, to get a contract for a road construction. It takes time uh, to fix the rails uh, system. It takes time to improve ports. Uh, so it, this resource is going to be stretched out over a period of time. The money that we have at USDA uh, from the IRA and the infra infrastructure law are stretched over a period of years. So I think you're going to see more of a measured uh, impact uh, and investment in the economy. Overall, what we're going to see is a much stronger and much more competitive American economy. What do you think happens um, post-November? Does, 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 will we have a meaningful impact, do you think, on the inflationary picture who the president is? Well, I can't talk about elections uh, in this interview, but what I can talk about is I think we've put in place, certainly in rural places, we put in place a, a, a new structure, uh, especially for American agriculture. Uh, the reality is we've been far too focused on just productivity, and that has driven many, many, many people off the farm. We've lost 544,970 farms since 1981. We've lost 151 million acres of farm land. I don't think anybody's satisfied with that, so that's why we have put in an entrepreneurial model where we're now allowing small and mid-sized farming operations multiple ways to make a living. Uh, additional income streams from climate smart agricultural commodities to agricultural waste being turned into a wide variety of new products to uh, renewable energy, creating an opportunity for energy to be a commodity for farmers uh, to that local and regional food system where farmers get 50 cents of every food dollar instead of 15 or 20 cents of every food dollar. So uh, a combination of investments, uh, nearly $20 billion to be invested over the next three to five years to create this system. So. Uh, whether it's November of 2024 or November of 2028, I think we're going to uh, see a much different rural economy, uh, and I think we're going to see a growth that we haven't seen for quite some time in, in rural places. I mean, farmers have gotten hit hard too, especially small farmers, by the very inflationary pressures on, on things like fuel. Um, prices hit them hard too, because it, they see some increase perhaps in what they're selling, but best, especially if you're a small <laughs> farmer. Best three years in farm income in the last 50 years, and arguably ever. Uh, liquidity strong, uh, true uh, prices uh, for inputs have been up, but we've also worked on trying to reduce the cost of fertilizer, for example. Well, how, how did we do that? By investing resources in 42 projects across the United States to expand domestically produced fertilizer, no longer uh, being as res uh, responding to uh, uh, what happens in Russia and Ukraine and so forth. Yeah. So it's, it, it, there are a multitude of ways in which we're helping. This uh, renewable energy opportunity, lowering energy costs for farmers. We've had over 6,000 investments under the Inflation Reduction Act in farms to put in solar systems, biodigesters, wind, uh, wind turbines, bringing costs down and creating the opportunity for those farmers to actually produce excess energy, which
which in turn can allow their REC, their rural electric cooperative, to bring rates down for everybody in the area. So I think it's a, a, a much brighter future. I, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that for the first time in over 10 years, we've actually seen an increase in the population of rural places. I like the idea that we've seen a, a reduction in poverty, employment rates in rural places now uh, at back to pre-pandemic levels, unemployment at historic lows in rural places, uh, and persistent poverty, uh, areas that have forever had uh, poverty rates above 20%, we've actually seen a decline in a number of counties in that category. So uh, I think there are a lot of positive signs. We just need to be, I think we need to continue to do what we're doing, bottom up and middle out. Secretary Vilsack, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, coming up, uh, a lot more right here on SWAC, a wrap up of today's big bank earnings. You've got a lot of them, and what you need to watch as we make our way towards the final opening bell of the week on Wall Street. The futures right now are down pretty much across the board, up about 223 points down now on the Dow. That's actually taken a bit of a tumble since we last showed you that stream. We'll talk more about it after this. Make it count. All right, welcome back. Time to check in with Dom Chu. He's got a look at some of today's top pre-market movers. Dom, uh, what are you seeing this morning? I mean, it's Becky and all about those big earnings headlines, right? So we'll start there with the big banks. It's being dominated by those big banks. We'll start with shares of J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, also asset management giant BlackRock, each on the move, as you can see here. But it's a bit of a mixed trade. Quarterly results right off the bat, generally all good for all of these names, better than estimates. That's the baseline, but the stocks aren't all acting that positively, as you can see here. J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, those better results did come with some concerns about those so-called net interest income levels or the money banks make from lending. For Citigroup, the shares are actually higher due in part to some of the optimism that CEO Jane Frazier's restructuring plans will lead to better results down the line. BlackRock, meanwhile, you can see here is higher by just about half a percent better results 
up by record assets under management of ten and a half trillion dollars. We're also, by the way, tracking shares of chip stocks, namely Intel and advanced micro devices. Both of them are lower pre-market, due in part to a report from the Wall Street Journal saying that Chinese officials are directing the country's big telecom companies to start phasing out chips made by the two companies from their systems by the year 2027, according to people familiar. That follows, of course, similar reports about the Chinese government emphasizing domestically made chips over foreign made ones over the course of the last year or so. Nonetheless, those shares down about two to two and a half percent. And we'll end with an analyst call out this morning, moving shares of Arista Networks. That stock is down by over just about four percent right now. Uh, 50,000 shares of volume due in part to a double downgrade over at Rosenblatt Securities. They go to sell from a prior buy. The target price goes down to 210 bucks. It was 330. The computer networking, cloud computing, data center company, they're citing things like not being able to maybe perhaps benefit as much from artificial intelligence applications as the current valuation might imply. Now, for more on that and other top analyst calls of the day, just head over to CNBC.com slash pro Andrew. Subscribers there can get more detail and analysis. I'll send things back over. Tom, thank you for that. Have a great weekend. Our next guest saying the reflation trade is back, largely to sticky inflation concerns. For more on that, I want to bring in Martin Norton, Chief Investment Officer for the Americas at Morningstar Wealth. We're looking at the market uh, falling down this morning. Dow off now about 227 points. We do have those earnings reports from the banks. We have some idiosyncratic news around some of the chip makers um, in terms of what's going on in China. But Marta, even beyond the inflation trade, I just want to actually just throw this out there because we haven't discussed it perhaps even enough uh, right now, which is I wonder how much you think the market coming into this weekend is concerned about what's actually happening in the Middle East and what may, may or may not happen with these reports around Iran. Yeah, I mean, the Middle East is brewing in the background as we're taking a look, of course, focused on U.S. sticky inflation core, and we're also focused on what's happening with earnings. But, of course, geopolitical risk has been on the rise. That's been the case for the past few years with the war in Ukraine and now with the you know concerns around what's happening in the Middle East. So I think that's certainly one of the forces that we see at play within the oil market and is certainly a force behind the action that we're seeing for energy stocks. And I think that uncertainty around supply um, has, has a bit of a tailwind um, just because these, these issues aren't going away. On the inflation trade or, or lack of trade, what is, what is the trade to be made? What is the investment to be made in this environment given what we're seeing? Well, the trade that we're seeing people make, especially in the wake of Wednesday's uh, report, is everything with a hint of rate sensitivity, utilities, banks down, energy stocks ascendant, and of course, duration being punished. And so, uh, you know, I think the question is how enduring that trade is. From our perspective, there is some uncertainty there. And so what we're focused on is looking for investments that can survive or, or thrive in a range of different scenarios that are also undergirded by strong valuations. And so that takes us out when we're thinking about valuations, that takes us largely out of the big tech area and moves us into some of these markets that have been a little bit more overlooked. So say consumer staples, a very defensive area of the market trading at roughly fair value from our estimation, a reasonable place to be if you're concerned about um, any sort of you know, market sell-off. Uh, consumer staples tend to be more defensive in that environment. So we think there's a lot of opportunities there, um, uh, markets that respond in different ways to the uncertainties that we're facing. What do you do about big tech? What do you do about the, the Magnificent Seven, the, the Fancy Four, the Fabulous Five? <laughs> Yeah, any, way you, any, any, any particular name that you want to pick. You know, broadly speaking, tech looks overvalued to us, and it's looked that way for a long time. And if there's one thing we know about technology and, and, and the markets broadly is that valuation isn't necessarily a timing indicator. But as we're starting to move to these areas where valuations are so extreme, I think there is room for disappointment. And that's something that we're particularly concerned about when we just take a look at the market concentration. So 30 cents of every dollar, if you're in an S&P 500 tracker, is going to those big 10 companies. And when we've seen that level of concentration in the past, whether it's the, um, the tech bubble or whether it's the early 1970s, we've seen pretty significant drawbacks. So, you know, in excess of 40%. So that kind of concentration that those mag seven, big 10, you know, fab right. four, however you want to define it, is a, a risk that we're seeing today in, in today's markets. Marta, I want to thank you uh, for your perspective on the market. So we will see where things end the day uh, after what is already a pretty volatile morning and what has been a volatile week. Thank you very, very much. Have a great weekend.
All right, let's take a quick look. The futures have taken a decidedly turn for the worse here. The Dow futures now down by more than 260 points. S&P futures down by 40. The NASDAQ down by 162. That does it for us. Make sure you join us next week. Right now it's time for Squawk on the Street. Friday, everybody. Welcome to Squawk on the Street. I'm David Faber with Sarah Eisen and Mike Santoli. We are live from Post 9 at the New York Stock Exchange. Carl and Jim have the morning off. Let's give you a look at futures. You just heard Becky say we have taken a bit of a turn lower, at least it would appear, uh, when we open. We're going to be down rather substantially on some of the broader averages. Let's get to our roadmap this morning. It starts with the banks. J.P. Morgan, City, Wells Fargo, they all reported earnings. All appear to have been fairly strong. We're going to break down the quarters. Plus, BlackRock now managing nearly $10.5 trillion in assets. We're joined exclusively by Chairman and CEO Larry Fink. That'll be later this hour. We're also watching the semis this morning. Qualcomm, Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA all moving lower ahead of the open. China reportedly telling its telecom carriers to phase out foreign ships. I want to start off with the banks and with that downturn in the market as well. Of course, earnings season kicks off with... Uh, the likes of uh, J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo and Citi, for example. Mike, I'd love to just turn to you quickly uh, uh, and just get a sense on the market as well. Yeah, we had an interesting day yesterday with that with that uh, move up in Apple shares, particularly as the day went on. Obviously, moved the Nasdaq appreciably higher. But what do we think is behind some of the weakness we're seeing? Well, beyond these bank earnings, which at the at, at the worst are a mixed picture. Yeah, I don't think it's bank earnings necessarily the catalyst. Yesterday, the indexes were rescued by not just Apple bouncing on some reports about some you know AI MacBooks and, and, and whatnot, but NVIDIA going up 4%, because this is the market we have. When we get nervous about macro and yields and inflation, and we've had a 10% pullback in NVIDIA and some of the other AI stocks, well, it's the, the market, when it gets defensive, actually goes into the growthy secular names. So I think that was yesterday. What we have now is a market that has been sort of chopping around very familiar levels for about four weeks. I think no matter what you thought heading into this week, the picture did not get any less complicated with what we learned this week in terms of inflation being sticky, repricing the Fed's path, bond yields going up to multi-month highs. Um, I don't think that we have to have a strong specific rationale for why gold is going vertical to say maybe when gold is going vertical things aren't necessarily as settled as we'd like them to be so what we have this morning is again going to test the lower end of this S&P range it's around 5150 and geopolitical on upset is is obviously in the mix you have oil rising this has been a feature of this market especially ahead of weekends where normally you have the volatility index backing off because you're gonna be closed for two days and today it's popping again. And it's it's obviously a, a volatile mix uh, on a limited basis at least, but then we have the, if, 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 if you know, hopefully there's no escalation of any sort. Monday, you have a relief trade. Well, there's this journal report that Israel's preparing yeah. for a direct attack from Iran on, the, on southern or northern Israel as soon as Friday or Saturday, according to a person familiar with the matter. Iran's been public with the threats and you have you know, just to reiterate, Mike, you have Brent crude oil above $91 a barrel. You have WTI crude oil surging at the same time where the dollar is surging and gold is surging. And usually those things don't happen together because gold and oil are priced in dollars. They usually go in other directions. So there's definitely a safe haven flight right now. And I would also mention that treasuries are catching a bid today as yeah. well. So it's not like high rates are spooking the market this morning because Treasuries are getting bid. Yeah, um, and of course, as we were sort of combining here, banks and yep. the broader market, I'll come to J.P. Morgan. Not the numbers themselves, more the comments on the media call from, from Jamie Dimon. We already got a sense from this from his annual letter, which came out early in the week. Um, but, you know, he once again is saying, I'm not, listen, I'm not predicting a recession or no recession. I don't know what the future portends of all the things that we're talking about. He, but he does continue to say, sir, his own personal belief is things, you know, the the price in the market is probably too happy, is, and I think the chance of bad outcomes is high as other is as high higher than other people may think. Not projecting them, just saying they may have the you know look for a potential range. You have to look for a potential range of outcomes. I'm working here off a transcript that's not exactly. No, I think we have a word quote where he where he cites exactly what he's worried about, which are, are persistent themes that he has been worried about. Uh, number of significant forces, according to Diamond, the global landscape is unsettling. Terrible wars and violence. 
He yeah. mentions that again, continue to cause suffering, and geopolitical tensions are growing. Second, he says there seems to be a very large number of persistent inflationary pressures, which may likely continue. And finally, he says we've never truly experienced the full effect of quantitative tightening on this scale. He has been warning about this for years. So far, the market hasn't really felt it, the move from $9 trillion that was, to $780 billion. Yeah, that was, from the, uh, that was the earnings release, not yeah. the TV yeah. call, but yes, that's right. But he sort of mm -hmm. highlights the three buckets yeah. that I think they're worried about. If you look at the overall earnings numbers, though, I mean, they, they lifted net interest income forecast. Maybe the street was looking for more on that, given how much we've pared back Fed yeah, interest rate cuts. But that seems to be one of the primary areas of focus here for banks. It is. And I think you also have to emphasize how much J.P. Morgan, the stock, has outperformed everything else in the, in the, in the group. Um, Up 15% this year. Into and, and I mean, over the last yeah, two but, years, yeah. it's basically, you know, ahead of Bank of America. Bank of America is really the closest comp, okay? Bank of America trades at one times book. J.P. Morgan trades at 1.8. Um, it's got, like, I don't know, 75% percentage point outperformance in the stock to that point. It's got double the market cap of B of A with, like, 40% more assets. So it just tells you the market has decided that perhaps because the CEO is always worried about uh, what could go wrong, even as things look good in the business, um, they're willing to say that this is the bank that survives almost you know any environment, and um, and and so that's the context in which you back off three percent when you don't raise net interest margin, um, uh, you know guidance as much as people were thinking. Eighty-nine you know. billion is the new NII forecast, and I guess it was ninety billion in twenty twenty-three, but that's still better than the eighty-eight billion that they previously expected. There was also a, a reserve release, which means that credit looked better than they Less were than anticipating. Expected, yeah. And so that's a part of the story that continues to, to really support uh, both you know, the banks in general and the overall you know, economic outlook. I mean, I think the banks, the reason we have to focus so much on the net interest piece of it is it's really the main swing factor, along with capital markets and deals, and that's been really active. Massive corporate bond issuance in the first quarter, JP Morgan gets their share of that, we got some IPOs, that's good, but the market yeah. usually doesn't pay a lot in advance for that type no, of thing. No, it's not like it's a growth business right now overall right. banking, it's not a growth that's business. That's right. That said, to your point, they have a return on equity of 17%. I mean, you know, just to put it in perspective as to why, to Mike's point, JP Morgan gets such a premium to many other banks. I mean, Citi, which is working its way through this massive restructuring, and you've sat down with Jane Fraser a couple of times, I know, Sarah, we're talking about ROE of 6.6% in the first quarter. Yeah. Uh, not to mention uh, Wells Fargo at roughly, let's call it 10, a little over 10%. So that just does put in perspective why there is a willingness, Mike, to pay more for JP Morgan and or at least a dollar of earnings more uh, on a multiple basis. Mike Mayo put it well, the bank analyst at Wells Fargo. He said it's a, JP Morgan is a call option on a more hawkish Fed in the short term, capital relief from Basel III, another theme, yep. and best in class national deposit share. And that's sort of why JP Morgan has gotten a premium. Even though you said banking not a growth business, really strong results but from both city, I noticed up 32% in investment banking and JP Morgan, uh, which was yeah. up double digits as well, 27% the investment banking. Yeah, a year ago, I mean, the Bond first quarter of last year was like was as bad as it gets. Yeah. But no, you're absolutely right that that's a good swing factor. It's just that the, the banks don't no longer participate. They don't really have great leverage to a really booming U.S. economy as much as they used to. A lot happens outside, they're overcapitalized, they're forced to hold a lot more capital, they can't do wild, risky stuff as much as they used to. So I think they're just more steady, uh, which is a good thing for the system. <laughs> you, you, know? you would think so, although something they're arguing about, certainly the next round of yeah. potential uh, Maybe capital requirements as well, yeah. which they feel like is overshooting. We've talked a lot about private credit as well and the market share that it's taken in terms of an area that used to be quite profitable for many of the banks that they are sort of fighting back on to a certain extent through lower pricing. Basically, your financing in terms of deals uh, and the like or the large credit needs of so many companies. Private credit, obviously, yeah. I mean, we've covered it pretty closely this last year. It's just have exploded a lot of loans. through the alternative asset managers, whether it be Apollo or, uh, or on and on from there. Uh, AKR, Aries, Aries, KKR, even Blue Owl, yeah. it just goes on. So there's an interesting divergence also shaping up between expectations for the big banks, which continues to be strong, and the regional banks, which we're going to get more of next week. And this idea that the more hawkish Fed or fewer interest rate cuts is very helpful to the big banks and their net interest income. And while it is helpful to the regionals too, they get hit more with bad loans and bad credit quality and issues 
with deposits. And their deposit costs yeah, go up. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the longer that the Fed stays at five and three eighths, and that's basically what you're getting in money markets, um, the, 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 you know, the, the harder it is if you're a bank to compete for deposits. And that's been, it's not so much like a deposit flight issue, it's more just it raises your costs and you have to, you know, try to keep up with that. But yeah, the, the regional banks have, uh, you know, the sell off in bonds again, it, it, it creates more focus on what the ones that have a little bit uh, exposure in terms of unrealized losses. A lot of that's working its way through. I think it's much more about, you know, if the economy hangs together, they're going to be fine. They're trying to hold uh, these prices that are well above the March 2023 low. Yeah. But, um, and before we go, just to come back to the broader markets again to refresh people, we are going to look for a down open here. But, you know, well, I mentioned Apple at the very top. I mean, that was, I think that was the biggest move Apple's seen in, what, 11 years? Is it yeah. some, I'll leave it to you. I don't want to say something. No, I think it was many years in yeah, terms of... Yeah, 4% daily yeah. move. Yeah. yeah. And again, it, it just shows you how the March market gets very twitchy on these days when it's decided that it's going oh, to just since last May. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was even longer. Than it's that. a pretty good. It's a pretty good size. Eleven movie, months. Uh, Eleven in months. a uh, you know, in a two plus trillion dollar company. Um, and again, it, this has been the, the rotational action. Yesterday was actually kind of a weak day in the market. You had most stocks down, but the index managed to hang in there. Alphabet uh, and Amazon okay. also though. Yeah. Uh, as they both sort of, I mean, Amazon in particular moves very close to that two trillion dollar yeah. mark that we sort of follow. And uh, you pointed out Nvidia as well. Do we expect follow through yesterday at the end of like, uh, one of our shows? I forget which one, Mike. We were talking about the, the darrowing is the word you used in well, terms yeah. of the market overall, as opposed to the broadening thing we've been stressing for the last few months. It's it's definitely flagged quite a bit. I mean, that's when higher yields uh, bite is is on the majority of stocks. In fact, if you looked at sort of the equal weighted S and P relative to the market cap weighted, you know, it's back on its lows more or less. Uh, so it's not as if there's been a lot of, of progress. And, you know, if you're an index owner, you kind of don't care. The overall market hangs in there. I mean, I think you have to sort of stack up what we know and what we think we know. With, it's a bull market. The strength and persistence of the bull market in the five-month run we had off the October low is of the sort that usually means it's not the end of it. In other words, it's, it's persistent six to 12 months later. So you know all those things. What you don't know is what happens in between. And there has to be some give back. We're in one of the top 12 or 13 longest stretches of the last 80 years without the S&P at least touching its 50 day average. That's kind of technical mumbo jumbo. All it means is it gets up a lot, hasn't backed off much as it usually does. And there are a few other negative catalysts. We didn't even mention the semis, which have been the market leaders this year. They're weak, yes. especially Intel and AMD on this report from the journal that China uh, continues to crack down and is trying to wean, wean the phone, the telecom providers off of American ships. And yeah, that and they're doing it. in particular, that and they that they have set a deadline. Yeah, uh, the CPUs in particular made by the likes of uh, AMD and Intel are very important. And it extends beyond telecom, obviously, as well, into just the into the PCs that are that are made and provided for uh, in in China as well. But you can see the weakness in particular in AMD down as much as perhaps three percent. Yeah, really phase out by twenty twenty seven is a is the is the headline. And then the only other sort of negative data point from China was the export data. I don't know if you saw it down seven and a half percent. And that is worse than it has been. And also it's worse given that there was some optimism lately on China, particularly in terms of exports. Uh, this was a downside surprise. Imports were also down two percent. So just speaking to the persistent weakness yeah. in China's economy. And just when you know that just when some of the Hedge fund managers get a little bit more bullish on China. Yeah. We saw outflows in Japan for the first week last week and inflows into China. Disappointing data. Yeah, it's kind of the new widow maker is the <laughs> trade is the pick the low in Chinese uh, in Chinese risk assets. But uh, you know, hard to do. We'll see. All right, we've got a big morning on tap here. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink will join us exclusively here at Post Nine on a big earnings day for him and for financials in general. And in the next hour, Nike going for gold. We've got an exclusive interview with CEO John Donahoe as they unveil their new Olympic kits. Taking a look at futures here as we head into the opening bell. As we mentioned, down session, Dow down almost 300 points ahead of the open. NASDAQ futures down 176, given back yesterday's big tech games. More Talk on the street, straight ahead.
BlackRock reporting uh, financials and also that uh, it has record assets under management. They've now reached 10.5 trillion as of the as of the first quarter. The company also posting a 36% jump in its profits. CEO Larry Fink will join us later this hour. We'll talk about the, the numbers and, of course, I'm sure the overall economy. Uh, you know, 10.5 trillion is a pretty big number. It is. Uh, I can remember when it was. Uh, Below a trillion, I think. I can go sure. back a long way. Uh, fixed income, interestingly, was the largest uh, inflows. I think at 42 yeah. billion for the quarter, as steady, opposed to equity. Steady steady total total inflows. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think he characterized it as 76 uh, billion net inflows in long term, so kind of non-cash type uh, fund. So yeah, it's it's moving right along. Obviously, the markets help uh, in terms of getting the overall AUM up. And the company's built in a way to be somewhat agnostic as to what asset class, what strategy, active, passive, retail, institutional. I think that's very much by design. And so they just sort of capture it uh, across the board. Uh, so it seems like, you know, pretty good performance. They're, they're obviously using their scale to their advantage where there is earnings leverage in the model because, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily take more people or cost <laughs> to manage an extra $60 billion no. in a given quarter. $62 billion in flows for ETFs. That's the iShares yeah. business. Obviously, that's strong as strong well. Strong but lower fee, so that's always the trade-off. Yeah, I mean, yeah. right. They did benefit, obviously, from performance overall yeah. of the market, and therefore performance fees uh, yeah. uh, fairly strong. Although you can see kind of a mixed reaction. A number of the analysts saying just generally very, po po I'd say, a positive take on the quarter, a bit better than anticipated. Margins came yeah. in fairly, fairly good on lower expenses. And I think, you know, it's already at 20 times earnings, so it's kind of, it's certainly got the markets respect in terms of being quality business. So it's not as if, you know, there have been times BlackRock's traded cheap. When people hate the market and, and you know, there's outflows, uh, it actually has, has gotten uh, pretty cheap. And it's not been the case because we've had pretty strong markets and they're uh, right in the middle of it. Yeah, I mean, alternatives also attracted some money there, $11 billion in alternatives. You know, Larry Fink has been, I think, way out front on the inflation call. Jamie Dimon also has been saying sticky inflation, sticky inflation, but Fink, early was talking about fiscal stimulus just permeating the economy, no recession. I remember when he was on with us last year talking about, I don't see recession because we've had so much fiscal spending, and by the way, that's going to make inflation sticky. So it's interesting time to talk to him on a week where CPI surprised to the upside and has made investors rethink the entire rate view. A number of Wall Street firms today, Mike, are saying it's not going to be till December that we get a it rate cut, and then that yeah. would be one cut for the year. Exactly. Um, and so, that you know, I was sort of dangling that out there starting a few weeks ago about, you know, this whole we're in the opposite version of 2015, where the Fed wanted to get off zero, they wanted to punctuate a, a you know, a whole Fed cycle, and they couldn't. The economic numbers were weak, inflation was low, they didn't have the basis to do the multiple cuts that year that they anticipated a year earlier. And finally, in December, without the economy telling them they should, they raised rates by a quarter percentage point off of zero. So I, I was, you know, this is now starting to become the chatter out there. No landing. Uh, it's kind of a no landing. But they want to get it done. They find they want to finish up the cycle. I think. So see if they can. Somehow, I think you two are going to be discussing this for some time to come. As we have been. Always. Yeah. I always enjoy it. It's better when we disagree, though. I, I, true. I, pr I particularly enjoy that. Yeah. Is there something we'll you guys will something. disagree about? Well, we always disagree on how much rates matter something. for stocks. How much what? Rate? Rates yeah. matter for stocks. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're everything. He thinks they don't matter. All right. We're going to dig into that see what we can mm -hmm. do here between uh, Mike and Sarah. But uh, if you haven't noticed, we are on track, or at least looking for what will be a uh, significantly lower open. This has been a, it's been a, I don't know, bottle of the week? Can I call it a bottle of the week? All right, all right. We got a lot more squawking the street for you than we need to.
you see. All right, we well, yeah, got an opening about five and a half minutes, five and a half minutes from now. You can see the uh, NASDAQ 100 laggards is composed largely of companies that would suffer as a result of what is a Wall Street Journal story today that's highlighting the fact that um, in China they are um, moving away from using uh, U.S.-based chips, uh, CPUs, for example, in their telecommunications infrastructure, advanced micro and Intel, two of the larger providers of those chips. Perhaps not a surprise, nonetheless, the story itself uh, is certainly taking a toll on some of those stocks here. Right before we get started with trading, we're back at the Good morning, retail traders. Well, one of the banks didn't want to give guidance. J.P. Morgan warns against geopolitical tension. So that didn't turn out too good. And again, they're making up excuses, but, you know, when you give no guidance on an upbeat economy, they're boasting and bragging about every day how great it is. There's something wrong. We're being misled. So how many minutes? We got one minute to go. Let's get her on. Mike says he's been real busy. Lowering its price target on the stock from 180 to. I had to message him find what the hell's going on here. Maintaining a neutral rating. I believe that was City. Wedbush reiterated its outperform rating at the 300 dollar price. Let's see how how tough these guys are today. How many excuses they make up for the bank's earnings? Because they weren't good. I mean, they were good, but they forecast. As the earnings estimates for next year are down 30% so far this year. So in other words, you keep having to roll forward when this is going to uh, kind of get some relief in terms of pricing and, uh, and earnings falling to the bottom line. So as the stock has come down, every analyst has to review, you know, where the valuation is. You're talking about 370, earning 370 next year is where the consensus is yeah. right now. So you're well so I'm right out of the gate, we ought to get a bounce. Next year's estimates. And so now the stock has actually bounced nicely around 160 a few times. God, I can't stand that screaming. It's louder than it's ever been. It's like they... A bunch of idiots. The, 
not really trying to momentum and to buy this dip right now. I like JP Morgan, but I'm, I think I'm going to snake break out, pull back higher low, symmetrical flag. In spite of the VWAP with a double top <clears throat> out of a snake breakout pullback higher low pre market. We got a one, two, three on the spy showing up to the plate. So we'll see if it wants to hold support. straight across resistance to the VWAP. <clears throat> That's a pretty good dip this morning. It might take up on it, take you up on it. Okay, now we're at the VWAP. Okay. <clears throat> Spy just broke out. We got So spy on the 15. I mean, I'm not too excited about the bank news, but we got to see. They say it's always the guidance that you got to go off of, but if it wasn't good. But I don't think it matters. I really don't. Not in this market. I've never seen anything like it. JP Morgan. NVIDIA had a good bounce yesterday. It could pull back. We have a 1, 2, 3 on NVIDIA right now.
See, WFC got in a bunch of trouble with all kinds of stuff. From real estate back during the Obama years to to overcharging. Then Stephanie got on her this morning pumping it up. I'm like, are you? We got a new low on AMD, and Apple got a new high. Rent moving. I'm watching the Spy here, because he, he suffers. I mean it. I got 515.25 as resistance. So we had the snake symmetrical flag breakout to resistance. I'm going to put an alert back here on the double top. Five eighteen strikes, and if we move, it could be the other one. Five twenty. We got some green volume coming in, big time over the cell. XP down 63 cents, Nile down again, AMD down, ooh, SMCI, I got what, 886? So we get a little pullback right here. Watch the spy. With 228, the 516 strike. I want to see if it gets down here to this bottom support. Mr. down 35 bucks. NVIDIA down 16. We got three black crows on the video. Four. Three black crows right there, though. There's our one of our patterns. Meta pulled back some. Meta's got a flag forming. And Apple broke out. I think I hit my target on Apple. Okay, here we go. What am I looking at? Spy. Somehow it took my order.
I don't think she's gonna run though. So April 15 strike 516 at 225. We got five contracts for now. SPXL. They can go down. This can drop. So if it, I'm, I'm seeing if we're gonna break. If not, I'm gonna get. I ain't gonna hold it. Um, if it doesn't hold the VWAP. because we got kind of higher lows. There's 225 again. Two twenty four, two twenty five. I don't think it's going to work. I put that on. I put that on the SPX. No. Break, baby. Break it. What's the matter, you? Snake, symmetrical flag, break out to the 200 SMA. Break out. See, we got a little higher lows. I'm think I'm thinking we're going to pop a little bit. Okay. Ascending triangle. We'll know within a minute or two if we're going to break out, and if not, I'll get out. No, I won't. Yeah, I will. How'd you do that, Jim? Because I know what an ascending triangle is, you ding-dong. Break it. Get that grading pin out here.
calling huge pup here. Woke up this morning. Uh oh Did anybody take this trade with me? I know y'all had a little bit of a, what do you call it? Yesterday, um, 150, come on. Now this is the 200, S oh, oh, uh oh. Now, I would uh, consider taking some profit here and the 200 SMA, 255, baby. <laughs> I'm off to the beach where all the women are in reach. Goodbye. Cold feet is what I was thinking of yesterday. See, not every trade I get into, I have to average down on. The percentage is probably, what, 5%? Then I just add on because I know I can get free money. But getting caught in trades, that don't happen very often. But when it does, I'm, i got to play it out. <clears throat> that or sell early. And take a small loss, and I'd rather play it out and try to get a big win out of it. So that's what usually happens. But here's the beautiful, I mean, this is beautiful plan. Jim, that was magnificent. How nice, how did you do it? Nailed it. That's nice. That's 30, 30 cent, 30 cent profit. In a matter of what, four minutes? <laughs> Stop shorting. <laughs> Let's retest the ascent. Let's retest the resistance. Five fifteen twenty five. We don't want to go any lower than that. How many times do I call that trade out? May I ask? Oh, I didn't want to remove that. Do undo the remove. To the 200 idea, to the 200. Open to the 200 out of the trade. Sending triangle to the 200. Okay, now we're going to reverse to the upside for it to stay bullish. So I could get back in it here. Or look at the SPX, Bobo. Um, yeah, the SPX is good too. Same kind of pattern. So remember, I don't try to get in, well... So you got your three black crows. That one went from 140 to 251 right there. Actually, it went a little bit lower than that, 230-something. <coughs> on the one call I just made on that spy. Richard. 
Okay, Washboard Jim is going to be looking at the 516 stru... Oh, that's a spy. Never mind. SPX. I'm going to say good morning. I'm going to say good morning to Big Al. I'm going to say... Um, Randy, are you in a better mood today? Did you take a bath? Randy! Wake up! Unbelievable. He just fell asleep on us again. Good morning, Jen. You have a special ritual you do every morning when it comes to drinking your coffee? Are you, are you a matcha? Do you like matcha? Jim, leave me alone. I'm trading right now. We have a one, two, three on PA, uh, NW. Home Depot. It's down. Yuck. I'll tell you what, you just can't hold stocks anymore at these levels. If you do, you're taking huge risks. Look at Baba. I mean, damn, Baba's down here at my yum yum. See? Off the 200 SMA on the one hour time frame. Again, they were talking about China this morning, pumping it. Okay, here we got spy drop down. Okay, this is the plan. Is everybody listening? We got a yin yang. We're going to clean this up. No, we're not. We got an alert right here. Hike. We just got triggered, my first alert. Here comes the second. And we got a one, two, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, are you prepared to trade the spy with Bobo? Because we got a one, two, three down here. And if we can trigger this next alert at 514.39, I'll start a position. Maybe I'll get some matcha. I got into a matcha kick. And I made some matcha humus. Matcha, can you pay up to 50 bucks for just a couple ounces of that stuff? It's very expensive. We are waiting. Who's waiting with me on the spy? Jim or chicken. You traded that last trade perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
You get out at the 200 SMA, right? No big doubts wash. And right now we're waiting for this. I mean, the bank news is not good. I mean, they, Stephanie says, well, they have a lot of things going on. Do, do, do. NVIDIA, one, two, three. We're at the VWAP, NVIDIA. One, two, three. Okay, get ready. SPX looks pretty close, pretty much ready. Let me see here, SPX. Um, SPX right here, the fifty one ninety. <laughs> All right, SPX fifty one ninety Lotto. I'm just getting ready. I should have grabbed it. We got a hammer right here. Is it 570? See? Let me get it. Come on. Don't go up no more. Get just a little drop. Ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at the 5190s. I don't know if it's going to let me in or not. Fifty-one ninety. Lotto. SPX. It's already got one trade out of the way. Oh, no. Oh, six fifty now. Six seventy. There's a hundred bucks. Richard Randy. Jim, is that a head and shoulders? It sure is. Okay. They just dropped all of a sudden. Thank you. What a pivot. I love you too. Okay, double bottom. Riley, 470. I'm in at 470, double bottom. We'll see if it works. Double bottom, 470. 51, 91, 90, 90, 90, 90. Well, how in the hell did that drop so much?
Oh, I, I'm not dropped. I'm up. <laughs> I was saying it looked to me like it dropped. It, it jumped a hundred bucks just like that. Get out if you want to take profit. But I'm going to stick this thing out. That's a big hammer. We're going to a one, two, three. For I, I love you so. Take me up to the honey hole. I'll buy you a diamond ring. Two, three, four. I'm going to buy you a diamond ring. I'm going to buy you a diamond ring. I'm going to buy you a diamond ring. And tell me that want your love. Give me some of your love. Break. Oh man, I should have got my hundred bucks. Yeah, I think we're in a bear market right now. That should have took off. I should have sold that. So now we're retesting the triple bottom. And to stay bullish, you need to hold right here. Can't go any lower. I mean, the earnings on the bank, the guidance on the bank's not good news. We could have a pretty good sell-off today if this does not hold. You some bitch. Oh, yeah, we could drop a lot more. Well. I'm still waiting. Anybody take this SPX? Say yes or no. Not yet. We're at a double bottom. This is do or die here. You had a chance to get it at 460, 470 again. But I'm not telling nobody to take his trade because I'm bearish. I'm just hoping here for a double bottom bounce. Give him some of your love. And hell no, I wasn't at Diddy's house that night. And Diddy asked me why I don't call him no more. I said I just said I don't I don't go that way. <laughs> Diddy. Gangsta.
Well, I'm glad they don't bring up the old disco parties. <laughs> I'd be in jail for life. We got a double bottom on IWM. We got an inverse head and shoulders on the QQQ. We're at support on the indices, on all of them. So it's do or die now. And Jimmy is in ASPX at 470. Oh. Come on. We can drop more. I mean, the bank earnings were not good. Yep, we just had a new low. Well, that sucks. Okay, well, what to do? I'm definitely bearish. I gotta go with my gut. Yeah, we've got a long drop here. I'm still in this thing. Two hundred ninety-seven. <laughs> ninety. That I decided to make for us because it showed that we could be on trend for four to five percent inflation year over year by the election time if we continue to get readings like we have gotten the 0.3 percent monthly gains on inflation that could be a big problem for president biden even with the disinflation last year people were still feeling the cumulative impact now if we start to go back up and see these stickier prices what's happening with gas prices not great no. also not a great look for the fed to start cutting in right September. right no right right before an election um all good points. Uh, all right, we've started earnings season. In fact, it does kick off with the banks. Leslie picked this Why are you all so droopy? Leslie, I, if I could just come to you on JP Morgan, I'm, perhaps you're going to start there anyway. I did note that stock is down almost 5%. Not quite sure exactly what it is they said on the call. Well, you idiots, it's geopolitical. The cost of oil, inflation, debt. I can explain it to you real simple. Turmoil and concerns about contagion therein. Uh, so pretty notable there, 4.6% decline right now. Those shares under pressure 
after the firm guidance showed slightly higher expenses and net interest income for the year. The firm saying NII, the profitability metric for loan making, will be $89 billion, boosted by $1 billion from prior guidance given in January. And analysts call that a moderate disappointment given the rate environment appeared to have grown more favorable for some of the large banks. Plus, it's had a wonderful run. Now, it's up 44% from the year. I mean, it's had it's had also had a great run. It's up forty some percent. You know, um, like I said, I mean, if, on a bank stock, if you get ten percent, twelve percent a year, you're doing great. So it's it's overbought. That's all. I, I, it just needs to come down and consolidate. Everything's overbought. I don't care what these idiots on here say, in my opinion. I'm going to play it real safe. The 9, 1 in 72, 82 would be a great buy for, for J.P. Morgan. About another fourteen dollars down. Another thirteen dollars down would be a great buy. Come on, SPX. Jimmy's added on. I'm not scared. Not yet, anyway. QQQ has a symmetrical flag with a one, two, three, and Spy has a double bottom with a higher low. You don't have to be careful. You 
The guy says, you don't understand why the banks are down. <laughs> for J.P. Morgan, um, for, which was impacted by the FDIC, but for Wells and for Citi, you know, they're really reiterating the core expense run rate. Um, so nothing much to report there, as a, you know, other than the first quarter is typically seasonally higher. Finally, Erica, the city, which, as a stock at least, has outperformed many of its peers, something I can't remember it having done for years, at least during the first quarter. Um, did this quarter report do enough to continue that momentum? I think for now, yeah, sure. Um, I'm a little bit of a city skeptic given the history, and you know, many of us analysts have been burned having buy ratings on that stock, you know, being in love with just the multiple. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I think that, you know, city is truly making good progress. You know, like Sarah mentioned, expenses are still in line with what they're guiding for for the year. And really becoming a more efficient company is critical for that stock to continue to Cri do well. Critical. I think looking forward from here, there's a lot of skepticism about... My cost average down on a contract here. ...80 to 81 billion, which they did reiterate today just because it's impossible for me to believe that you can cut expenses as a bank in a commoditized business and also grow revenues without great tailwinds. That being said, I think a critical, critical catalyst beyond today for Citigroup are the stress test results in June. If they can buy back more than 500 million, which is what they did this quarter, yeah. then that stock can maybe really start working for real and take, you know, get long only investors from the sidelines because buying back the stock at that kind of discount to tangible book value is very, very powerful in terms of what that could mean for tangible book value accretion. Great, something for us to keep in mind as we uh, as we head to June. Erica, always appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. As we head to break, here's our roadmap for you for the rest of the hour. Wild week for stocks and bonds. How to position your portfolio from here as we head into next week's flood of earnings. Plus, always some big moves in technology. Apple for We're up and up green. In almost yeah. Amazon's at all-time highs. And we've got a number of street calls that you need to know about. And a rare exclusive with Nike CEO John Donahoe on his preparations for the Paris Olympics, the health of retail and the consumer, and much more. Big show still ahead. Squawk on the street. We'll be right back after a quick break. I gotta go run an errand real fast. Anybody in here ever been behind on your taxes? <laughs> been in trouble with the IRS? And had to pay them back? I've got, I've been in trouble twice. The last, first time they got me for 10 grand. And the second time they got me for 22. I had to fight it and fight it and fight it. But finally, Double bottom though, double bottom though, snake. Stocks sliding again here as investors digest this morning's batch of bank earnings. The Dow and the S&P both on pace for their second snake Snake breakout pullback, boom. Of its highest levels of the year. The NASDAQ actually is higher for the week. Joining us now is Crossmark Global Investment CEO and CIO, Bob Dahl. And I do wonder if there's some sort of gold's up, oil's up, dollar's up, 
and commodities and, and tech and what what that tells you happened this week well i think what it's saying sarah is the economy is okay uh inflation is not uh, that is it's too stubborn you covered that well for the first two minutes um that means bob that's dole that's, that's not good for valuations you know Stock selling at 21 Bob and a half are assuming that the cut rates like the beginning of the year six times and then it was four and then three and now it's two, maybe not at all. I hey, they never said it was going to be six, you idiot. You all said it. And I said, no way. So stop it. Get over it, please. Go on to another subject. The market's overbought. Admit it. You guys hyped it up. On speculation. You don't trade on speculation. You trade on confirmation. The market does not predict the future. It predicts the present. The, uh... Uh, rate cuts, you can't sustain the P.E., and then if, if earnings become a question mark, um, that will cause a lot more people to ask questions. Why do you think earnings will become a question mark if the economic data continues to surprise mostly in a better place? Well, Inflation, you idiot. First quarter pre-releases, the percentage that were negative were the highest in five years. Companies are struggling to raise price. She doesn't get it. I got a business. My cost of goods cost me 30% more to run my business within three years. 30%. It's not going down. Another four years is going to cost me another 20, 30% if these idiots in Washington keep this spending up. We've got a head and shoulders. That is, companies with high earnings predictability, high earnings persistence strong free cash flow those stocks have done just fine as the market's gone up i think they will show some defensive characteristics uh if the market has that's Citibank here in the next weeks okay bob thanks for checking in appreciate it okay, so we bounced off the bottom this week we're down three quarters of a percent right now on the SP. jimmy called out the chips a little bit ago amd bounced and we had a double bottom on Apple. It bounced a little bit. We got a double bottom now on Amazon. Now, this is one of their pump stocks. It's same as Meta. And I think Meta's way overbought. They know it too. JP Morgan's been quite blunt about how he feels about the world economy he is not pleased and he's been these guys mentors for years their go-to guy and they're ignoring him Okay, put
I should, no, no. If we don't hold this support, I'm going to take J.P. Morgan to 172. Be very careful in the market right now because I think it's very misleading at these high levels. It's like um, it's, I love I love J.P. Morgan. It's my favorite bank, and I'm ready to trade it. We just now broke down below the 20-day low. So if I look at the weekly time frame, we broke broke below the nine. So the next support would be the 21. And each one of these would represent. These are weekly time frames. So each one of these. Right here would be probably a solid support. Why? I'll show you. Because throughout this whole process of going up, there's only two other ones. This one right here, where you touch every all the candles touch, all but that one. And that's a month and a half, month and three quarters. And then right here, you got three quarters of a month where you got the candles all touching. So that's an equilibrium in that little channel. And we should stop right there. And it ain't that far away for the reversal on J.P. Morgan. Now I bet these people on Wall Street don't know that. Pretty much right there right now. It could one more pull back, boom, I'm in it. SPX is down. Nvidia has a one, two, three, four, and then the one, two, three right here. You'll get my coffee in a second. Do, 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 do. Or let's just say we'll go with the neutral strip. We were, everybody was expecting cuts and we keep taking those off the table. Yeah. Well, there's a couple things there, right? With the lowering of the uh, of interest rates, that makes the high yield of the utilities, the staple sector, more attractive, and those will 
those will respond just like a bond, right, with the, uh, with the lower rates and prices go up. Um, also, again, you come back to earnings. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the areas that have been under pressure over the last year, uh, energy, materials, industrials, kind of your, your cyclical play. And again, I think that's, a lot of that is over concerns of a recession, which we saw a year ago, they, they kind of come back, but with the higher for longer, you still run the risk of a policy error by the Fed mm. and yeah. tipping us into a recession. Uh, one point here that I noticed today, I'm curious your thoughts on, when you have uh, kind of dividend shareholder yield on your mind as a safety trade. Apple rent has, new high of day uh, multiple examples in the last couple months because it was an underperformer all year it's been trailing all of the hyper growth AI stuff in a, in a unique way the correlation to Nasdaq and Apple has been at one of the lowest in history uh, basically all this year but then on days where we get kind of a classic risk off Apple's the only one in the mag 7 that's up mm -hmm. Um, what do you think about that? Are we actually trading specific companies now, like alternatives to bonds? I mean, it's dollar bonds, the most clear risk off move you could ask for in markets, and Apple's up. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, I think they, they, you look at it's Apple. Just because it's oversold, you dingbat. Nobody's going to turn off the phones during a recession. Uh, we saw that, you know, we saw this back in the uh, um, 08, 09 recession. You know, people keep keep their phones uh, no matter what. So, you know, the telecom stocks, Apple, uh, they did very well given a recession. I think it, it's a little bit of that. It's not the valuations are not as stretched as some of the others, and uh, you know, um, it, it becomes a more defensive play because. People love their phones. I love the telecom references. I've kind of made that before. Kind of a classic, almost utility sort of uh, telecom type play. Don, great conversation. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Don Nesbitt, CIL at DCM Equity Group. All right, nice uh, chat there on valuations related to interest rates. And Apple working today here. When we come back, we've got two upgrades, some positive notes and a downgrade. We'll take a look at a few more analyst commentaries this morning. DocuSign, Mobileye, VF Corp, VFC seems to be a frequent bearer of bad news. Shares down again to a low. Stocks also ailing today as we haven't seen many buyers emerge. <laughs> Who's there? Thanks for swinging by, Carl. The number one retail trigger's here. We got a symmetrical flag on NVIDIA. Symmetrical flag on NVIDIA. CCL Snow is up there are Two big greens today Apple PLTR up a few cents That's it on my list A little more pullback on the video
Come on, YouTube, hit the like. Even if you don't want to, do it. And do it now. Spy just pulled back to support. Onto mor this morning's pre-market flag. I think this is do or die on both of them. The SPY and the SPX. It stopped out of my little trade. But now we're at a double bottom down here from yesterday's low. We're at yesterday's low on SPX. Watch it close. SPX yesterday's low. Oh, you already put it in there. <laughs> Sue beat me to it. sign to neutral from sell here and actually raising their price target significantly up to $62 neutral to sell here they do believe that the shares are fairly valued when you're looking at the marketplace here and they also believe that DocuSign has moved past the COVID expansion challenges with the potential for future margin expansion which is actually a very good sign to say the least here now there is a significant amount of competition within the e-signature space especially when you're looking at Adobe there have been some talks and some rumors going around that, like maybe this could be a takeout target to say the least but they have been able to streamline their business kind of cut a lot of that fat out and that's why we are seeing a lot of optimism when it comes to analyst uh, predictions and when it comes to price targets as well as when you're looking at the price action so a really good turnaround story to say the least here in the near term for DocuSign. Yeah. All right. It's not without some chop, though, Rick. I mean, this thing does get a little volatile still. Yeah, some big swings, actually. And, you know, uh, the more it swings, though, the more something stands out to me, which is that we haven't been able to crack 65. We've yeah. topped out there around that area numerous times here, and we just haven't been able to break above it for the past year. So that's an ultimate uh, uh, upside point that I would be watching. That would be a sensible point, perhaps, to choose a strike, either buy a call or sell a call spread or something, because when you have one of these ceilings that's tested repeatedly, the more significant it becomes. Uh, the more times it's tested without being broken, it can lead to a big breakout. Uh, breakout. So in the more short term, we've been trending upwards since our yearly lows. We're up about 57% from that point. More recently after earnings, though, we've got this upward channel type shape here that we've been uh, down here, but still grinding upwards. However, there was price trending downward as price makes uh, new receiving. You can see that momentum is not doing really exactly what traders would like here. Uh, no. the bullish side, at least here. If we were to push to the upside, upper boundary of our trend line matches up with the volume node here around I 62. That could be a, a, a resistance area to work out. Then 65, obviously, is the point to the upside that I would really be curious about. To the downside, 
21 days. Yeah, Frankie, baby. I can't make it to the club tonight. I'll be at Diddy's house. All right. Uh, sounds like there's a maybe four times the charm situation. Uh, if that's a thing, make it another run up here and try it again. It looks like that's where we're going. Test that level that it's uh, held us back multiple times. That'd be a big deal if Dr. Sun could crack through resistance that's uh, been holding under for the past year. Lots of uh, surprising strength in this company and a lot of positivity. Uh, all right, uh, last one. Uh, mobile Eye, let's talk some models, let's talk some tech. KG, what do we got? Yeah, in this one, we might see the technicals actually align with the fundamental thesis from Wolf Research. They actually upgraded Mobileye to outperform from pure perform with a price target set at $41. They believe that the limited risk to the near-term estimate is going to be, once again, it is actually limited. So they don't believe that there's a lot of downside risk when it comes to the estimates as we come close to their earnings announcement. And they do believe that there are key advantages in the supervision and chauffeur technologies which may become evident in the next six to 12 months here. They have been able to reset their expectations when it comes to the market. We have seen a little bit of a lull when it comes to the EV demand side of the business. But once again, they have a competitive advantage when it comes to the technology. And Wolf Research believes that that's gonna be a tailwind for them here in the near term. Okay. All right, I mean, look, uh, this has been a sector with a lot of downside and Mobileye was not omitted from that, but they're starting to come back a bit, Rick, or did we fail to close that gap? Well, you know, I, I agree. Like, this is definitely not the best looking chart I've ever seen here. We are up 34% of recent lows, though, so we've had a bit of a rally, but we are a Does Jimmy want to try it again? That more recent gap down that we had here. Jimmy will wait for the confirmation. Jimmy has a 1 2 freebie. Uh, here and 39.34, which was our pre gap lows. So we can see now that we are, uh, maybe that's in question if we could even reach there because the trend is starting to slow down here. We had this steeper trend line. No shit, Sherlock. To a more, uh, we have a one, two, three fall that here. failed. We did hold on at our moving average con plus confluence, though, our, our 21 and 63 day exponential moving averages. However, RSI did break its trend line there. So that was uh, a, a, a more bearish signal here. We are still above the 50 midline, but not really having a, a super clear directional beam right now here. So Oak. Upside resistance would be our recent highs near 34, which also matches up with our purple 252 uh, exponential moving average and our old blue trend line. Old support can become new resistance. To the downside, we've got our two moving averages, our recent lows, all between like 30 and 31. All right, okay, so a mobile out a little rejection there of this comeback of potential, but I hope it's not over yet. It's still above 15 in your side, so uh, a little what? chance of some optimism there. A little change winner in the list here today, Docky Sign. Um, credible enough as it may sound. Thanks, Kevin Green. Thanks, great two cats. Coming up, we're going to talk about that important story regarding chips and China coming back. Maybe a good reason for why you've seen some of the risks off today. More efforts to phase out U.S. technology. I remember when I first started flying. And we would experience turbulence. I would and Jim was flying. there to hold my hand in case everything got scared. If it wasn't for Jim holding my hand when the turbulence hit, I probably would have never been a, a stewardess. Thank you, Jim. You're such a good man, Jim, for saving my life during that horrible plane ride. Anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwamm Network. Trading the trending names every day. It's Fast Market. Ready for you, ready to go. I'm Kevin Hayden. Catch me on Fast Market, weekdays at noon on the Schwab Network. <laughs> Boom, boom. Volume has slipped up here a little bit. We got the the TTM squeeze moving 
in a positive manner. Every morning, every trade. Now, you know, learning sucked. Anytime, I mean, okay, every trader knows that you look into the guidance of a stock. And that's how you try to predict how it's going to move in the future. So anybody that gives a poor guidance, usually these guys on Wall Street will go bad, you know. Ooh, bad, bad. So the bank's guidance coming out aren't being very good. But they're going to make a lot of money because interest rates are so damn high. But their guidance, I don't, I don't see how a bank cannot put out guidance, and being and and the way these guys have been talking for the last six, seven months, how rosy Wall Street, how rosy the economy is, which I don't see it that way, but they do. I see it as back in the day they used to always say, you know, when when they're printing the money up like they are during when they did during Obama, and they always would say that. Um, what would they say? Oh, I forgot what they'd say. I was getting ready to say something. Huh. They don't hardly ever talk about the deficit, but that was—I was trying to get across something that they used to talk about. Was a was a deterrent. And they don't, and it's deterrent now, but they don't talk about it. I can't remember what I was hearing. The moral of the story there, at the second part of it. Huh. I need a good vacation. <laughs> oh, I need a vacation. What was I trying to get to? <sighs> it was an indicator of some sort that they used to really be skeptical of. Dow Jones down 375, NDX 258, Russell 26, and the SPX 56. What's Dow Jones? What about Cat? That guy brought up Cat the other day. Dead cat had a dip yesterday. Nice one, two, three, boing. And it's at the 200. See, it's just too big of a freaking run. Overpriced. Way overpriced. Way overpriced. But at a at a at a scalping place though, day trade maybe. Back to the two hundred on the fifteen minute. I'll be right back.
Yeah, I love what Alex is talking about. You know, there's more than just one thing at play here, more than just the dollar, for example. You know, we see precious metal demands going through the roof right now, right? We've yeah. seen a gold, gold's rallied above 2400 That's a new record. Silver's reached its highest price since 2021. And so, you know, we see all this stuff happening, and it's not just China. We have kind of a perfect storm brewing, and and there's there could be much, much more. It's not the, 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 uh, the sky is is not falling here but there's a lot of things that we need to pay attention to right we need to pay attention to what's happening domestically we need to pay attention to what's happening in china but we also have this geopolitical tension that's happening and you mentioned it earlier in iran you know when we see this happen we see an increased demand for safety and we're starting to see that play out. We have been actually seeing that play out all week. And so, you know, as this continues to play out, you're exactly right. We could see new lows in the stock market. We could see new challenges in the markets in general. And as we do, uh, much of that is going to be very dependent on what's happening in the various sectors and, and segments that we've just discussed here. The gold move, as we were talking about, I mean, it's huge. Silver, too, to Scott's point, across the board. Um, it's one of those things where it's almost kind of like the dollar in a way that there's a lot of uh, reasons it can move. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to always parse them out. It's also been going now for a while. Mm -hmm. For me, I noticed that gold really started outperforming when the momentum trades kind of hit a wall. I mean, look, gold had the big move earlier this year alongside the momentum trades, but really the breakout in gold uh, above 2200 happened the last week of March. That's basically like your NVIDIA high, your Bitcoin high. And to me, that's where this starts, Alex, because if you've got stocks down for whatever reason, that could just put a bit into gold right now that's not even really inflation related. It's not geopolitics related. It's just maybe stocks stop working. Here's the new momentum trade. Yeah, gold is like the ultimate, like, you know, break glass if necessary. And then it's not often, <laughs> yeah. it's not often though that. there. When it's just yeah. kind of a situation where you, you would have gold because you're not sure and at some point you kind of just know what it is. Like it isn't necessarily, uh, you're not gonna get rich owning gold, well you have been, uh, but you're not typically gonna get rich owning gold, but it's more of a protection trade, truly a protection trade, especially for those who uh, have doubts about you know, fiat currencies. We know the whole digital asset movement, uh, Bitcoin uh, argues some of the same things, but I look at today as it's not a growth scare by any stretch. I mean, you see commodities surging to me, this is geopolitical risk leading to higher oil prices, sure. You definitely see that with the, with the Brent prices now up almost to 92. But you also see just broad commodities rallying. So to me, this is, is there a trade spat brewing? Uh, does this tit for tat that we're seeing with China, does it turn into something more? We're on the, uh, you know, on the edges, commodities get more expensive then because everything gets more expensive. And uh, we talked about global uh, kind of bottoming and synchrony on, on the manufacturing front. That's going to lead to higher commodity prices. Inflation expectations higher than expected for this preliminary look in University of Michigan sentiment. All of this, to me, paints a different market uh, than the one that everyone was worried about in 2023, which was a recessionary, deflationary one. This is more of a stagflationary to reflationary with some geopolitical uh, uncertainty sprinkled on top. I like that. Yeah, the uh, sprinkles definitely this week uh, were very real with some of those uh, bad geopolitical headlines. And uh, that could probably explain crude up 3%. I mean, we do kind of have a, a, a sort of a scary, if you were to take today's market through a geopolitical lens, it's kind of a scary one, Scott. Yeah, there's no doubt. It really kind of is. And, and it's something that we need to pay attention to. It's scary for a reason, right? Uh, but, you know, not all the world doesn't end because we have geopolitical tension or geopolitical pressures on the market. And so what we need to do is just pay attention to what is working. All of this will eventually work its way out. It always has. It always will. And if it doesn't, it won't matter anyway. Right. And so, so that's the same thing I thought about these the, this inflation. But the government couldn't stop spending. It would have worked its way out, but the. They, I guess I heard just this morning he, he, uh, another eight billion relieved on student loan program, which he was already said was unconstitutional, but he went ahead and done it again. Eight billion, and I paid. I paid my loans back. I want a check 
for my student loans. I, 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 you know, I worked two jobs to pay my, my student loan back. I don't see any reason why these idiots can't work two jobs, pay their loans back. I did it. Account built for investors, named highest in client satisfaction by J.D. Power for five years in a row. With investor checking, you get the award-winning features of our checking account, plus cash management solutions, all designed for investors like you, with no monthly service fees or account minimums. Unlimited and I did it being audited twice. Worldwide, no overdraft fees, and enhanced security features to keep your money safe. Also, because your investor checking account is linked to your Schwab One brokerage account, you can manage your checking and investing in one convenient location. Moving funds between your accounts is easy. Cash move to your brokerage account is available in seconds. That means you can stop waiting and start investing in stocks, bonds, money market funds, and more. Get <laughs> investor checking. The checking account built for investors. No, it cost me... Well... I went I went ten dollars ten thousand in debt and the government paid for my college because of my epilepsy. And I got my GED. I told him I'd get my GED. So, yeah, there's part of my life where I'm pretty messed up, but stock exchange on trading three sixty. I'm together now. We got a hammer on the 15 minute on the SPX. And from the heart of Wall Street at the New York Stock Exchange. Up to the minute market insights. Example trades and stock specific analysis featuring the smartest minds in the business. No politics, no noise. Analysis ahead of the biggest events for the economy. From bell to bell and beyond. Watch live and on demand. 24-7, seven days a week on schwabnetwork.com. And on all your favorite streaming services. Available anytime, anywhere. On any device for free. Schwab Network, empowering every investor and trader. Every market. Well, there goes that little theory. I thought I had something here. With Schwab Investing Themes, it's easy to invest in ideas you believe in. Spot a trend in electric vehicles? Have a passion for online gaming? Or well, get ready to jump in now. economy? Choose from over 40 themes, each with up to 25 stocks identified by our unique algorithm. Buy it as is or customize to align with your goals. All at your fingertips. Schwab Investing Themes. 40 customizable themes, up to 25 stocks in just a few clicks. Do do do. live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Coming up on today's show, we'll dive into the big bank earnings, find out why J.P. Morgan Chase is down and adding to those losses, and we'll get you prepped for next week's reports. Plus, Investopedia's Caleb Silver joins us with a full earnings season outlook. Then, it's a deep dive on our disruptor, GitLab. Plenty to get to, but before we do, let's take a quick look at the markets. We are seeing red arrows across the board on the final trading day of the week. The Dow is down about 390 points right now. That's 1%. JP Morgan, the biggest loser there. S &P Watch, get ready here. I'm going to give this a shot. Weakness in financials are upsetting strength and energy. NASDAQ has given up all of its weekly gains now, down more than... About one and a half. Fifty one ninety still. Well, Russell two thousand, meanwhile, biggest no. loser this week is down about one point three percent. Now let's check out some of the futures products. Fifty one eighties is trading lower right now. See it here below seventy thousand at this point. Meanwhile, the dollar, gold, and crude all higher. 
Take a look at crude oil, up about 2.7% right now, trading at 87.29 on those attack or on those reports that Israel is preparing for a direct attack by Iran this weekend. For a oh boy. of the top moving stocks in War. the market, I'm joined by co-host of Fast Market, Kevin Hanks. Hey there, I'm going to wait. I'm going to do my air. Well, shit, I want to buy this. We were talking about this one this morning. But here you are. percent in the free market. Taking a look at now, it's down more than 5.5%. 5? Israel preparing for war, though. That's not going to be good. It could get bad this weekend. The SPX calls. Yes, I got stopped out, but I'm getting back in. Randy, did you hear me? The 5180s. I'm in the 5180s right now. Three ten. Very good. Come on, man. Three bucks.
Okay, I'm going to go do an errand. I'm still in this trade, and I'm going to set a stop. We got a one, two, three, so I still got that. Don't take much. There's your one, two, three. Yeah, it's just not worth trading today. Oh, my coffee been sitting up there forever. Well, I'm going to sit back and drink a cup of coffee and trade this trade. Before I leave. Okay. Oh, God, come on. C is down. C is down to the bottom of the linear channel. Head and shoulders on Mr. Yep. Sure is. She's either going to go, it looks to me like it wants to go up, but we're close to my support on Mr. I had 14.34 with a two-headed snake. And a falling wedge support down at the bottom at 13.31. Well, magnificent. If we break out from this here bottom, will you give me an A plus? Please. Yeah, they'd lead you to believe that teachers only make 30000 a year here. I don't believe it.
I probably make more than teachers do cleaning toilets. Come on, baby. If you can count to three, you can trade with me. One, two, three. That's debt. We're waiting for the breakout. The option now is at 3.30. We're at 3.10. The fifty one eighty strike, right, Randy? Let's get it. two four six eight. Who do we appreciate? Jim, you're starting to get sound like CNBC. You sound very bullish. my turn it's my money and I need it now It's Jim's money, and he needs it now. So dial 1-800-888-4556 and send it to Washboard Jim, LLC. Come on, Jim, you can count to three. You can trade with me. Oh, we have an ascending triangle. And we also have a wedge out of a snake. Okay, we're going to rechart this up. Now, Jimmy's in the um, 5180s at 310. And we just now dipped. God darn it. I was at 340. You broke the rules. Uh, did, it, did that sound professional, Jenny? I mean, Jen? <laughs> Jenny. God, I'm talking to you like I've known you forever. Is that very unprofessional? <laughs> Strike one for the wash. You missed half of it? 
or heck, it went on for 20 seconds. Who's with me and who's not with me on this here SPX? I think there's something happening here, folks. Jim, is it true that you wear pink underwear? No. That rumor is false. Brandy, we're at 360 now from 310. I'm about ready to make some great business decisions. Does anybody know what a megaphone pattern is? Randy, you know what a megaphone pattern is? Link, do you know what a megaphone pattern is? Joe Blowhorn. What do we got here? <laughs> Woo. Good job, Ocean. You made a dollar on Deutsch? Congratulations. That's my favorite one next to Sheba. What is Sheba at? Oh. Jim, did you order cannabis? We're flagging out. Oh, what happened here? What happened here? What's wrong with Sheba? Wow, what happened to Sheba? It went to zero. Huh. We're at 350, and it looks to me like we have three white soldiers. Jim, you did it again, you magnificent. Great job. Break it. 
brechen. Mega Phone. M E G A P H O N E In Vegas used to say I couldn't sing. She missed out on a rock star. We're back at three ten. Yep. Well, you got to think, think about what happens. If Iran attacks Israel, where, where's that going to put Israel? They've been, they've been, I mean, Biden's the one that's financed Israel's war. I mean, Iran's war. And people are still going to vote for that idiot. America's got real stupid. I love Muslims, but Muslims hate us. Because we're a free enterprise system, you know, we're capitalist. Or was. So what's it going to do? Is that going to, Iran going to be knowing if they attack Israel? Israel? Is it going to bring America into the war? Biden has no clue. I mean, he got us in here in the first place. Because of his weakness. And then we had a genocide, a holocaust that we thought we'd never see again. So I don't know. It could get pretty bad. Oil could get to gas could get five, six gallon again if we don't start drilling. But we are drilling. So I don't know, it's, it's kind of funny. Not funny, but I mean, it's kind of weird. So SPX touched back to two-headed snake here. Will they attack? I don't know. I think they're going to think twice before they do it. Or attack them where, you know, not too many civilians will get killed, maybe. But if it the, the attack's too weak, that's going to put Iran in a spot. And if it's too big, it's going to put them in a spot. So they're kind of, you know, they've had these proxies do their war for them. That he'll throw Israel under the bus, yep. I'm afraid too. But I don't think they're going to nuke. It's, they're too close to nuke.
But with our open borders, I wouldn't doubt if we got terrorists over here and already planning their next plot. That's why I'm thinking about just going and travel around the world and live in a tropical vacation spot, get away from here. I did it once before, I'll do it again. But this time I'll be more secluded. Fifty one sixty two. But I still got to have great internet service, so wherever I get Starlink. Come on, baby, break. Give me a couple hundred dollars on these contracts. Is anybody in this trade with me? The SPX, if you are, let me know. Randy? Magnificent? Come on. You made me feel bad this room did yesterday. Well, I can't cost average down like Jim does. I don't do that all the time. I only do it when I'm in trouble. Which ain't very often. What's the question? So are, you, are you trading the SPX bottom with Bobo? Jimmy's in the 5180 strike at 310. He's got 2,000 contracts. He's got... He's got... 10% of the contracts that are out right now. <laughs> waiting to waiting till cons get less expensive. Hey Jen, you want to hear me sound like a drunk? Well, uh, I just uh, buy it. I just bought some 5180 contracts at $3.10 with a rising wedge. And we're waiting for the 1, 2, 3, 4 breakout. Nancy, can I have another shot of vodka? The Dutch doesn't want to break yet. <laughs> God, how dare you! There's Jenny. One, two, three, four. And now I want to get lucky. Wombits, Tubis, I got four contracts at 310, 
$1,240 investment. And I want this thing to break. So I can impress myself. Break it. What time is it? Oh man, it's already Ford's dropping franchise. Spies about to the VWAP. Spies about to the VWAP. Spies about to the VWAP. JP Morgan did hit my support level finally at 184. Yes, I called it. Tesla. Jets under 20. If gas goes up, airlines will go down. Target down a couple, three bucks, down three bucks. Uber down some. Home Depot down. Have I tried trading futures? No. I should. It'd probably be very simple. It took me, it took Vegas two years to con me into trading options. I said, why do I want to trade options? I'm making 300 a day. I'm happy. <laughs> now I make 1,000 a day. On average. Above that. JP Morgan is their bank. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Come on down, spy. What the hell are you doing to me, girl? Johnny? Whose side are you on? We hit the VWAP. Is that what you're going off of, Johnny?
You have nice breasts. Look at Johnny's breast. I almost thought you was a girl and I was going to flirt with you. You pulled a good one on me. Had me thinking for a couple of days. You see that trick you pulled on us, guys? Exactly, again, I about fell for it. Yeah, I mentioned the video at the bottom. Now we're at the 200. And damn it, SPX fell back again. I was looking so good. Okay, we're reconnecting with the right shoulder twice. So this is it. It has to break up to the upside here and break out. We did break the resistance level on the route, last routing. So it's now or never. It's now or never. Break the resistance. Kiss me, my darling. Be my tonight. Take me to the two hundred SMA. We're on the shoulder of a two headed snake. This is your last chance. Now that you Bring me to that 200 SMA. to get out of this tray. I don't want it to come back down. Not on this dip. Resistance tonight. 
take me to the 200 SMA. Now or never, my love will wait. I think I have to stop out of here because we're definitely coming back down now. That was a McDonald's commercial. <laughs> there you go. Well, damn it. Okay, I'm going to hold on here for a second. I'm not going to give up yet. This is too bullish. And I'm not adding nothing to this one. Just leave it like it is. I've had a chance to get out at two, two with two fifty profit. Now I'm back down to two ninety. Well, actually, was it two fifty? Yeah. Break resistance. It's now never. Today's losers on my scan. <coughs> We're back to 310, my entry. Carvana. We're definitely at a support level on Carvana right now. If it holds. And Adele is on here. I was looking at that the other day. Oh gosh, look at that. Look at that bounce on Adele. Jimmy called this one out. XP. We are still at 320, Randy. 310 on the 5180s. I'm still in this trade. I need to go and do my thing. Deposit. Go to the bank. I've never been asked this question. Jim? You've been a sole proprietor for 35 years of your life. Would you do it over again? Or would you stick with factory work or working for somebody else? After what I've been through in the past 35 years, past 40 years I'd say 35 years I'd say I'd do it over again but I'd do it differently but I couldn't compare I'd do it differently because we have the internet now. We didn't have the internet when I was in business, when I started business. I 
I'd still do it, but it would be a different kind of business. I'd be a movie actor. We're at 360 now. I'm starting to look good again, Randy. I'm going to the 200. I might even go to the top of the megaphone. Jim, did you take that megaphone call? Hell yeah, I did. I've been teaching this pattern for the last couple years. Okay, I look at this chart. I want to point something out to you real fast. Let's say you got in the trade down here at the bottom. Do you see where a good idea of resistance would be? It would be the opening price, right? Because you look here, we had opening price, it broke out, it came back and then dropped. And then came back to that opening price right there. See that? So I want to take this trade all the way up to that opening price and then scale out and keep a couple to the 200. If it don't work, I'll sell them. This is something that I've I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> Something that I taught someone a long time ago, and then I got reminded about it. And that is Zach Morris. Taking the pre-market channel and trading that. So you'd come up from the bottom and use that resistance or that old support as a resistance. So if you broke that old support, you could maybe move on to higher levels. Now that's blocking you with the VWAP and the 200. So you play that channel and be done with it. But play that inner, play that that pre-market channel, and then. So right now we broke the resistance. If we can gain respect, I think right now, even now. Could have been earlier, but now. If we can gain respect right there, I think we're going to go ahead and move on up. Now, Mike's been talking about the fan. I've been noticing a lot of that here with my trend lines. Dang, see, I was up there 70, 60 bucks. I could have sold that sucker just now for 300. I've been out with $300, and now I'm back down 50. I hit my target. I should have sold it, some bitch. Man, this is so trendy. We can only go on so long, and then we hit the 200. I think I made a big mistake here. I should have sold it. Hmm. 
never fails. You get your target, you got to sell it. Oh, that's a spy. What the hell? I'm looking at the wrong chart. Yeah, same thing. Well, that's a spy. Dummy. <laughs> Still, yeah, the double top. And the spy hit the VWAP. Or the 200. Wow. Indonesia files for mixed shelf offering. <laughs> that was on 311. There's no reason. This is a pump. In Indonesia Energy. This has got some big news. Or the uh, offering is, is, is over. Kuping reportedly raising WOW membership fees by 58%. And that is CPNG. JERN. Another one I want to look at is RIG. R-I-G. I'm still in this SPX. But this next time I'm up, I'm selling it. If I get up. We got a bull flag on rig. It's up too much. Rent. Goldman Sachs adjust price target for rent to 28 from 40. EZGO. Shares are trading higher if the company announced it entered a 1.8 million procurement agreement for the sale of 12 security patrol robots that's good news EZGO 184 million I'm a robot I'm programmed to receive. I'm a robot I'm programmed to receive. China. China. It's way too high right now, but look at that price part, man. Shit, look at that. Four cents all the way up to three eighty. Are you kidding me? Does it have a split or something? Oh, it's a split. One for forty split.
I'm going to keep this on watch. I don't... They did a video a while back when Atlas Trading got busted, and I meant to do the video on how to catch, how to how to trade a pump stock. Not not cutting down them guys, but how to recognize it and then how to trade it, and to know if it's a good one to trade or not. And I took it down because I I offended some of them boys but I didn't mean to offend them I was just trying to make a video where you, you could prepare yourself and know what you're what kind of trade you're getting into because you can trade them you just got to know when to get in when you get out so I took it down I'm a market maker, magnificent. When I speak, people listen. <laughs> or they turn me down. <laughs> Eight ninety five is key from Carlox on Nvidia. Okay, I'm going to go do my errands real fast, and I'll be back before power hour. I won't be gone that long. Just enough to go to the bank. I was really worried about this year's tax season. I didn't know if I did all my stuff right. But I, so far, it's okay. It's harder. It's hard. You got so many regulations now, you don't know. She got out of that trade. Now I'm down. Figure it out. <sighs> Monday, and then we're going to take a deep dive with white folio data on NVIDIA, and then we'll trade meta platforms ahead of their earnings in about a week or about two weeks or so. So we got a great show for you today. Before we bring in our guest, 
Let's go over the four major indices and see where they sit at 11 o'clock Chicago time, 12 o'clock Eastern. The S&P 500 down about 1%, 49 points to 51.49. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 13 sixteenths of a percent, 317 points to 38,141. The NASDAQ 100 composite down one and a quarter percent, 225 points to 18,083. And the Russell 2000 also down one and a quarter percent, 25 points to 2017 and some change. Now, let's bring in my co-host for today's show, Mr. Alex Coffey. He is, you know him, he's the a regular contributor on Fast Market and the uh, co-host of Next Gen Investing along with Jenny Horn. Alex, welcome to the show, buddy. Happy to be here, Kev. Um, you know, I wouldn't have said that if maybe we didn't have an interesting market brewing we today. Because there's a lot of things that could you know, take your attention today. You mentioned something going on in the southeast of the country. It's nice out in Chicago. It's a Friday. Your mind can start to drift. But with the S&Ps down 53 gold up at new highs or making new highs, volatility jumping 15% in the futures, it's hard to have your eyes off the screen. Yeah, now let's bring in our guest for today's first segment, Mr. Joe Mazzola. He is the Director of Trading and Education at Charles Schwab. Joe, we've got news out today, but we've got news that's not really on the calendar, and we've got what appears to be, by all the, the, the metrics, a risk-off environment, and not because of inflation data. Joe, your thoughts? It's because... Um, I'm not saying... I, I don't know if I would say it's not because of inflation data. I think that... I think you have to take everything into consideration as kind of a whole this week, right? I mean, basically, you know, you saw some, some midweek uh, volatility from the CPI report. Some of that was mitigated uh, the next day by the PPI report, but... You know, basically, what has it done? It's 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 kind of led to uh, a, a bit of a spike in in the ten year, and then the two year. Two year pushed close to five five uh, percent earlier in the week. Uh, ten years right around four and a half percent now. We've got earnings that came out this morning uh, from the financial sector that, you know, I think everybody was hoping that well with the net interest income uh, margins that you know these these numbers would be pretty good and and. For the most part, they were decent. I think it was just maybe the forecast uh, kind of going forward. And, you know, here we have... Uh, hey, Betty, don't downplay the forecast. Every one of you idiots on here always talk about the forecast and the guidance as number one indicator. And all of a sudden, it's not a big deal. Don't make me mad. Be honest. Guidance means a lot. It's a new highs, and I think everybody was hoping that that catalyst would be earnings, and we didn't get that today. So no, yeah, we did uh, not. Back, uh, is married, I believe. Alex, Joe's right. The bank started off earnings today a little bit of a, 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 a and let, let me go. I'm going to say something we, else. We did not on the numbers. Numbers were pretty good. Last time the banks came out, they were sucky, but we had one heck of a run on them. The earnings sucked. So they said, let's look into the next ones. These earnings, now they're not giving you any forecast. This is a bad deal. It's not good. And to just shrug it off, I've been here 20 years. I mean, they always talk about the forecast of the banks. Now all of a sudden, it's too complicated. Inflation expectations are taking the market down. One, I think yesterday's rally uh, was sort of a, a thin market driven by two stocks, and those two stocks are lower today in the case of uh, NVIDIA and Microsoft primarily. Um, I think like 40% of yesterday's rally could be uh, attributed in the S&P 500 to those two names alone. So I think there was a, it's sort of, we had the kindling in the forest for days like this. And it's really been the theme lately. Like some technical damage has been done to this market. Joe talked about a, a heightened market with all this sort of fear brewing around it now. Well, for the better part of the last five months, it's been a wave that those who have been following the trend and trading it really haven't faced any fear. I have. I don't know that there's a... <laughs> I've been scared to death of it, my friend. A calmer current, uh, and maybe the risk just isn't worth it for many uh, stock investors. We're overbought. Admit it, and let it consolidate. We're just way overbought. 
on on an assume on an assumption of six rate cuts. It's not happening. Look at all these sourdough faces. They making up excuses. Just admit it and go on with it, and everything will be fine. In terms of banks, mm -hmm. they didn't. But some of them, mm -hmm. you know, are, have still had great historic runs up until now. God, I can't take it anymore. Historical runs like we've never seen in our lifetime. This market, on assumption. Surprises you, if anything, frankly. Uh, yeah, I, I think to a certain extent, maybe the, the steepness after uh, the consumer sentiment report, because, I mean, it did look like we were trying to bounce back a little bit, mm -hmm. and then Michigan consumer sentiment comes out, and as Alex mentioned, you, you, you saw the inflation expectations uh, kind of ramp back up a little bit, and then the sentiment uh, data came in a little bit lower than expected. Um, you know, whether or not you want to call this geopolitical risk, I mean, look, I, I think geopolitical risk has been priced into the market for a while now. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not effectively so right but it just it has not the gold maybe that hasn't translated over to equities maybe the equity market it was just been a little bit slow to kind of pick up on that but we've seen it um you know you don't you don't see gold rallying the way it has with oh well, yeah local risk you don't see uh crude oil you know uh, uh, up to where it's been without some type of a risk because i mean what you know what does the supply uh, demand dynamic he's right there have really kind of changed in the last couple months. But I mean, oil, should, it's been a problem for two to three years because of Russia. So really, it just didn't start. And then the pullback was kind of freaking people out on oil. I remember them talking about that the last couple of months. It's belief that earnings will prevail we have a strong economy and look we're, we're one day into really you know into in, the earnest kickoff of the earnings season yes i know that you know we've had some earnings come in already but today is really kind of the kickoff day and so you know financials i don't think are necessarily going to lead the market that's another lie last time earnings came out they said the financials will lead the market and this guy says they don't It's just different story every time. They just make it up as they go. It's following that, so some of this volatility could very well carry forward in the next week. Yeah, Alex, we finish up uh, some more financials uh, next week. Goldman on Monday, Bank of America and Morgan Stanley on Tuesday. Then we get Netflix on Thursday. You're, Joe's right though, not a heavy week of earnings next week. Some good names plugged in and out of there but still with you know we get a retail sales number on monday mm -hmm. that'll probably get some attention to the market but what are you looking for i always like to how do you what are you looking for to end this week and what are you looking for next week yeah i want to see if the the market's fear has dissipated for the day or if it accelerates into the close so i want to see if we get uh if, if volatility has made its peak and it starts to ease or do we see another spike by the end of the day? Maybe we cool off for a couple hours. I'm not sure. You said something before the show, like how comfortable are, are traders carrying those positions into the weekend with all that's going on right now? Be that long or short, sure. we'll, we'll see. Um, as far as next week, I think anytime we hear from a, a company like Netflix, I think it's, uh, it's interesting because of the sentiment that it kind of carries for the market. Piper Sandler came out with a note today that I thought was interesting in how they described kind of the setup for Netflix earnings. But I think you could take this beyond Netflix and it's just the setup for earnings in general. We're heading into the, this is their words, they have a neutral rating on the stock. They say heading into Netflix's Q1 report, expectations feel elevated compared to the last few quarters as sentiment has shifted from better than feared in quarter three to how big is the beat going to be today. And that to me encapsulates how I think the market has felt leading up to this week. Maybe it's starting to question a little bit right now, but it completely changes the game from where we were a year ago at this time, where we were worried about recession, to now, uh, as they talk about, uh, how big is the beat going to be? Joe, that's a great topic for us to elaborate on, and that is earnings and expectations, right? Every time you see an earnings report, it's like, well, versus the estimates or versus the expectations, and a lot of earnings reports 
can be extremely good, but they don't hit consensus. They don't even meet expectations, and the stock trades off that. How do we how do we gauge that? How do we prepare for that, Joe? So the Q4 earnings, uh, you know, basically that were, were released in January and February of this year. You know, the bar was fairly low as a lot of analysts had downgraded expectations. So I'll be back. earnings heading into uh, that time period. That's a little bit of a different story uh, for this uh, expectations in, in Q1 earnings. It, it's a. Do you want to listen to this one or CNBC? There'll be commercials on this thing. You might get to see Johnny. My brother. I'm going to go to the argue one. Up eight October bottom. Taiwan semi. I'll be back. Seven percent. Be careful. Broadcom. Cloudflare, AMD. We're talking 70% gains in, in that universe. You don't want to look at those? Okay. Why don't you look at non-profitable tech? Why don't you look at some of the Kathy Wood type names that are in the arc? That ETF's up 38% since the October bottom. Coinbase is up 265%. Robinhood's up more than 100%. Block, almost 100%. CRISPR, up 60. UiPath, up 41. Is Hartnet onto something? Yeah, I mean, when you put when I you want to emphasize the conversation, that is an understatement. I mean, it's crazy to think that these companies can have this tech. I'm serious. I've been saying it. I'm going to say it ever. This market's way overbought. They're going to do everything they can to convince you differently. The narrative that markets are frothy, that they're bubbly, is 100% spot on. And if you were going to be... It seems bubbly and frosty. I mean, it, it, it's... If you're any kind of trader, you'd know that. Goldman's Tony Pascarella puts forth today is the, you know, the divergence between the movement in the mega caps and the idea of when you're going to get rate cuts, the implied rate cuts. So uh, we're going to show you a chart, which he sent out to his clients today. And you can obviously see the, the tech basket way up while the number of implied cuts this bounce that we had is not about earnings it's not about margin it's not about anything else it's only based on six rate cuts that's what they said it's either they're lying to you which they always do because i didn't believe it and i still don't believe it but that's what they presented this run on and now they're they're confronted with with uh, what what's next, you know? So they're wrong, and they won't admit it. Laboring today, even if you try to find fault with J.P. Morgan's earnings, it was still pretty darn good. Highly profitable company. I'm going to tell you, Citigroup was fabulous. It just sucked. If you. I mean, J.P. Morgan's earnings were good, but the forecast, the guidance, guys, come on. He's your main man. You took his word for everything, and now you don't believe him? Curve for longer, along with higher rates for longer. It's just hard to get really enthusiastic about financials. I mean, see, both, both, um, both what Hartnett is saying and what Pascarello is showing can technically be true. Yep. Where Pascarello says, hey, this is a reminder to keep your eye on the ball. Don't overcomplicate it. Look at what's working. <clears throat> that trend is intact. Right. Well, that trend being intact can ultimately lead to a bubble. If those stocks continue to go up as the implied rate cuts go down, right. that sort of flies in the face of at least part of what the market narrative is about. Not if their earnings deliver. Yeah, it, it, well, if they deliver, but even so, if the earnings deliver, I mean, they're assuming the earnings can deliver. And the sell the news that we saw in financial, if you could possibly see it in the mega caps, unless they. I would say that it, that is unlikely. Well, I would say because they typically just, they don't just beat. I mean, they really beat. But I'd be hard pressed to think of a quarter where the financials didn't sell off on reports, despite really good reports. It just seems tradition. Look at what JP Morgan but, did into the number. Right, right. What is JP Morgan? I don't have it right in front of me, but you tell me, what is JP Morgan up over the last 
three, four months. It's traded like a It's up a lot, stock. right? It's, it's, like been, it's been around a, a, a new high. Yeah. Right. The year to date, it's up ne near 9%. Over the last year, it's up 44%. I know. It, 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 look, take the name off it. Take the name off, uh, you know, off Facebook, or Meta, rather, and tell me which one it is. You'd be hard-pressed to distinguish between. But look, here's what I'd say. You, you reference, like, Ark, and that's like seeing a movie, and the second half is phenomenal, but the first half really sucked. Arc is still down from the peak of 140. Oh, I understand so that, but I'm huh. just looking at if you want a representation of whereas some are saying, right. hey, bubble, 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 look to the non-profitable broking right. names that have gotten, I think, a lift, at least in part, on the idea of rate cuts. Right, and I do think there are segments of the market, you're pointing out one, that have bubbles. I look at bubbles where you get these valuations in stocks for companies that just don't have the fundamentals at all. I don't view Meta, I don't view Alphabet, I don't view Amazon as a bubble. I view them as slightly overvalued here, even though I own them, but yet they have fundamentals. So it's a question of they'll catch up to the val they'll catch up to the valuation, whereas the bubble sector market that you're pointing to, and some of the SPACs that have even had a little bit of bounce, there is no catching up because they're up on air, and that bubble will get burst, and they'll go back down to earth. I, I have in front of me, now I don't, I have on my, on my fact set home screen, okay? Right. I, everything is red, except for one name that, that jumps out at you, and it should jump out at you this week, it's Apple, because it's coming off its best day since May of 2023. So we're talking about nearly a year for shares of Apple, which have been sleeping now for a long time, wondering if they've now woken up 175 pushing 176 that's been a minute since the stock has been above 170 it's been like 168 169 you figure okay the chart looks terrible it may be going down further i don't know maybe not so much bill baruch he's our committee member of course he added to his position in apple he joins us now on the phone to talk about it why why was this the moment to do that uh, hi thanks for having me on the the thing that we we looked at was uh everybody's made a really great point about the risks out there and uh, how the puck is going to commodities and materials. And we were prepared for that. In, in fact, Apple was a casualty in preparing for that. So we were about half the benchmark, half the S&P's weight in Apple and began trimming it when it was in the mid to high 180s. The news yesterday, I think, is, is what everybody has wanted from Apple this year that, that hasn't gotten it, is it, it, the innovation. Finally, something new from Apple. I think that's a very important point. Um, and, and it held the October low. So what we're doing is moving back to get to the benchmark weight. The S&P is about 5.5% of, of Apple. We're now back above 4% from below 3%. And I see myself, I see us adding more. Um, I think they're, they're, I like to buy things when they're unloved. And Apple has been unloved. And if it does turn, turn to have a good year, there is some room for it to run on, on a relative basis on the year. And the outlier here is, is if we start to see spending and services pick up in China, I think Apple could really pick up that uh, as a tailwind as well. You think this week is an inflection point then for, for these shares? I, I do. I think fundamentally, from a, from a narrative standpoint, are they innovating? And then technically, by holding that October low, 160 to 170 is a big level for, for Apple. And it's responded. I think you need to see buyers show up at that level, and they have. Yeah, I mean, this stock seemed like it was destined to maybe test 160. And, and look, maybe it still will. But this is an interesting move to keep an eye on. We'll kick it around on the desk. Bill, thanks. Good weekend to you. We'll see you on the set uh, again soon. So Goldman weighs in on this today. They trim the price target. They go to 226 from 232. They do reiterate the buy, though. Amy, they say any weakness is potentially an entry point. You know, Baruch obviously doesn't use it as a full entry point for a new position, but he says, hey, the stock's down. I'll add to it. I think it's a really hard call at this point. I still think Apple is expensive for the growth that it's going to put up, you know, even with the new innovation and new products, it's just so big. It's hard to grow that fast. It's trading at 25 times. We own it. We're underweight. The stock, I think it's, it's a great company, um, whether it's a great stock. I mean, Steve and I were talking about it. We were on the desk together when uh, on the show when it crossed three trillion. It's now two six or two seven. Um, and every at that point, everyone said it's going straight to four trillion, like without dollar market cap. I think it's fine, um, but it's not something that we're really looking to add to to generate a lot of alpha in the next few years. And if you're doing this for China, all the news headlines, including today, it's going the other way. And AMD, Intel, China doesn't want using them anymore. China is pushing their domestic phone companies. So that continues to be a negative and a major overhang. 
There's a reason why Apple manufactured 14% of their phones in India. It should be 100%. Those who have written off, Kevin, as you know, Apple shares over time, you know, have done so at their own peril because this stock has been amazingly resilient over time because of the installed base. Any perceived lack of innovation has been overlooked because whatever they missed initially, they've done better than most secondarily. Now they have the AI story to look forward to and whichever core ISI says that they expect that story is going to unlock an iPhone super cycle. You've been, you've been adding to shares yeah, we're consistently, of, right? Yeah, we're buyers of Apple. I mean, especially at these levels. I agree with what Bill said, with the exception of China. I agree with Steve there. That's not part of our thesis. It's not part of our narrative. But the, 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 we exit the position in November at 200. So I see these price targets going up to 226, 232. If it just gets back to 200, we'll be thrilled. But they have $100 billion of free cash flow over the past 12 months. It might not be the innovator, it might not be the growth engine, but they print money and we like that part. And you've been you've been burned in, in periods of time of like, hey, if Apple gets down to at this certain level and then I'll buy it, and it never reached the level that you thought it might get to, you and a lot of other people, yeah. right? I mean, that just speaks to the resiliency of this name. Bill, yeah, and, Bill cites um, you know what what feels like it might be an inflection point this week. New innovation on chips. Now, are you are you you want to get it? You want to get more negative on Apple ahead of AI? Yeah, I don't want to get more negative. I'm not going to buy. And what I said to you, and this is consistent with what Bill said, is that holding that support at 168, which was the October November low, was very important. It did that this week, okay? And that is important. So the question is, why not buy today? And I just go back to where I am on the market overall. It's really that simple. I do intend to add to Apple, but I just find it very hard on a day like today in a week like we've had to put any new capital to work and so I'm just not going to do it. When you say a week like we've had, are you talking about for the overall market or for a the week overall like market. Apple's had where it's for the, up for the overall market. on the week? For the overall market because obviously I'll acknowledge and you'll point out Apple has had a good week and may well have inflected folks. Well, and where, then, where do you want to add to it then? I mean if you say you don't want to add to it on a down week, what are you going to add to it on a great week for the market? Well, no, what I'm saying, thank you, I'll be more specific, is I think the market's going lower in the short term. And I think Apple will get caught up in that. It's been a nice week for Apple. I think Apple will get caught up in a downturn in the market of another 4 to 5 percent. Hey, if I'm wrong, I own shares. I may buy higher than here. I'll live with it, okay? But right now, my gut, my experience in the market says the market's going lower from here and Apple with it. All right, so we got some new moves to get into as well. We're going to do that after the break. We do have some calls of the day to talk about. Kevin Simpson's made some more new moves. Steve Weiss has bought more of a certain name. I'll tell you about that and much more next. Are you following the Halftime Report podcast? What are you waiting for? Look for us in your favorite podcasting app. Follow the Halftime Podcast now.
let's hit these committee moves I wanted to, uh, to get to. So Kevin, you, you bought Honeywell. Yeah, we initiated a new position in Honeywell yesterday, Scott. We think with everything that Boeing's doing wrong, um, companies like GE Aerospace, Honeywell can be beneficiaries. They're streamlining a lot of the business. Aerospace is the, is the key component to it. But I think they can also be a beneficiary of restructuring, uh, onshoring, the infrastructure play. So 2.2% dividend, big, big share buybacks, solid dividend growth. It's been, a, it's been kind of a stalwart dog for a while too. So we're looking for something to break out a little bit here. Okay, sold some calls in Freeport. Freeport's been unbelievable. I mean, what we're seeing in, in gold and, and Freeport specifically has been fantastic. But the spike in volatility that we've had over the past two weeks is giving us opportunities to write premium. So if you have stocks that you're invested in, that are appreciated, uh, I would take advantage of writing calls in here. We wrote a call for a $57 strike two weeks out. It annualizes out of 11% premium. And if that stock goes to 57 in two weeks, I'll ring the register, Scott. All right, Weiss, you bought more Lidos. I did, so, and we're seeing the stock up today. And the reason why it's up, it really depends on, I mean, it's one of those you, one of those rare companies where it's both growing and it's also defensive. And I use defensive in two senses of the word. Number one, it's got a defense business. It's about 50% of revenue. It's a $15 billion revenue company. And then they've got their civilian business. If you go through the airport, you see the scanners going through, you know, TSA. And that's got a healthcare business. But where I like them in, in defense is they're not a metal vendor only, okay? They are a technology company. You have new management coming in about a year ago. They're doing great things. The stock is cheap. This is one of my favorite holdings, actually. And I think it's gonna keep moving higher and higher. So, uh, so you know, it's a pretty full position for me, but on the dip side, buy more. Okay, so Cisco is in the news today, Jimmy. It's one of our calls of the day. Positive Catalyst Watch opened at uh, your favorite financial institution, City. Price target's 52, they do uh, rate it neutral. What do you yeah. think? There's uh, uh, more than a little bit of a show me story here, Kevin. I know you're in the name as well. And the real question here is whether Splunk can reinitiate earnings growth here. I think it can, uh, but this is definitely a show me situation. Uh, absent Splunk, things have been pretty dull at Cisco to say the least. Um, a lot of tech spending has gone outside of Cisco's products, more to AI and things like Oracle and NVIDIA. So they really need that Splunk acquisition to start shining through here. All right. Do you want to take Kevin uh, McDonald's? Lowered uh, the comps uh, at Loop Capital today. Unfavorable weather and increased competition are going to hurt comps, they say. 357, they maintain the price target. Seems a little high on that price target uh, based on the news that they're talking about. Also, the fact that the stock can't seem to get above 300. So if you want to have a price target at McDonald's, I think 300 is a lot more appropriate than 357. We've owned it for over a decade. I like the stock. It's a great dividend compounder. But I don't know that I'd be rushing into it at this moment. And um, I think the price target's too high. Why do you want to talk some Netflix with me? Because the price target gets bumped today to 700 from 600 at Morgan Stanley. Overweight is the rating. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to think of a week that went by where some analyst has raised the price target. Well, they had to. I mean, it's stock at six twenty. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But still, seven hundred. Yeah. Makes well, sense. I, I mean, again, I, I think that okay, maybe it's not a value because you've got a scarcity of a pure trading play here. That's the leading player in the world. That's profitable. That can grow earnings as much as they want. They still have tremendous leverage in their monthly subscription costs, which they've raised over the past couple of years. But still, it's below where others with less of a product offering are pricing their product. So at the end of the day, you're going to have two players. One's going to be Disney, and one's going to be uh, Netflix of any scale. So, so I'm staying on board again. Maybe I'll get the opportunity over the next few days to buy more, but still a relatively small position, unfortunately. Amy, let's talk some ASML, um, sure. which uh, I, you say you're looking to trim. Um, the target got trimmed today yeah. to $1,052 from $1,072. <laughs> Very precise, yeah. At Bernstein, uh, they still rate it outperform. Why are you looking to possibly trim it? Uh, it's just had such a run. It's such a great company, but if you just look at the chart, it's a straight line up at this point. Um, over 40 times, I think I think the story's known. I think all of semis have run, and they've gone with it, and I just think the space is probably a little overdone. All right. Uh, we will come back. We're going to step into some earnings next week, get you set up ahead of that. Mike Santoli with his midday word is right after this break.
Welcome back to the half. I'm Bertha Coombs with your CNBC News update. The Philippines foreign minister said in a meeting at the State Department today that his country will assert its South China Sea rights. Tensions have been rising between Manila and China over the strategic waterway. It comes after the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines met and announced new security and, and economic ties at a White House summit. A Houston, Texas hospital has stopped its liver and kidney transplant programs after it was discovered that a doctor allegedly manipulated patient records to make some of them ineligible for transplants. According to New York Times report citing officials, the Department of Health and Human Services says it is investigating. And a golden teacup worth 10.4 million yen, or about $68,000, was stolen from a Tokyo department store, uh, Takashiyama. The teacup was taken from an exhibition event at the store, and the Tokyo police say the suspect planned and carried out the crime with the event in mind. He has yet to be found, or the teacup, which is made of 24 karat gold. Scott, back over to you. All right, Bertha, appreciate that. Thank you, Bertha Coombs. Our senior markets commentator, Mike Santoli, joins us now with his midday word. I'm sure there's a lot on your mind. Uh, in the, We're about session lows, uh, Mike, it looks like. Yeah, it's at least relevant in the in the short term. I was pointing out uh, you know, a little while ago that the lows of the day in the S&P the past three days have been exactly the same spot, just under 51.40. It kind of goes back to last Thursday's. Uh, low as well. So the market was trying to make a bid to maybe contain things within that 2% pullback. Uh, seems like it's a little looser than that right now. It's tough to really tease out, you know, exactly what we should uh, extrapolate from today's actions. Obviously, you got the geopolitical overlay and the risk off tone in a lot of the, the, the macro indicators. So it doesn't necessarily tell us if it's all about recalibrating inflation and the Fed. Uh, I do think that uh, investors are going to welcome if we can get the luxury of turning uh, attention more to corporate earnings next week. But I mean, you, you think a lot of this has to do with just not wanting to be long into the weekend where you do have some, uh, you know, potential geopolitical headlines testing nerves? There's an element of that for sure. Um, I, I, you know, I think though that the fact that the market is unable to ignore those or look through them right now, and you're bidding for protection, and you know, it, it also feeds into what has been the existing dynamic, which is gold rocketing higher for pick your reason, uh, but it's definitely not reasons that people are comfortable with, you know, the broader economy and, and policy setup. Uh, and then, of course, the reflation trade in general going on. So I think, you know, you have a little bit of a fairly failure of that familiar equity rotation that has supported the market right now. So I think that just tells us that essentially four weeks ago, uh, as we raced to highs, or let's say at least by the end of the first quarter, everyone knew we're due for a pullback. Now we got a lot of excuses for one. Yeah, that's a good point, as always. I'll see you on closing bell, yeah. Michael. Thank you. Still ahead, we'll give you the trades on United Health and Genuine Parts, Taiwan Semi, and more. All of those ahead of some key earnings next week. There's the board, it's busy. We're back after this.
Pep.com. You just saw the Dow at session lows. I don't want to blow past that. Uh, we'll keep our eye there. Uh, we've got a sizable sell-off, uh, which may be accelerating uh, to about 41 minutes past the hour here. Let's talk about some earnings uh, that are uh, on the tape next week. United Health. Kevin, I'm coming to you on this. Uh, on a low note, too, because the stock hit a new 52-week low today has not been trading well at all. You, what are your expectations now? Well, I would not be a buyer in advance of earnings. Now, full disclosure, I was a buyer last month at 470. To your point, it's 440 at 52-week low. But they've got just, they're taking punch after punch, and I'm very, very close to being stopped out of the position. I want to wait and see what the guidance looks like. If it's a if it's a sell the news event, we may be selling the position. Yeah, I'm just looking at the Dow over Jimmy's uh, head. It's the Dow, 38,000 even. Just gave it up for a minute uh, and, and just got it back. Um, a lot of it apparently, uh, certainly what the narrative seems to be um, today is all about geopolitical concerns, Iran and Israel, and that has caused a spike in commodities, a spike in the VIX, and that sell off in stocks yields. Uh, obviously down on a flight to quality too, flight, flight to safety into, in, into bonds. All right, let me get back to the, the, the stocks at hand here, but we'll keep our eyes on that. 454 or so is where the decline is on the Dow. So J&J &J is Tuesday before the bell. You sold it last week. Yeah, I would stay away from that also. I have no expectations for J&J. &J. I would not be a buyer into the print. Okay, Jimmy, Genuine Parts, that reports next week. You own that? I feel pretty good about it. I mean, we know that the car, uh, average age of cars on the road is very, very old, and people are having to repair them. That should inure to the benefit of General Parts. Why is Taiwan Semi? Look, Taiwan Semi, they're, they've got no spare capacity, so you think the stock, the, the earnings should be pretty good. However, the stock's anticipating good earnings, so the risk-reward going into it if that's why you're buying it for the earnings, I wouldn't do that. Kev, p and Wait till after the earnings. I think the earnings will be good, but I think the stock will sell off. You're going to buy an opportunity the week after next. Another stock that's been around a high is Amex, right, Amy? Yeah. Next, next, uh, a week from today before the bell. Yeah, we own it. Um, I think it'll be fine in the quarter, um, but I think it's really well positioned with high-end users and um, travel. All right. Uh, we were going to take another break. When we come back, we'll have more on this sell-off. We're at the lows of the day. S&P's down by more than 70 points. The uh, Dow's down by 450. Back right after this.
the sketches. All right, welcome back. In light of this sell-off, we want to continue to discuss this market day because it's shaping up to be a difficult one. Weiss, as we said, just to recap, gold up, oil up, dollar up, bonds up, stocks down, uh, and anxiety rising. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually today you're, you're seeing the yield, which is kind of surprising. I think people were talking about this, Amy and I. The yields have come down on bonds uh, today. So yeah, well, there's obviously a move to going I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, but you would expect that, um, uh, I mean, they went down, I'm sorry, but you would expect uh, that with this kind of, that the reasons that are driving this, that uh, there'd be a flight to safety, you're not seeing it. So. Well, you are seeing it. You are seeing yeah, it. You are seeing it. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry, you are, you are. I, I mean, I'm looking right here. Okay. Obviously, I'm thinking of something else, but my mind's distracted. What are you looking at? The, are you, are you looking at the masters? Um, no, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the market, and the stocks that were green are now red, so it's a pretty bad day. But I, I tell you, here's what I would say. If I thought this was all about geopolitical, I'd buy it, because that is always an opportunity to buy. Always. So, You know, something, and we're talking about yields, something that we've totally blown past is how bad that 10-year auction was on Wednesday. Now, this may be a little bit inside yeah. baseball, folks, but it was awful. And, you know, you can't have the sort of deficit and debt levels that we're running at right now and have bad auctions be a routine thing. That's been weighing up the market as well. So, and by the way, I agree with you, Steve, if it yeah. were just geopolitics, you buy on, you know, you buy at 359 on Friday, but it's not. There are fundamental issues. Like, I want to be clear, though. I don't think this is a fatal market. You got a strong labor market. You got people in business on the balls of their feet, leaning into growing their businesses. As long as we don't start actually raising rates on the short end, we should be fine. Idiot. It's hard to, you know, if, if you are worried about idiot G business, small businesses are hurting because of you guys. Hello. When I get back down to where we were back about three years ago, I'll be making my profit and I'll be happy. And I don't want to have to work twice as hard to get it. Short term? Yeah. Why take the risk? But let's also just underscore the, the idea that the, the overall narrative hasn't... We're back down at the bottom of the mega. <laughs> Not changed. <laughs> Scott, you're right. Here we go again. We're back down at the bottom of the mega here. Randy? They just can't stop talking about this. They're, they won't admit they're wrong. They just can't do it. This conversation has been going on way too long. Look, I, I think if you take a look at the market overall, number one, not a disaster today, down less than 2% on the move we've had. You idiots, it's not a disaster going down. It's what we've done going up. That's not the bull market's not over at Jim's point. But I do think that we've been overdue for a nice correction. Sure, maybe you're just testing it too. You know, crude oil approaching 90, um, you know, it, it raises all sorts of other issues. If WTI, it's at 85, 86, yeah. if, that, if that gets to 90. I mean, gold has been, um, as you know, Kev, on a, on a massive run. You had some firms today out talking about even, you know, greater numbers than you're seeing here. I mean, we own uh, Agnico Eagle, we own Freeport, we own Marathon, ConocoPhillips, Chevron. They didn't do anything for us last year. It was all about the Magnificent Seven. But we're sitting back, you know, enjoying 2024. And I, and I think a diversified portfolio at times, you know, can be really validated when you see a day like today. And I do think it's more geopolitical than anything else. To your point, CPI wasn't that bad. It was a little tiny bit hotter than expected. 
PPI is pretty much in line. It's, it's inflation that's sticky and holding. It's not inflation that's moving higher. The mega cap sell-off today is certainly something worth noting, or maybe the growth space in general. I, you know, AMD, we, you wouldn't necessarily, necessarily consider a mega cap as we do the other big names in the group, but it's down 4.5% right now. But it's up 80%. It's up 100%, you idiot. It is lower. That stock had been in correction territory. Now, it had a nice rebound over the last couple of days. And even Apple, let's show an intraday of, of Apple if we could, because that... I God, they always say is it's down. It's like down. Apple was the one uh, sticking out. Because this gets me with these people. It's only down 1%. Well, it's motherfucking up 300 in a year. <laughs> I mean, from 54 bucks all the way up to $220 in a year and a half. They don't get it. It's only down 1%. It's down... <laughs> That's all right. I'll eat them for lunch. I'd love to debate these guys. So how long you got? How long you been here? I've been here twenty six years. You don't have a clue that this market's irrational at all. So how much? How much? How much are they cutting you to pump these stocks? What kind of cut are you getting? They are starting to listen to me, though. I heard a bubble again today, right as I was getting ready to leave. They're still in denial. So this might get all the way down to capitulation, about another month of this. We will get a nice little bounce at the end of the day. But they just, they just, I don't know.
the markets up because you heard Sarah earlier. This is going to hurt Biden. I don't know. I don't think that is going to hurt him as bad as open borders and race baiting. J.P. Morgan. Chips are way overbought. There's going to be a good video this weekend. I want everybody to watch the video this weekend. It's AMD. Let's clean this up here. Jimmy said bubble. So AMD's at the 21. If it doesn't hold this support level, it can drop all the way down to 150 and be a very strong buy. Bottom of that candle. And you got these two wicks supporting that candle. So it has to hold that. I just wanted to bring that up because they talked about AMD. And again, where do these people get off on pumping the market like this? $81 all the way up to 227 That's the... I've been here 20 years. I've not seen nothing like this. They say it's only down 1%. That's crazy. this Friday given this sell-off. We'll take you through the final hour and we're going to do it with some good guests too. Tom Lee will join me along with Avery Sheffield, Bryn Talkington, Rick Heitzman too. What does this do to the capital markets idea? Coming back, IPOs, what's going on in tech? We're going to talk to Rick Heitzman, the VC, about that too. Let's do final trades. Uh, Amy, why don't you start us off? Sure. I'm um, starting with Shell. It's a, uh, We like the energy space in general, but Shell's cheap even compared to the others. 12% free cash flow yield. Okay. Steve Weiss. I would buy the two-year. Now, look, I'm not sure if the yield's higher or lower today. Um, yeah. Just kidding, Scott. When you figure it out, you <laughs> let us know. It's a 4.9 yield. I mean, it's a great place to hide. To hide. Scott Amgen, 3.2% dividend, 14x forward multiple. They're getting in the Oh, middle. God. You love the stock. Amgen. Jimmy. Scott, you're just sitting tight for now. All right. I'll see you on closing bell. The exchange is <laughs> You can hear that woman's voice when she called this trade out. She, she didn't want to call it out. Again, way overbought. This last little run, you don't see anything like that on here. I mean, it's way overbought. You don't want to jump in a trade that high, no matter if she said it was underperforming all the other ones. It still is outperformed itself, which is way too much. There's no way I'd buy that. No way in hell I'd buy that stock. Especially at a head and shoulders. I'd have bought it down here. But I ain't buying it when it's up 300% in a year. Or in when it's up 300% from the bottom. There ain't no way I'd do that. What do I got here? Shell got hammered, three black crows, and then that's boom as a result. Off the 200 SMA, there's your hammer.
No. It's going to drop more. Let's go over the watch list. I'll let you know when I really start saying cheap. She said this was cheap. It's not cheap. It's that resistance. Oh, my suit. I guess I have a thing about pumpers. Like when a stock's been alerted or mentioned, like if one of you mentioned a stock, I would go back and I do my homework. Before I think about taking the trade. But when they're pumping stocks at this level, when the bank earnings are, are given no guidance, that's bad. That's not good. There's nothing good about that. So that's very gives you a very bearish, you know, be safe kind of attitude. $184 still. Holding up on my JP Morgan, but we got a snake breakout pullback. I guess the 9 would have to cross the 21. That'll we break the double top. At 51.25. Now, don't need, don't, on a day like today, you don't really need to, to, to have to make a trade. come in tomorrow would probably be a great day but soon it's going to sink in and everybody's going to say well I should have sold this when Jimmy called the bubble at all time highs get my order ready on the SPX We could raise this up to the 5160, 5160, 5160, and I'm going to buy 10 of them, 5160 of the SPXs. I'm going to go get my soup here, but I'm going to... See if I can get a cheap price here. If I can get 135, 130. This is the 5160. See if I can come up with another story as I get ready to take this trade. Well, well, well. 
these megaphone patterns sometimes can pay off. Lotto. There's one thirty five. One thirty. Okay, get ready, folks. I'm, I'm not advising anybody to take this. We're going to see. Drops down here to a double bottom at 51.20. This is a 51.60. There's 125. 51.60 strike. Two slots out of the money. And we're going to take this double bottom. I don't know if it's a good trade or not. I'm just going to throw a risk in here. Snake. Snake. There's 51.30. Then it would break out. There's 15. Okay, get ready. One well, ten. Okay, I'm going to grab some right here. 105. Okay, the crowd's are going wild here at the sports arena. Jim's got 105. One twenty five. Yeah, I gotta make up some money. The red box pays again. What a sin! What a sin! Did you like that, Randy? Did you wake up in a good mood this morning? 55 cents. <laughs> right above. And I waited. I waited. This was interesting. We were at here, and I called the trade out, and said, I'm going to wait for it to pull back, and boom, baby, 105. I can get out of this trade with 350 bucks. I was up higher than that a little bit ago. <clears throat> 145, there you go, baby. Now, this might be too graphic for some of you. When I was one week old, I could not digest my food. So I had my tummy operated on, and it got infected. They shackled me, tied me up in a bed, for a month for to heal I was lucky I'm lucky to be here today folks and that's fact I was really in bad shape as a baby
150. Let's break it. I'm in the 5160s. I got stopped out of the 80s at the bank. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to forget to take profit this time. Last time I was up 350. That other trade. I should take it now, but I don't know. I'm going to buy a big rock for Jen. We have to we have to hit the 200 SMA. I'm going to go in and dish up my soup. Cream of cheese, cheese of soup, cream of cheese soup, some kind of soup, cheese soup. They taught me how to yodo, yodel, hee -hoo. They taught me how to yodel, yodel, hee -hoo. Bam, baby. James, hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, Washboard Jim is about to have an egg. Lay an egg. We are now at 175, 180. He's up seven hundred. He's up eight hundred dollars. But Jim, is that story true about you when you was a baby? Yes. One ninety. Randy, my target is fifty one forty three point five seven. Fifty one forty three point five seven. Or at the fifty one. How dare you. I didn't think about that. Oh, shit. Oh, this is a 51. Dead gimmick. Brian Day, why didn't you tell me sooner? Mm. 
Okay. Dun, 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 dun. This is Perry Mason. Yes, Perry Mason, this is Washboard Jim. Should I go ahead and hold it, or are we going to go ahead and break out? Ah, okay. Randy, remember Perry Mason? I know that the market sucks and that it's been misjudged. And I know these guys can't admit that they're wrong and I took my profit and I want to buy back in. 170. And I was right. Somebody in the room say it. Jim was right. Magnificent. I am sure about Perry. Magnificent was right. <laughs> <laughs> am I the only am I the oldest person in this room that makes me the wisest person in this room That don't count. Fifty six or seven. You get. I'm sixty three. So being the oldest in the room, I am the wisest. And I'm getting ready to take one, two, three. Make another five or six hundred here. And it's a megaphone. Now, Randy, thank you for mentioning the 51 EMA because I would have held that like a dummy. Thank you. I want to kiss you on the mouth. I didn't see it, I probably would have it and took a small, a bigger lot, not a loss, but we're back down here now. Okay, get ready, Randy. Fat cats will be sitting at the desk at three minutes. Washboard gym there. We just got back to our desk. We just got back from the water cooler. I'm glad you held that megaphone pattern down. We're going to take it from here, Jim. Let's go ahead and clean this chart up because it is getting kind of ugly. And I've got to make a business decision. 
One dollar for the 5160 strike. Randy? Back at a dollar. I could have grabbed two of them. You can do it. You can do it. It's right. I want I want this to be a Read what Magnificent just wrote in here. It's a weekend when a regional war may start a potential of a start of World War III. Had been going on, but not officially. Some might argue. I won't argue. I believe it. There was a freaking genocide. And we got Biden, the paper tiger in the White House. That'll get us all destroyed. Come on, I'm down, we're at 90 cents. And we could knife more because of just the, the crap that's going to happen this weekend with if Iran, Iran has to do something. It's on the table unless they're just talking smack. We're down to 80 cents here. Might get stopped out. Before I take too big of a drop. Come on, baby. Well, this is the end, my friend, the end.
This is the end. Beautiful friend. This is the end. My only friend. The end. Of our dear friend. Plans. The end. Of everything that stands. The end. No safety. baby Jim Morrison Original fee, ten thousand dollars a lease, will now be not working fifty thousand dollars per lease and will require royalties to be paid for extracted oil and gas. The White not working fees will provide more money for taxpayers and protect them against any environmental cleanup costs. Johnson Controls has agreed to pay a seven hundred and fifty million dollar settlement with some US public water utilities over its use of quote forever chemicals using wow. some of its products. The company said the settlement did not mean it acknowledged any wrongdoing of its subsidiary, Tyco Fire. Then why pay it? Last year, lawsuits over Forever Chemicals resulted in more than $11 billion in settlements. Lord. In Kentucky University, that is, of, today hired alumnus and BYU head coach Mark Pope as its new men's basketball coach. Pope will succeed the legendary John Gosh. Perry, who stepped down after 15 seasons to go over to another SEC school. Yep, it ain't gonna work. Back to you. Thank you very much, Tyler. See you soon. We were founder Adam Newman. He's ready for his second act, and this time around, he is focusing on connecting people not through communal workspaces, but through community living spaces with his new venture, Flow. The company and its apartment buildings in Fort Lauderdale in Miami they launched yesterday. I sat down with him to discuss that and whether founders can turn things around after failure. You did. I'm the kind of person that actually learns more from their mistakes than from their successes. So all the great things we did in the past, we're going to do again. But then I had time to reflect, for example, partners. I'm so grateful and lucky to have Mark Andreessen and Ben Horwitz. What is the deal with listening to these partners. stories all week? Worth noting. The this, I think, is the fourth story I've heard now about admitting to your mistakes in a week. It's the fourth, I think, the fourth time. Here's another one. I learned mostly from, and I've said it. I've said it. I've said it here many times. I've learned from my mistakes and other people's mistakes is what made me a good trader. So, you know, I can't bash him, I guess. Because he's right. <laughs> interested in is how do you rebound for, from failure right. and the answer is he's right so i think actually uh, he exhibited a lot of self-awareness in that interview he's got the right investors he was talking about how our board meetings are now active go figure and that he's getting asked a lot of tough questions and everybody's holding him accountable i never had to check into it and it's not a judgment but i think it makes sense to give him another shot yeah so Why another not? way of looking at this which i do often is everybody gets a second chance longer. how much you know especially silicon valleys and vcs i'm gonna go get my soup and i'll be right back want to believe in founders that sometimes they ignore take off my shoes i ain't took them off all day you know which one you're looking at whether someone is genuine 
or whether a founder you know hasn't learned from those mistakes but investors just so badly want to believe in this story it's amazing how much investors uh, don't spend a lot of time trying to analyze the human i use industrial psychologists believe it all the time to figure out whether or not the founder has evolved do they over index for self-awareness the italians have a great phrase that fish rots from the head. So the answer is look under the hood. You're not gonna find the answers on a spreadsheet. So you look, do they use the word I all the time? Or they have they just oh, the word we? There's a lot of little signals that you can look for that VCs really aren't taught, investors aren't taught. So the reality is I think he probably has learned his lesson and probably has a lot of fight in him that he might not have had before. Right, in terms of due diligence though, right? Always important to look at the business model. And in this sense, you know, one of the things I questioned him on yesterday is, is this a real estate startup or a tech startup, right? And he even brought up an interesting point. Was Tesla a car company or a technology company? How do you look at that company now, especially in the age of AI, trying to AI wash, let's call it, or put an AI wrapper on things versus, you know, they're really doing work in that area? So you just hit on an amazing signal. If you think about his uh, S1 that he put out during WeWork, the WeWork, which he got WeWacked, uh, he got <laughs> annihilated. It was because he tried to turn everything into a it's so a tech, it's a tech. He used it the word like a million times. So I hope, God willing, he's not trying to frame this as anything other than what he, would, yeah. he is. Stay away from hyperbole and prove what you got this time around. Great point. And he did talk about the real estate side of that business a lot. Um, Matt, stay with us. Um, with inflation proving stickier than expected, markets have been closely monitoring economic data to predict the Fed's next move. And now, even Silicon Valley is starting to do the same. Let's get over to Kate Rooney for more. Kate, I love this story so much because a lot of VCs don't even want to talk interest rates. The smartest ones do, though. Exactly, Devo. You know what it's like on Sand Hill Road. I spent a little time there this week. It is the epicenter of venture. The Fed does really seem to be in focus again. CPI did catch the attention. But few folks I talked to, one person told me they're now checking things like oil prices. You don't see that every day to see what it means for the Fed. One big impact for these venture investors, the IPO window is still seen as pretty tough and a tough time to go public. That is really how these private investors cash out and then return money to their investors. So endowments, pension funds, for example, many are watching a rubric, that upcoming software IPO, as one bellwether. Multiple, or multiples rather, were slashed dramatically, really when the Fed started tightening. A lot of people have already, quote, taken the pill, as one investor told me, so found more cost discipline. Jack Abraham, for example, of Atomic, telling me all of this affects the sentiment of limited partners, those LPs, and how much they are going to have to invest back into those venture funds. And if a pension can get a risk-free 5% on a treasury bill, that makes venture a little less enticing. Tiger Global has really been the cautionary tale people talk about. Reportedly raised about $2 billion for its latest fund. Sounds like a big number, but it's a third of the $6 billion it was going for it raised a $12 billion fund back at the peak of zero interest rates, the ZERP era, as people sometimes call it. All of this has an impact impact on where they're going to spend. One person described it as a tale of two cities. You got AI town, as you've been talking about, D, booming. Also with a rate-sensitive town, fintech, real estate, not doing as well. You also mentioned AI watching, D. I heard a lot about that. One investor recently told me that they are telling their portfolio companies to add dot AI if they cannot go out there and raise money. So you're seeing some of those strategies pop up. So replace the dot E, dot ETF e. with dot exactly. AI. Exactly, that so, was the big crypto fun. move for a while. <laughs> <laughs> like absolutely deja vu from the crypto bubble. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Matt, Kate alluded to the ZERP era, right? Where the discounted fl cash flow made, you didn't have to change it very much. We're at 70, I'm point. still in it. Zero, we're obviously in a very different time. How much are you now looking at where interest rates are to make Mac, more I should buy some more. new portfolio companies? Yeah, I, I think um, I'm going to buy some more here. Now, the uh, uh, VC market is a leading indicator of what's going to no. happen in this country. The VC market is entirely not smooth. lagging anymore. No, no, not before it was it was leading. Yeah. Tiger Capital putting money to work all over the place. Why not? No, no, now it's leading. It is it is still seized up. There's a huge disconnect between public markets where you're getting these crazy forward multiples of 21 times, right? And then in the VC side, people are not putting money to work and they're not falling for the hustle anymore. Putting dot AI at the end is not gonna work That's unless right. you're talking to people who don't know what they're talking about. So the reality is the VC market is totally seized up ahead of the public markets and they're gonna converge. Uh, but this time they figured out money is not being thrown out and a lot of companies uh, are gonna die over the next uh, uh, 12 months. Well, what about, there's particular companies in the AI space, like an Anthropic, like an OpenAI, their valuations are through the roof, right? These are more of the foundational models with a lot of AI researchers and talent at those companies. 
Do you think those are overvalued? I think they are overvalued. Yes. I think everything is. Went out the door quickly. Let's look at ARM as an example, right? ARM, for example, went out, got bid up. I think it might be ARM in the 50s. It went all the way up to 140. Uh, as time goes by, investors are going to get smarter. The AI play is real, but they're going to stick to the shovels and the picks and the, the microns and long, NVIDIA long, those, and they're going to move away, I think, from the periphery that are derivative AI plays. And that's what we've seen so far. I mean, software. Uh, yeah, ARM 4650, all the way up to 164. <laughs> No, we're not no bubble. One, two, three, four, five, six months. It's up 400%. In six months, we're up Go oh, baby, we're at 85 now. I want to get, I want this to the 200. I want to get 51, 38, 28 out of it. I should have grabbed some down there at 60. <laughs> like another 1200 dollars worth at 60 cents. says it's ready. Log this in. It's only the second speech he's given on the yeah. economy since I got him off now, Randy. If he follows in what is a tradition at the Kansas City Fed of a more hawkish than average president uh, usually from Kansas City. Absolutely, uh, Steve Leisman, thanks for bringing that to us. And I'll just note that markets are still close to session lows. The Dow is down about 560 points. And with rates spiking and the dollar strengthening, it's also not a great day for international equity. Simo Modi is here with more. Simo, what do you see? And the, it wasn't just the U.S. markets that were hoping for an interest rate cut this year. Hoping. The international world was also betting on rates. You, you all are idiots. You don't trade on hope. Got me? Banks can still cut rates even with the Fed on hold. A regime of higher U.S. rates for the foreseeable future, that's very difficult for these nations. Uh, we also saw overnight disappointing economic data from China yet again with exports falling more than expected. For <laughs> See, here's... You know, if I wasn't so hungry in this cheesy broccoli soup right now, I would have bought another hundred con or another ten contracts or another thousand dollars worth at sixty cents. And we're at one oh five now and I'd be up four hundred, five hundred bucks, six hundred dollars right now. Stem up two hundred. By gosh, you mess around with me today, you'll get your ass kicked. <laughs> Let's 
We don't know how you do it, Jim. And I didn't cost the average dental in this trade, people. I'm going to show you I can trade without doing it. Yum, 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 yum. I am in the um, 5160 strike at a buck. Fifty one sixty strike at a buck. Magnificent. I'm about ready to do something that's very unprofessional. See, I was at 140. I should have sold it. This has happened to me a lot today. We're at 115. Mm. Man, there's nothing better than cheese cream of soup. Yesterday was split P. <clears throat> we would like to see a one, two, three develop into the two hundred SMA. One, two bits, and a freebie. For an exit idea. <clears throat> You're watching Machine, you know what we're doing here? We're playing, this is a bear <coughs> trend. And I'm playing the bottom of this trend line, of this shoulder line, of this head. There's your left shoulder, left shoulder, right shoulder, right shoulder. I want to see it come up to the top here and get out of the trade. Say do it. Rande, should I exit once we hit the line or should I move? Hold on. I'm up. Woot woot. All right. You already took most of your profit? How dare you? You're disgusting. Should have waited for the one, two, three. You have two cons? <laughs> we'll get ready to take some profit, brother. <laughs> one, two, three. And if you're in this trade, YouTube, make a business decision. I am a robot. I am programmed to receive. One, two, three. If you can count to three, you can trade with me. Two dollars, baby. From one dollar, a hundred percent. In a matter of how many minutes did that take? Huh? <laughs> Magnificent, I think you know what to do.
Uh, I think you know what to do. Come on now, get it up there. You have one left? I don't appreciate that, Randy. Magnificent, are you on the toilet or something? <laughs> You think it's going to go to the 200? I bet you can. Ladies and gentlemen, you're witnessing one of the, one of the best rooms in the whole world. Jim's out of the trade. He took 100%. And how many minutes did that take, Jim? Well, I was down quite a bit there. I was down 50%. I didn't know if I wanted to hold it or not. So I looked inside of my chicken soup, and a piece of broccoli stood up and looked right, right in the eye and said, Eat me. I said, I don't want to eat you yet. I'll eat you after I hit the one, two, three. So here's the broccoli. Mm. And we're going to the 200, Randy. Here we go. You might get 300 points out of this trade. 200 percenter. And now I got lucky. When I traded you, and three, man, if you can count to three, you can trade with me. Now we dipped on down, Randy. I hope you got your trades out. That time I did sell, like you said. Amazon coming off its first new all-time high since July 2021, nearly doubling in the past 12 months. In his annual letter to shareholder CEO Andy Jassy says, this 
they're committed to cutting costs <coughs> while simultaneously investing in artificial intelligence. Not an easy thing to do with so much uncertainty in the macro environment, but here's what he told Andrew Ross Sorkin about the health of the economy on Squawk Box yesterday. Consumers are spending, they're just trading down. You know, we, we, a place where we see it, uh, real impact is, you know, in discretionary items, things like TVs or computers or electronics. You know, we're growing our market segment share at a faster rate there than, than others, but still at a lower rate than what we see in an healthy economy. For more from that interview and to read Jassy's full letter to shareholders, go to CNBC.com. Let's take a look now at where younger consumers are spending. And a new McKinsey study shows millennials and Gen Z spending on groceries is poised to outpace restaurants, travel, apparel, even fitness. And joining me now to take a deeper dive into the latest Gen Z trends is Casey Lewis, the founder of the After School Newsletter. Casey, that took me by surprise that they're spending on groceries. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's all about these status groceries. You know, they're small luxuries. They don't cost a ton. They can Instagram about them. They can TikTok about them. So not only do they taste good, but there's the, the sort of flex element that, that they bring. So they're not spending at Air One. They're going to some of the larger chains. Is that right? Yeah, I mean... I think Air One, the LA team probably are. Bingo, baby. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's these sort of like the idea of the shoppy shop, the New York Magazine mm. story, these sort of indie labels. Uh, yeah, these like fancy little spices and, and things like that. Um, when I was a teen, I wasn't buying fancy spices, but it's yeah, a different time. Interesting. Um, so we just heard from Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon, who has a great pulse on the consumer, and he said that they're trading down and. Um, the sort of phenomenon that's entered the U.S. over the last year or so has been the rise of the Chinese e-commerce players, Timu and Shein. And it's funny, even my eight-year-old talks about shopping on Timu more than he does Amazon. Where is this headed? It's crazy. Now, there's a new Piper Sandler study that top five retailers among teens. Amazon is number one. Shein and Timu is on that list of the top five for the first time ever. So I think what you're seeing in your own house is very consistent with young people's shopping behaviors. But the thing is, young people don't have a lot of money to spend. So the Shans yeah. and the Timu, they can get a lot well, for not very much if it's back for the world. Here's another thing. Young people really like games and gaming, and that is what... Oh, God. I don't know too many people, young people, that like gaming, honey. They don't want to sit there and waste their time playing a stupid game when they could be trading stocks. That's my game. We need young people trading stocks, not playing games. What is this, my co knows moose? What the hell does that mean? What have you been reading? I don't trust you. What in the heck is our kind of moose? My V, is that Russian? My Konos Moose, M U S E. My Konos M U S E. Oh, it's a coffee table book. <laughs> she just put it up there for looks moose is a travel guide book to coffee table books oh being gay my co-host nickname vibrant nightlife for and for being gay, friendly, destination. I knew there was a reason that book was up there. Wonder, I, I think gay, being gay might just be mean being happy. No, it's definitely gay, LGBT. Okay, well, <laughs> she's a nut.
Jim, you're kind of harsh on that woman. I can tell by what a person reads, what kind of person they are. Right now, I read stocks. Mm, the bank of J.P. Morgan dipped a little bit more. My Konos Moose, Randy. My Konos Moose. Whoops, I got my M and Y backwards. Be open minded, Randy. One, two, three, and we get out of the trade. Now listen, you people on YouTube, pay close attention to what Jimmy did here. We had a snake. We had a breakout. We started to form a pattern. So I took advantage of the pattern and bought it down here on the third pullback. <laughs> got stuck. I could have got more at 50 cents. That would have been a heck of a trade. A couple hundred more at 50, or 20 more at 50. But one, everything's in threes. So I got out right when we hit the three. I, got, I was the first one out of the trade. I was the very first one out of the trade. I told you before we even got up there where I was going to get out, let everybody know ahead of time, because I know that third time up that we could profitability have a pullback on that <clears throat> and I'd lose everything that I had in the trade so I jumped right in there and I got out I was first one out now each one of these patterns have a pivot point the pivot points right in here we've got an inverse head and shoulders I'm not so I mean we got this weekend we got to deal with but there's your inverse head and shoulders, and it just fell through it. But I got out of that. At the highest profitable point, I could get out of that trade. I could tell some of the most novice traders about this and they'd look at you like, duh, what? That's too easy. Can't be that simple. I turned it and risked it. Keep doing that.
Friggin' year to date, it's up 7% after today's sell off. But, but a year ago, it's up 43%. The S&P's up 25 So a lot of it was built in on the expectations. Now, what happens is you get the sell off, you have people who probably crowd into the trade in the banks. JP Morgan is a phenomenal bank, it's one of our top holdings, right? You've got great management team, very diversified business. When you look at asset management, but then you look at MA, capital markets, international, great balance sheet, great dividend. And this is going to happen, but a 5% sell for a JP Morgan is pretty abnormal. So there must have been a lot of people who were kind of hiding out in there and then didn't see the expectations of, and they're pretty conservative. If you look at kind of the way they've always said they're going to do is, hey, we know that that interest income's not going to increase that much, but when rates the way they are right now and the economy as strong as it is, this bank's going to make a lot of money. The question is, does the economy start slowing and we don't get the rate cuts, right? And that's just not for the banks. That's for the overall stock market. So then what leads to that slowing? Because as I think you're pointing to, the fundamentals <laughs> remain pretty strong and markets have been very resilient so far. I wonder if we can pull up a chart of the VIX over the last year. It's up 25% today, the volatility index approaching 20. What's changing in the market here? What's the character do? Honey, you're uh, overbought. The is, hey, if Don't you get it? Not get rate cuts and the economy slows down. Do we get a fear? I'm you're up four or five hundred percent in stocks. Mm. Right. Does the economy then start slowing down? But the Fed cannot cut rates just because inflation by itself is staying up. And Tyler, to your point, you were asking about geopolitical concerns. Well, that puts up commodity prices, yeah. right? We, we've seen oil prices now almost close to $90. That's not good for any inputs for basic materials, for anything in that sense. And uh, I think that's where the fear is. And if China is starting to come back and you see global tension, you're not going to get that, that, that foot off the brake for inflation that everybody was expecting at least for the first couple of quarters. So you mentioned one of your biggest holdings, uh, Chase. Let's talk about your biggest holding, NVIDIA. It is. What's happening there? What are you doing with it? What are you... What, what, what is your strategy? Right. And, and a very good question. I mean, NVIDIA became our largest holding because it grew so much. I mean, it's up 60% here in the uh, We've been cutting back. We've been cutting, I mean, I've been cutting back almost $400. So, yeah, you know, for, for new money coming in, I'm still not ready to put new money in uh, for, for a new client. But I think at $850, is pretty fully valued. And the question is, where does it go from here? And right now, you know, it's an easy stock pay for profit taking, right? If you've made money, you can just take some of it, as we all have, right? Portfolio diversification is key. You do not want to get concentrated. This stock was down 50% in 2022, so. It can do that. It can do that. It's very volatile. Again, it's a crowded trade. It's, it's a lot of the momentum stocks, uh, momentum investors and hedge funds have it, but it's a fabulous company. But we're about to get to the catalyst for NVIDIA, which is the hyperscalers. Microsoft, Amazon, Google are going to be reporting over the next few weeks. What do you expect to hear from them in terms of CapEx plans, right? That's really underpinned the NVIDIA rally. And I wonder, like, some of these competition issues, yes. Google, Microsoft, all of them developing. <coughs> so I think you've got to watch for a couple of things. Now, obviously, the stock ran when Meta said, you know, we are going to be buying all the, all the chips from NVIDIA, et cetera. What we're going to probably hear from all of them is, they're going to say we're going to produce our own chips only because they don't want to be paying the prices that NVIDIA is charging. There's, there's nobody else to buy these chips from right now. And Intel is starting to see. It, it's a game of catch up, but by that. He just got through saying they could run out of buyers. And I said it months ago that people are not going to pay 40 grand for this stupid chip. It's way overpriced. They can manufacture it for a lot less. And a lot better. And it's what's happened. It's come to permission. I mean, people, companies are coming out saying Intel. I mean, these other ones. NVIDIA is way overbought. And this guy brings up NVIDIA. What about NVIDIA then? Do we have a chance with it still? They're reporting quarterly earnings with more. It's up three or four hundred percent, you idiot. net interest income also disappointed at Wells Fargo down 8% in the quarter because of higher interest rates on funding costs. City said its profit fell 27% year over year in higher expenses and credit costs. All three banks did beat the street's estimates though as we've been talking about the fundamentals were still pretty good. So let me ask you then dive into sort of one area of them and that is deposits, right? We see rates higher for longer. You're already seeing. I mean, NVIDIA at 392 six months ago all the way to 974 okay 
This stock needs to come way down here. They can hold the 200, but this is just too much. Too it's, a, it's a bubble. I don't care if God was invented. And they keep trying to talk you into this. And it, it, I'm not going to listen to it. These people are crazy. They're crazy. It's tough, right? I think uh, we can talk about why uh, some of these names are in the red today, but I think what we heard from JP, Wells, Citigroup is an economy that still remains on relatively solid footing credit outlooks from all three banks were fa fairly constructive, even relative to what we were hearing three or six months ago. Now, bad things can happen. As you mentioned, higher for longer, leading to a stagflation scenarios, which could lead to some downside on credit, overall economy, six, 12 months from now, for sure. But where things stand today, I think I was very un encouraged by what we heard from ma all three management teams in terms of the macroeconomic outlook and business fundamentals. And so, th but these banks are not, the stock price, is not reacting as though all three of them beat estimates, which all three of them did. So I think, uh, I think Sarah mentioned this earlier. If they were so strong and they beat all estimates, they didn't give guidance. If they were that good and that strong, you sh use your common sense, guy. This is the lead guy on CNBC where they said everything was all about guidance. So the banks come out with poor guidance and they want to ignore it. When the stocks are just up enormously on speculation. And here for them with higher for longer rates, right? That is correct. But again, my colleague uh, covers the insurance sector, but you're right. I think they have long dated liabilities uh, and uh, higher rates for longer allows them to uh, get better returns over time. Saran, any thought here or, or question for either? I, I guess here my question is, what, what is your read through on kind of companies like Bank of America on this? Are you going to see the similar sell off or do you see any of these other banks separating themselves? Because they're all kind of being pushed in again. Here we go. You're all in one basket. And, and we just want to kind of use that ETF to sell off. That's a good question. Obviously, I can't really comment on Bank of America because of the sign you see behind my name. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think what I would say is the read through was extremely positive. And I think what's important here is over the last few months, the money center banks have generally broken uh, away and have, as we said, all JP, Wells, City had a phenomenal start to the year. When you contrast that with even the largest regional banks, the PNCs of the world, uh, U.S. Bank Corp, m and they are still discounting a fair amount of concern around the macroeconomy, credit risk, and trading at about two to three term PE discounts relative to where we've been in the past. So I do think the messaging we received here was very constructive. Again, unless we get a macro shock or interest rates really spike higher, I think we could come out of uh, next week, we have about 20 banks supporting where you start feeling better about even the Main Street outlook if some of those net interest income is beginning to stabilize for the regional banks, while credit, as I said, still is holding up, including commercial real estate. Ibrahim, you follow about 30 banks. Do you have three that are favorites? Absolutely. So I think uh, it, Wells Fargo, it's a name that we've liked. Oh, God. We continue to like that uh, both in terms Why? of its, ex its idiosyncratic drivers around capital. You saw them buy back. Six billion in, in buybacks in the first quarter. They still have significant runway there. I think in terms of growth opportunity, that's a bank that has a significant runway. You were discussing about capital markets. That's a business their CEO Charlie Shaw talked about during the earnings call. So Wells is a name that we've liked. We continue to like both in terms of the macro trends as well as idiosyncratic self-help. Citigroup is another name I, I appreciate. The stocks had a pretty strong move, but we do believe. Actions taken by James Fraser in turning this around, reversing what's 20 years of mismanagement is finally beginning to uh, take shape. And the other one I would call out would be 
uh, uh, truest financial among the large regionals, TFC. Mm -hmm. uh, they've gone through a body merger of equals between SunTrust and BBNT. They've had a three CFC. Of and I think a management is beginning to get things back on track. So it's a discounted stock, but in good markets, plenty of capital and liquidity at its disposal. Yeah. All right, Ibrahim, thank you very much. Ibrahim Punawala of Bank of America Security. Appreciate your time today. <laughs> Coming up, yesterday's tech rally fueling Apple to its best day since last May. Can you keep up that momentum? On a down day, the stock is a little bit higher. We'll discuss that one and more when Palo Alto returns. Welcome back. We're looking at Bank of America on the monthly time frame we got a head and shoulders we're a bit shy with the double top on the monthly so we do have a double top with a tweezer top so i think these earnings are going to bring it down <clears throat> with a tweezer top like that we are pulling back but i'd love to see it down here on one two three let's put it i'm going to put an alert right here that's at 30 bucks that'd be a good spot that's where I've liked it before 30 and 32 that was Fargo wagon you picked I'm going huh? So it's now 116. Randy, SPX. It's going to eventually get to the 200. Think said about the transformation we're seeing. AI cannot truly happen unless there's a huge investment in infrastructure. Um, the, the amount of energy that is required for AI for, is enormous, and the amount of power generation. We, are, we will run out of electricity if we are going to fully adapt to a full AI world. And so the need to build on, and this is all going to stimulate our economy, by the way, to build out a more AI and which at the backside is that means building out more electricity power. We've got Steve Kovac here, Surat Sethi still with us. 
Um, what Larry Fink was talking about was this AI halo that is supposed to touch many other industries. Energy is certainly one of them. Software would be sort of an obvious next place to go, but I want to show you a chart of the software ETF versus the SMH chip ETF and just huge discrepancy between the both. We haven't really seen this AI halo expand beyond the chips and the mega caps, or would you disagree with that? Sarah? No, no, I totally agree because we haven't really seen it implemented yet. Right. Right. That's Companies have not really come out yet and said, oh, our productivity is increasing because of AI. So. You know, you've got Microsoft and Copilot, and you've got these other companies, but it's to your point, it's the mega caps and it's the chip companies right now. But until we see it being used, we have to kind of make sure. And to a lot of point, like if we don't have the infrastructure there, mm -hmm. I'm not sure you're going to actually get it to be used because the power needed for that, and that's the competition amongst all the chip companies, right? Why does AI require all that power? It's the chips. So these, it's it's let's, the chips. let's just talk about those NVIDIA chips. At, they require enormous amounts of power. They're not the most efficient chips in the world, unlike the one that runs in your iPhone. They need these big, they run in these big data centers that take up a lot of power. And you know, Intel had that um, announcement earlier this week. They were talking about the power efficiency for their Gaudi chip, uh, their AI chip that they're gonna start selling soon, just saying it's more power efficient than the NVIDIA stuff. So you save money, not just on the chip itself, they're saying, but also on the power consumption. Here's a stat that broke it down to me. I hope I'm getting it right, but a chat GPT query takes, I think, 10 times more compute power than a simple Google query. Wow. So if you why, think why people that? are gonna get it. Because it has to run through all the, those, through those these, yeah. series. Yeah, all the different algorithms that it's running through. So yeah. you're trying to, in fact, incorporate everything else there. So what you're really going to need is much more energy. You're going to need utilities to get more power. You're going to need more gas. And you're going to need data centers. You know, this is what we hear CEO Sam of OpenAI, Sam Altman, talking about a lot. In fact, he was in the Middle East this week talking about this very problem. Who builds the data centers? It's, Who builds it, it could be many people. I mean, the, 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 company, the, the companies the, themselves the, do the it. Amazon's the it, Exactly. Microsoft. Exactly. Have, companies like Digital Realty and yeah. Real Estate. Yeah. You have Equinix that also has the interconnection. So you've got all these other companies, but Boy. You need the power behind it. So it's what are the utilities in California, right? So it's the Edison's, the AES's of the world, but it, it has all enough. kind of, yeah, it, it, they have to come together. There's an interesting article in the journal Heard on the Street today saying how you can use AI to actually make the grid more efficient and household consumption more efficient. So maybe this will all work together. <laughs> all right, let's uh, talk about Apple bucking that downtrend today, as we just mentioned a moment or so ago. Yesterday, its best day since last May, up 3% for the week. Uh, Steve, why the move in Apple? Is it too about AI? A little bit. I know Surat has some other thoughts on this, but let's just talk about the AI angle here for a second. So yesterday, Bloomberg had this report that came out that said Apple is preparing to update its uh, Mac computer chips and going to kind of frame them as AI chips and, and unleash some new AI capabilities on these uh, devices later this year. But of course, none of that really matters unless they have some really great user-facing uh, features that we're expecting to see on June 10th at their annual developers conference. What that looks like, we have no idea, but that's part of it. And I know, Surat, you have some thoughts yeah, on this as well. Look, and Apple is one of these stocks that's become like a treasury bill in the technology world, right? It's, it's come down, it's down 7% for the year, but it's one, the amount of cash there. People are safe in it right now. That doesn't say anything about the growth of Apple. I mean, you haven't really seen earnings growth. There is no growth. Really seen yeah. Revenue growth. But it's going to be a question of what, and everybody's talked about it. Why is it lagged behind Meta? Why is it lagged behind Amazon and Microsoft? Because they haven't really said, what are we going to use AI for, right? So the marketing has come out, but let's see what the execution is. What is the speculation about what, I mean, you, you make the great point. I mean, they can, you can have all the chip power you want. Right. In a, in a laptop or a Mac or whatever, I hear they're going to refashion the entire Mac line, which right. means I'll end up buying another one. But, but, but if you don't have the apps and the tools to run off those things, what's the it, benefit? It, it You've got to show not, me something that also, I you're right, can do. It also might not matter. Some of it can just be pure marketing by calling yeah, it, yes. for example, an AI an Mac. AI Mac. An AI. Yeah. And I'll give sure. you a perfect example of that. A few years ago, Apple released its first 5G phone basically saying, you know, it's going to unleash all this potential and so forth. Well, I don't know about you, I don't know as much of the difference using a 5G phone versus my old 4G phone, no. but it doesn't matter. It's for, just because it was one more G, it got people to buy it. I'm, I'm going to take the other yeah. side of that. I think it's crazy to think that, and I think many people in Silicon Valley are trying to think that it's working now. Oh, yeah, 100%. Not the yeah. first thing. And I think June, 
we'll see what it is. It almost doesn't matter, even if it is kind of underwhelming in June, as long as they market it as a yeah. But it just just wants to implement it. It's not a huge revolution. So what is Apple going to do that some of these other companies? Could edge computing be a it could, but I don't see. Make that thing for myself. Yeah, but I don't see Apple being the leader in edge okay. right? That's they're in the consumer facing business. How, how, they're going to be selling more services, and at the same time, we could talk to Apple about Apple for years. But like, you're basically getting all this competition, you're getting regulation too. So where can they really play? That the government's going to say, hey, now you are just you know taking something else. So for you, is Apple a hold? Apple is a hold. Apple is. A hold. And China is just ter in terrible shape right now. They're just down. Sales were down there, thirteen percent in the December quarter. Doesn't look like it's improving. Tim Cook just got here from China, so we should hear some more yeah. color on that um, in two weeks, two and a half weeks. Steve, thank you for being with us. Keep an eye on crude prices while they are rising on those reports. Israel is bracing for a direct attack from Iran. As soon as this weekend, we will get Thrust trade on the oil and energy market ahead in the hour. And a quick check on the broader averages. The Dow lower for the- This is a pretty good run on XOM. We will be right back. Man, it's just, it just sucks. God. Man, it's sad. See how honest Schwab is. Over time and, and build a, a more competitive. I'm curious about what demand is like right now, specifically in terms of the automotive industry, because we've heard people like Elon Musk promising autonomous robo autonomous robo taxis for years, saying that they'd be on the roads by 2020, and, and they really haven't taken off yet. So, what is demand like, and, and what's what's the outlook there? Well, Auster is riding a wave of new AI innovation um, by creating a critical complementary technology. Well, one, two, three. I sight of all, all of these autonomous machines. And so, um, you know, we have seen some kind of uh, the, the up and down of the, the EV boom and, and, and bust in the last couple of years. Um, but overall, uh, autonomy is much greater than a single a single type of car, consumer cars versus trucking versus robo taxis. There's still immense investment across the overall automotive space into autonomy and life-saving technology. And because it doesn't have to be full autonomy for um, AI to play a critical role in the future of the automobile. Um, advanced driver <coughs> safety systems <coughs> use LiDAR, um, just like autonomous cars eventually will use LiDAR. So yeah, we've seen some slowdown in some of the adoption of, of uh, a lighter in consumer vehicles in some domains, but in the other spheres, because of the advancements in AI, we've actually seen an acceleration. Specifically, things like robo taxis um, and robo trucking, where there's been consolidation, but also uh, technical advancement that has allowed the adoption of the technology faster. Good example of this is Waymo now expanding significantly into multiple domains. Um, they are a critical user of lidar technology. Okay. You recently reported quarterly results and posted a smaller than expected fourth quarter loss. 
uh, sales of $24 million, basically in line with estimates, but gave pretty strong sales guidance. What's going to drive growth from here, and what's the path to profitability look like? Well, Alster has focused in the last year on driving core uh, financial results in an industry, uh, the lighter industry, that um, has had a lot of kind of trials and tribulations in the last couple of years. Alster is set apart as being the only lighter company to deliver four straight quarters of revenue growth and margin expansion. Um, and we capped the year with a very strong kind of fourth quarter earnings uh, re re result. We did $83 million in revenue for 2023. 142 million in bookings for a very strong 1.7x book to bill ratio. Um, and okay, Jimmy's got 510 to break on the spy. Velodyne LiDAR to build a much stronger business. And that's not using my indicator. Um, and so looking towards next year um, or towards 2024, and uh, we said at our Q4 earnings, uh, we would focus on three things in 2024. The first is the continuing expansion of our digital LiDAR product portfolio. We have a next generation of technology that is uh, leveraging advanced semiconductors um, and extending the performance and price curve of our underlying kind of core ladder technology. The second is a major push into software solutions. Uh, last year, we uh, created an all new revenue, uh, revenue line for the business in the smart infrastructure sphere with some software solutions. And we're gonna push those uh, very, very significantly this year. Um, it's a major growth area for the business and smart infrastructure, specifically security, crowd analytics, and traffic technology. And then finally, uh, we're here to deliver on the long-term financial framework that we set out um, last year, uh, which is a focus on 30 over the growth, rainbow, 35 to 40% margins, and a control of our costs at Q3 2023 levels, all with a focus on a uh, path to profitability. Okay. And I'm curious, just as CEO of a company right now, given this narrative of higher for longer rates, and we are expecting rates to start coming down this year, how does that factor into some of your, your growth initiatives and your business decisions? Oh, right shoot. <laughs> well, I think it really comes back to cost controls, OPEX Excuse controls. Me. For a company like Alster, we're still not a profitable business. Yeah. We have the goal of being one in the next couple of years and put out a long-term financial framework to help educate um, our investors uh, on that path. And then a critical component of that is uh, cost controls for us. Uh, we were able to exceed our initial post-merger cost control target by over 40% last year, which is, uh, I think, one of the main things that investors have looked to and rewarded us for in the last year with our stock performance. All right, we have to leave it there, but really appreciate you shedding light on your business. Angus McCullough, CEO and co-founder of Ouster. Thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Still ahead on the second half of the show, the deadline to file your taxes is looming. We'll cover what Americans can uh, gain from filing taxes last minute and share some planning tips for maximizing your tax benefits. Lastly, our panel is standing by to analyze the latest consumer sentiment report. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Ameritrade is now part of Schwab bringing you an elevated experience tailor-made for trader minds. Go deeper with Thinkorswim, our award-winning trading platforms. Unlock support from the Schwab Trade Desk, our team of passionate traders who live and breathe trading. And sharpen your skills with immersive online education crafted just for traders. Also, you can trade brilliantly. Benner, Benner, Ben, da, 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 da. Headbanger music. Every morning, every trade, always live. Expert earnings analysis, in depth technical insights on every changing trend in markets. Available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Welcome to Morning Trade Live on the Schwab Network. I'm Oliver Rennick. Oliver! Empower your portfolio with the Schwab Network. Oh, it didn't show up. Available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwab Network.
perfect. So I put the next support on Bank of America at 3287. Can't take much of this. Thank you. With Thank Schwab you very much. Fees, it's easy to invest in ideas you believe in. Spot a trend in electric vehicles? Have a passion for online gaming? Or want to explore the space economy? The video new low. Thank you for that alert. Buy it as is or customize to align with your goals. All at your fingertips. Schwab investing fee. XOM double bottom. Up to 25 stocks in just a few clicks. XOM double bottom. The NVIDIA bubble. Welcome back to the Watch List Online. We're coming to you live from the New York Stock Exchange. Let's take a look at the markets with just about 90 minutes left in the trading day. And God, no. Taking a look, seeing red arrows across the board. Oh, God. Doubt what? Dow down 500 and some points. Woo! War. selling that's ensued throughout the day today. We're looking at the SPX on a one minute candle chart. You can see all the way down to 51.10. That's our low today. You can see how we're currently holding near that low right now, right? No real rejection of these lower levels, a market that's just exhibiting some uncertainties regarding rate cut expectations. And, you know, we're just coming up all time highs. I think it's quite important to remember that, yeah, while we're posting new lows for the month of April, uh, I think it's also important to remember that there's your March low. So this just gives you an idea in terms of not only the acceleration we've seen off the October lows from last year, but look, just this most recent range from 5,000 up to 5,200 <laughs> is what we've seen over the last, what we'll call it. It's the craziest years. market I've ever seen. I don't think anyone none of this is, none of this run is worthy the the at all. Today, right? because none of it. In terms of this move that we've seen over the last, We'll call it six months. Not on the brink of World War III. To, uh, keep up the pace up, right? So uh, you've got a lot of headwinds, though, as I mentioned here, in terms of the fundamentals. It's not just the technicals and, and sustainability. Uh, but don't rule this market out, right? Uh, even with yields I will. spiking this week, Fed expectations in terms of rate cuts being pushed back. I mean, you got earnings coming. I'm going to take I'm, around. And if they're strong, ultimately, that could provide a bit of a backdrop, could provide some support here. Support, maybe. And not everything is lower today than crude oil. Yeah. A nice he said it too. He knows. Right now. Uh, or actually, no, it's given up uh, some of those gains. Now only up about seven tenths of a percent. Oh. Uh, trading around 85.57. That all linked to geopolitical risk. And what do you think happened? Why? All of a sudden, geopolitical risk is a major concern. EIA, IEA, and OPEC this week as well. I think that's contributed to the bid we've seen up to, well, just shy of 88 today. But to your point, we have come off significantly, and we're actually building some momentum in terms of that sell side activity off that spike high that we saw here. You can see again, it was up around 87.67. And uh, taking a look here again, moving back lower here today now. Uh, it's important to note that oftentimes you don't see late day selling like this in crude. So let's keep an eye on it. Also, uh, oftentimes you do see crude moving in the direction that uh, the indices do. So a little bit of weakness amidst some of those uh, maybe demand concerns. Ultimately, geopolitical tensions had prices elevated not only in crude oil, but as you mentioned, also gold uh, up to 24.24, I think it was today, before coming off a bit. The dollar's been on the rise here. So maybe that's been weighing on crude as well a little bit with the run-up we saw above 105. And I just want to point to how crude has well kind of found its way back in the middle of the range that we've established over the last year. You've got an upper extreme and now nine, around 
95 in the lower extreme down here, again, in uh, this 6870 level. So we're gonna keep an eye on that and basically just watch the area that we're forming right now, small area of consolidation that's been established here around 86. So crude oil is something to watch, right? We're feeding through the inflationary pressures. We've seen prices of the pump on the rise as well. And I think all that combined, and insurance rates, US dollar, all of this to the upside. Gold, even one could argue copper, silver, for that matter, industrial metals are- Gold, and them hills. Uh, raise some of those inflation concerns again. Yeah, inflation certainly is sticky. Ben Lichtenstein, thanks so much. Time now to focus on US taxes with the deadline rapidly approaching. Let's welcome in Ed Schwab, CPA and founder of irahealth.com. Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here at the last minute. Yes, that the last minute is right. I actually just signed my uh, my e-filing uh, a couple days ago, so I guess I, I'm going to miss out on your tips and tricks here for last minute. But the tax deadline, of course, is Monday, April 15th. For oh, yeah. If you haven't already filed, sounds like they're going to have some weekend plans, but what do they need to know right now? All right, don't worry about missing out on the uh, filing tips and tricks, because there are none. Uh, everybody asks that at this time of the year. What can I do last minute? Nothing, unless you have a time machine. Right now, when we're talking about 2023 taxes, that's already in the book. There are very few things you can do at the last minute, other than putting in an IRA, getting a deduction, or contributing to a Roth IRA by April 15th. Other than that, all we're doing now is recording what already happened, recording history. What you should be doing now, maybe you'll be motivated by seeing your taxes, the things you should have done last year and plan better for this year. Things like using up tax brackets. You mentioned coming into this, you talked about inflation being sticky, right? Inflation is bad, it means things cost more. But when it comes to taxes, inflation is great. Brackets have expanded due to cost of living increases. Inflation happens every year. The rates don't change, but more dollars can come out of accounts at lower rates. And the secret, the key to the foundational principle of always paying the least in taxes is to always pay taxes when the rates are the lowest. It's like with stocks, buy low and sell high. I didn't make that one up, but that's a good one to remember too. Buy low, sell high, write that one down. But it's the same thing with the tax bracket. You want to get as much into these low brackets. We're at historically low tax rates right now. More than the lower, as low as you've ever seen in your lifetime, but they're scheduled to go back up after 2025. So after this year, you only have, uh, unless the tax law changes, uh, 2025 to take advantage of these big brackets and get a lot of money out, especially out of your retirement accounts. Remember, that's all taxable income. People taking money from IRAs, maybe take more and get it out while rates are low. Do Roth conversions, get more positioned into tax-free territory. So there's lots of things you can do better by taking advantage of the tax code, those low tax brackets, those big expanded brackets, thanks to inflation, but filling them up. Them up. If, you don't, if you don't use a full bracket, you waste it. You never get it back again. And I'm talking ba uh, brackets of 12%, 22%, 24%. We haven't seen, uh, other than recent years, brackets that low. The idea is to get some of this taxable money out now, especially from retirement accounts, like your IRAs and 401ks, even before you're required to, to pay the tax debt down. Remember, people like to build up their retirement accounts, so that's great. But as you're heading into retirement, they're already there. The key is to get that money out because that tax will have to be paid. It's not if, but when. So as long as it has to be paid, you may as well get it while taxes are on sale, thanks to low rates and inflation. So talk to me a bit more about if you're taking that money out, where you're actually putting it. Well, if you're taking the money out, you can put it anywhere you want. First of all, when I say take money out, just don't take money out of an IRA and put it in a savings account. First, put it in a Roth IRA. Convert to a Roth. Yes, you pay tax, but you'll use those low brackets. Then, once it's in a Roth, whatever you invest in, it will earn income, whatever it earns, say in a stock or fund, wherever you invest, 
any of those gains will grow tax-free, income tax-free, for the rest of your life. That's the reward you get for paying some tax at low rates now. You get the reward of all of those gains being 100% income tax-free for you for the rest of your life, and even under the new tax laws, 10 years beyond for your beneficiaries. There's no question the Roth IRA is the best single account to own because everything, you keep 100%. You don't have to share anything with Uncle Sam. And I don't know if you know this, he's not even your real uncle, so there's no obligation to overpay. I wish he was my real uncle so I could try to try to deal with him. But uh, just in terms of, you know, specifically with Roth, I'm assuming all of this is dependent on income levels as well, right? Because there are limits. No, no, no. See Roth that? No. Because Roth of the tax majority. Majority. Right, right. You can do Roth. But that's not where the big money is. The big money is in Roth conversions where it's an unlimited amount. You're only limited by your pain threshold of how much tax you can pay. But this is where you want to look at the bracket and move more money into Roth. There are no income limits to do a Roth conversion. Anybody can do it. You have to have money to pay the tax. I would think about it, start looking at it. I would not pull the trigger on a Roth conversion until later in the year, November, December, when you have a better projection of what the tax will be because you need to estimate that. You cannot undo a Roth conversion. Once you convert, you will owe the tax even if your financial situation changes later on. But that shouldn't deter you from converting. What you want to do is have an accurate projection of what your income might be. But you won't know that till the end of the year when the capital gains, the funds throw off the capital gain distribution, bonuses, all the year-end income. So start looking at it now, but don't pull the trigger till later in the year. Then next year and in future years, you're planning now for the rest of your life. Taxes shouldn't be one and done each year. You're planning for a tax-free retirement. There's nothing better on earth than an income tax-free retirement. It's the holy grail, the promised land. All right, I need to take some notes here so that I can actually retire. And I'm curious what the biggest mistake that you see people making is when it comes to tax planning or just retirement planning in general. Uh, overpaying taxes, uh, excessive and unnecessary taxes later. Because what I just said, most people, it, what I just said all work. Most, will most people do it? No, because most people are short-sighted. They don't see the benefit of paying some tax now for a tax-free windfall later. That's what you get for your money. You have to plan with the end in mind, the big picture, what you want at the end in retirement. And the last thing you want in retirement is to be surprised by huge tax bills, which I'm worried about because as a CPA, I have to believe in math. And I look at the deficit and debt levels, and at some point, these rates are going to go sky high. And that's not the time you want to be caught in the soup, forking over chunks of your retirement savings that you wanted for your own spending over to Uncle Sam, where that could have been done for pennies on the dollar today. So good advice for those people who are already thinking ahead to next year, for those people who still have to file to get those taxes done, I guess, for 2023. Ed Slot, CPA and founder of IRAhelp.com. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Joe. Have a good one. Still ahead, we'll bring in our panel to discuss this morning's consumer sentiment report and what impact the Fed's approach to battling inflation or how it could impact the Fed's approach to battling inflation. Stay tuned. Ethan, how's my favorite client? Great. I started using Schwab investing themes, so now I can easily invest in trends, like wearable tech. Trends? All that research sounds exhausting. Nope. Schwab's technology does the work. So if I spot an opportunity in robotics Ooh. or pet. Okay, we got a little bit more time, 12 more minutes to power hour. Now, YouTubers, we've been talking about what's going to happen this weekend with Iran. So we're all kind of being a little bit not wanting to hold too much over the weekend. And I'm still bearish for this overbought market. Stocks are way up too much, too fast. I've been in a lot of bubbles and I've missed 
trading every one of them, this one I'd have not missed. I've been short the heck out of it. I'm going to keep doing it because it's way overbought. No matter what these nerds on CNBC tell you, they know it. But they just, they can't, they can't really say it. <laughs> Can you imagine if we get on there and say, hey, this market's way overbought and everybody just tanked the market. People listen to them. There's people actually listen to them. I listen to them with a grain of salt because they're pumpers. One rate cut now. The video is about to my support, but I don't know. We hit the inverse head and shoulders on this PX and a little more, a little more somewhere. federal government should just shut up. If they did, there would be no wars. Especially this one. So Tesla broke out of the flag last week. So we're out, we're out, we're outside the flag. We got an inverse head and shoulders outside of the flag. So I can't wait to see what this is going to do Monday if it holds at 170. We should be looking at POWW. Wow, I figured that'd be up. Gunpowder. Wow. New low on Nile, and I was called Nile out yesterday, or less this week. I don't know about yesterday, but I called it out this week. AMC at two bucks yet? Oh my. AMC's almost to two. 
We're gonna buy it. Calling two bucks. Can't wait to watch the updates on this war if it's going to happen. Okay, what else? Five more minutes. Been a hard day's night. Dow down five percent. Life hack dad. Welcome to the room, life hack dad. Little squeeze up, but not much. I don't even think we'll get that. Now, if Iran doesn't do nothing stupid this weekend, we might have a good week next week. If it goes up, it'll retest the 200 SMA and stop there on the SPX. And spy the same way. The 200 SMA. We pulled down to the right shoulder on NVIDIA today. If you look at the one hour. Apple doesn't care what is happening. It's way undervalued. You see where resistance is, 178.61. Made that double top. So if it pulls back right in here somewhere to hold... For your first entry in only 174.21 on Apple. That'd be high. It could drop below that. But it'd be right on that 21 EMA on the one hour time frame. Let me stand up for a second. I'm getting a little tired. Oh. Oh, turn on the red TV. Schwab. I'm Nicole Petalini, live at the New York Stock Exchange. Catch me on Schwab Network. Available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwab Network. Trading the trending names every day. I'm Tom White, host of Fast Market. Ready for you, ready to go at 12 p.m. Eastern on the Schwab Network. Uh. 
at each and every angle. The whole picture, everything, comes full circle on Trading 360. Catch us right here at the New York Stock Exchange on Trading 360, only on Schwab Network. Welcome to Schwab Network. Daily live exclusive content tailored to today's investors. Broadcasting 24-7 from our studios in Chicago. And from the heart of Wall Street at the New York Stock Exchange. Up to the minute market insights. Example trades and stock specific analysis featuring the smartest minds in the business. No politics. No noise. Analysis ahead of the biggest events for the economy. From bell to bell and beyond. Watch live and on demand. 24-7, seven days a week on schwabnetwork.com and on all your favorite streaming services. Available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwab Network, empowering every investor and trader every market day. <coughs> Binge watch the market with the Schwab Network. Tune in 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at schwabnetwork.com and on all your favorite streaming services. Schwab Network, available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwab Network. Be part of the latest commodities action on Futures with Ben Wolfenstein weekdays at the Eastern of the Schwab This has got to be annoying. Anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Just kind of get off with the commercials. Does anybody have any big plans this weekend? I gotta look for a lawnmower. I don't know if I wanna buy Big Daddy yet or not. Two acre, about an acre, two acres. And then 30 more where I wanna make a trail. Did anybody study, study chart patterns last weekend, YouTubers? Anybody study chart patterns last weekend? Study them patterns. That's kind of an interesting one there. One, two, three, you can tear out with me, trade with me. It is now three minutes after two. Rodden day. Still red. I wouldn't be doing too being too brave.
The dollar and bonds didn't really match so much, but that's okay, they don't have to. The dollar and gold didn't really match so much, but that's okay, they don't have to. Crude oil was also up a lot, and crudes come back in. So it looks like some of the sort of ancillary moves, namely crude and gold, have eased up. So that makes today a little bit easier to understand. I think the best way to explain it is the tech trade failing to break out and carry us. That's a big deal because we've seen generally contained volatility throughout this year, but it's starting to pick up. Look at the VIX. Finally, the VIX waking up. Why? Well, we've got lower lows in the S&P. Yesterday's bounce back came up short of the pre-CPI level in the S&P. However, for the NASDAQ, actually didn't. But today with the NASDAQ unwinding and tech softening up, there's really nowhere to hide. Puts so paid good day. Hide, then you have some explanation for why we get bonds bid, the dollar bid, and things start to make a little bit more sense just through the lens of our momentum trade slowing down. And it's really important to remember that that was a theme coming into this week. Very important. Even before inflation really scared us on Wednesday and set in motion this whole reflation theme with the breakout in the two year, the breakout in the dollar, the breakout further in the tens, we already had some slowing in the momentum trade led by NVIDIA, led by semiconductors. They've been going sideways now for about a month, about four weeks. The big move here for the week is in the two year yield. That's where our focus needs to remain. So the two major themes are where our attention should be. The breakout in the two year, the breakout in the dollar. But the breakout in the twos and the tens, especially the twos are really important this week because it puts the old highs of yield back within reach. The twos had actually been in the range for the last couple months while the 10 year was breaking out. So this is different. This is not just growth, which could power the 10 year yield. This is now also policy that's on the short end, connected to the Fed, with power into two-year yield. That puts those one-year highs from two and tens back within reach. The dollar also and its strength this week, which is a bit of a catch-all, too. When investors don't know what to do right now, they buy the dollar. Gold works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Today it started out real strong, and it fizzled out. It's been on a heck of a run. Can't blame it too much. Crude oil also came off too, though, so it was likely had this delayed geopolitical fear of, from a couple of headlines earlier this week that suddenly hit this morning, and then they gave it back up because there were some pretty nasty geopolitical headlines around the Middle East between Iran and Israel. That was basically all week, Wednesday, yesterday, Tuesday. So why it hit this morning, I don't know. Maybe we just had to get through all the inflation stuff first for the market to think about other subjects. But the bottom line is it's still not the major mover here is the major mover is inflation and now the tech trades slow down in momentum can hit back with me you think this afternoon is a little bit easier to figure out than this morning Kev? well in some ways man, some things make more sense like how about a 98 point range in gold future <laughs> yeah pretty wild think about that yeah we were talking about it this morning how the dollar is up and gold's up look at the turnaround there mm -hmm. technically that's got to be problematic for if you're long gold. Yeah. But the dollar cost. Maybe it finally ran out of steam. Exactly. Maybe the dollar but finally applied enough pressure. A hundred point range. Yeah. I don't know if you how many times oh, it's not. That in gold is <coughs> often. But I think the geopolitics uh -oh. is playing a pretty significant role today. I think Sounds to me like they're gonna surround him. Gonna have to take out the Iranian regime.
this. And what one, Yoko? We got a double bottom on the spy. We got a double bottom on the spy, but I don't know. I don't. I think it just. Who'd want to buy into this weekend? If anything, it'd probably drop. Five oh nine. Where is that? So we're still on the nine. We're just now starting to get below it. So if shit goes down, four ninety two ninety seven next. Four ninety two ninety seven for next week on spy. I want to see how these guys handle it because they've not put any of this geopolitical issues into the market and now they're talking about it so they think, sound like they think this could be something serious
Earnings is, it's, it's really about the reaction to earnings because we know earnings are going to be great from these mega caps. I mean, they're, they're looking at 30% earnings growth year over year. I mean, these are for trillion dollar plus companies. It's remarkable. And so that's the difference between, say, a 1999 or a, a period where the concentration was in companies that were overvalued, clearly. Um, today, you've got companies like Alphabet and Meta and all them trading at 20 to 25 times and they're growing as i said uh at those rates as well so i think you want to be careful here just <laughs> saying one day is is driving my investment decision making um but yeah the the dollar could pose a problem mm. and it has been going up but the but it's been it <coughs> down considerably earlier in the year and perhaps a lot of that was due to what we're finding out i'm not going to listen to you boy selling of dollars and buying gold which we've seen around around the world. So um, now that that's coming to light and it's known information, uh, perhaps that's they've all been saying the same thing, and the market's again, dropping. High I keep hearing the same story. Uh, you want to be a buyer of that? Okay. To uh, that point, maybe framing it this way: if VIX popping is an opportunity to buy, and you look at the market right now with the high concentration that it's at. Do you buy the index, which gives you that concentration, or do you buy other stuff to offset then? Is buying the dip right now effectively levering up on the same momentum trades, or is the other option to go buy stuff that might be sensitive if inflation becomes a problem again? Yes, we prefer a, a stock picker's market, if you will. Um, we own the mega caps and have been very happy with them and continue to be, but we're, we're certainly not actively buying them. And so, yes, there are other areas of the market that continue to show strength, financials, industrials, um, communication services, obviously, Alphabet and, and Meta that mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. But, you know, we're, we're looking for, again, those opportunities to actually increase the positions because, mm -hmm. as you know, and, and most investors know, that they're they're underweight those mega caps if they're sort of not buying the index generally speaking so we want to look for opportunities to buffett's doing good in oxycontin meantime we're seeing oxy elsewhere. the banks feel okay about dipping in there on a week where the two-year yield is blowing out again last time the curve inverted like this we had some regionals that went bankrupt about a year later right i think that Today might not be the day. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've preferred companies like J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway, for example, Got it. Uh, where they're not, you know, not your regional banks. Uh, they don't rely on one thing for business. And so we prefer a diversified approach. So, you know, look, if you don't own any J.P. Morgan and you want to own it, uh, today is the day that you start accumulating. Maybe you don't buy all of it today, but... It, it, that's the quality stuff that historically, consistently has provided downside protection. And for us, for our clients, that's the main focus, number one. Number two is the growth, and we believe we have that with the, the best businesses in their industry. And then the other thing investors need to really focus on is what's your dividend growth? Because you talk about the index, and while the S&P obviously has been a remarkable performer over very long periods of time, um, you know, the dividend growth has been mid single digits, and there are a lot of other companies out there, but, you know, growing their dividend at 
10% plus. And so if you're seeing a lot of that, that's a signal to the market that business is strong. And so when you see these flare-ups from time to time, VIX pops, geopolitical, and all this kind of stuff, historically, if you go back, you will see it's been a nice buying opportunity three, six, 12 months hence. Okay. So you think this is generally short-term geopolitical-driven stuff, not a reawakening of the stock bond bear market we got a couple of years ago? Real quick, Craig. It, it's it's, it's profit-taking, right? It's, it's okay. tax season. <laughs> We've also got that. Uh, people have to pay a lot of taxes on Monday. And so um, I wouldn't put a, a whole lot into this week's action. While okay. with that said, the S&P is at its 50-day moving average. So we need to see it show some strength if this if this uptrend is going to continue. If it doesn't, well, we could be in for a longer correction. Got it. All right. Thanks, Craig. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Craig Sarenbach, Bartlett Wealth Management. All right. I'm faced by a little dippage here. Ready to buy dips, like in the JP Morgan dip too, coming up. Let's talk Apple and the AI trade. Kind of a big week for Apple. Yesterday had a huge move, even bigger than Nvidia's, and unlike pretty much all else in the mega cap trade it's holding on to its strength today apple trying to stay green with 40 minutes left my dad was a hard worker he used to do side jobs installing windows charging something like 100 bucks a window when other guys were charging four or five hundred bucks he just didn't want to do that he's proud of the price of his your dad gave us a deal one time. Mom had a stroke, and your dad knocked on the door, and he said, I'd like to replace all your windows, and I'll just charge you for one. I, tears falling out of my eyes. Your dad was the best. I'd be proud of your dad. On spy.
You've got a double bottom head and shoulders out of a snake to the 200 here in the close. Ryan Day, are y'all on it? Probably. When you're not, you see the head and shoulders and the double bottom? This is where I took it last time, right here. Check this out. This is where I took it last time. We landed right there, and then we created a head and shoulders. So that would have been the spot to take it. Then try to break this one, two, three to the 200. Or to this line. But I wouldn't take, like you said, hey, we're taking the risk, not knowing what's coming up this weekend. This could be, I don't know. To just sit here all, you know, worried about this war continuously every day and why the market doesn't understand it. And then all of a sudden, they have some kind of concerns. Like a genocide didn't mean nothing to them. Now they have a heart. I'm probably never, well, I probably, I know I won't. I'll never vote Democrat ever again. Even if it's my best friend, I ain't going to do it. going to be the way to play this rally what do you think i mean i think it's hard to fight technological innovation in this country this country was built on innovation and people like my parents who immigrated here in search for better oh with yang tang productivity so in the long run it's extremely difficult to be anything but super bullish innovation true all right so it's hard to stop the you know engine when it leaves it's hard to stop the train when it leaves the station but it does, uh, you know, slow down, speed up, depending on uh, the needs and uh, the prices we're paying for them. How much of what's gone on the last oh. six months is appropriate? How much of it is too much, too fast? Walk me through the way you're kind of thinking of some of these tech valuations. Yeah, so I think we've had a very frothy risk market the last six months. Uh, we had two consecutive double-digit return quarters and large cap equities. And if you actually look at the credit market, IG credit spreads are all time tight. In fact, the all in IG corporate yield right now is about the same as one month T-bills. That actually hasn't occurred since 2006, 2007. Um, in the meantime, you know, on the rate side, we've actually gone from thinking about seven rate cuts at the beginning of this year to now just under two. Um, and, you know, one part of this is the innovation story, right? Like, it's just without a doubt that this is the most innovative, productive economy in the world. And this is where people want to park their capital. Uh, and we have strength in the real economy. But one thing that I think investors really haven't talked enough about is just the sheer amount of ample liquidity in the system. You know, if you go back to COVID, we did 26% of GDP in fiscal stimulus, which was twice the developed nation average. And then on top of that, our government did three large fiscal spending bills. Wow, I just, bill. this guy is. Bill. And now we're doing a semiconductor bill. These are all great things, but the same. This guy was thinking the same thing this morning. You know, I've been talking about, they've, they've printed $6 trillion in the past three years. But I didn't think about every year the deficit has been $2 trillion more. So it's like $12 trillion. in the past three years, four years of unfunded new printed money. And it's just crazy. Rate of change and turn And he just brought it up and I was thinking that thing this morning out loud. More splashy promises by the government. We do have an election coming up, and I imagine there's probably some splashy promises coming. 
We already heard literally on Inflation Day that Biden says we're still going to get a cut. Uh, but if we don't get anything from the Fed and if the fiscal is frozen till after the election, does that make it harder for there to be a pure liquidity trade? I do. I think it's harder, right? Because, you know, this inflation data on the whole was not that. Oh, Randy, have a procedure? I didn't know that. Thanks for asking. <laughs> not been proven and also has not been disproven. Um, and if that leads to a when to if conversation in 24 about cuts, that you is better a correct that. Difficult, difficult one for the market to take. We're to the, the right, right shoulder now. now. The Fed has been doing QT. They're thinking about slowing down QT because they're worried about bank reserves. And unfortunately, bank reserves are one of those things where it's hard to pinpoint. Uh, and on top of that, you know, the first really repo facility has gone from 2.5 trillion at the peak a couple of years ago to under 500 billion dollars. Uh, and, you know, like a liquidity driven rally needs more liquidity to keep driving. So if you pause for a bit and people decide to pull out in a frothy market and try to cash out, it's going to make Q2 and Q3 much tougher for investors. OK. Uh, how do we weather that storm? I know that you run an income fund, so feel free to tell me about that. Is uh, the way to go right now through more shareholder friendly style dividend paying companies? Uh, if bonds are our other option for income and inflation's warming up, should we go for equity income instead? Yeah, I think income is a great place to be. One of the things we've been highlighting all year is the declining correlation between stocks and bonds. Um, our income ETF, ticker VWI, is an optimization. We look for the right amount of dividend stocks and bond ETFs to maximize current income while minimizing portfolio volatility. So all you want is you want assets that have high income, low volatility, but they're decorrelated. And this is a great environment for our product because correlation between stocks and bonds and stocks themselves has been declining all year. When correlation declines, overall portfolio volatility can also decrease while still maintaining the same market exposure. So we find our product to be an extremely attractive place to be. We find actually multi-asset portfolios adding duration and bonds to your portfolio here, also a great place to be for investors with different goals. Um, and we see the continuing correlation continuing all year because the longer the Fed waits to cut, the more ample room they have to cut in the case of either financial conditions tightening or the real economy me slow it down okay and uh what's the main uh income you're relying on uh for the fund it seems like this is right within the description for vwi absolute income what's the main driver of that yeah so we have 79 percent uh dividend stocks 21 percent okay. bond etfs and the dividend stocks are actually great especially for retirement investors um, think of it this way, you get high income, you have minimal portfolio volatility, and the 79% dividend stocks gives you potential for capital appreciation. And we know dividend stocks in general are one, higher quality, two, they tend to be more mature cash flow businesses, and they increase their payout, you know, at or above the rate of inflation historically.
Good morning, retail traders. Bam. Bingo. Head and shoulders. Out. Two left shoulder, two right shoulder. Then you had a gravestone, inverted hammer. Bam, that's nice. Inverse head and shoulders, left shoulder, left shoulder, right shoulder, right. Mixed in, oh shit. Mixed in right. 
extend left. And I like how that I like how that goes up. The higher highs. And if you can count to four, you can make a little bit mo. If you can count to three, you can trade with me. But if you count to four, you might make a little bit mo. One, two, three, four. Damn, baby. Man, I can't believe it took me so long to get to this level. I've seen guys start trading and be millionaires in a couple of years. Three years. Four years. 
five years, and I sit around. What takes so long? <laughs> it was kind. Of, it wasn't. It wasn't easy for me at all. And finally realized, man, I'm just attitude coming in here and always wanting to be the best, trade and didn't want to just didn't take it serious enough. Always clean this gym may help you. Hello? All right, how are you? You like fishing? You ever catch white bass? That's kind of rude. <laughs> Anybody ever catch white bass? You're still in the red overall. And we're gonna fix that. We're gonna fix that. I think we gotta be, we gotta be, the market's definitely is waking up a few people. They're still questioning if it's a bear or not. And it's obvious that it is. You know, I get to thinking more and more. And I think sometimes it might have to do with the way you think about politics. They talked about this this week at the beginning of the week, and it's starting to kick in now. Because there's two, I mean, these two different channels. One talks about politics and one doesn't. I've been listening to CNBC for, I probably went without it for about seven years. Out of the 20. When I traded with Vegas, I didn't listen to it. I just looked at their faces. <laughs> I could tell... I traded with them so long I could look at their faces and know what kind of day it was going to be. Well, we've got a few more minutes left, and I'm going to watch videos and get up, caught up on the news. I'll put out a weekend watch list again of the Tony and Jim, and a lot of these are red today. The whole watch list is red, all but the Donald, the Donald and Apple. 
So these are all the bubbles. A lot of these in here are, are bubbles. Meta. $88 all the way to 531 See, <laughs> God, I wish they weren't so stupid on CNBC. It looks like we might have froze up here. slightly lower right now, but PIMCO's Mohamed El Arian posting on X this morning that central banks are increasingly looking to gold as a way to hedge against geopolitical risks. Goldman's new price target for gold now $2,700. So analysts do seem to think there is more room for upside here, Scott, from looking at gold. Appreciate that. Seema Modi, thank you. You want to uh, weigh in on what's happening with gold here? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those um, things where you can kind of construct your narrative because real rates have been going up. It used to be that's what mattered for gold. There obviously was a technical breakout. You absolutely see capital flight into it. People are unnerved about whatever it might be, whether it's treasury supply uh, or the deficit or geopolitics. That said, just sheer vertical momentum in gold that recently has gotten it, you know, way up in thin air. And that's why I do think that you can look at the fact that it sort of lost a little bit of the juice midday uh, as, as something that I think is, is probably a positive, that it's not just going to completely blast higher. Sure. Well, I mean, it is key, I would think, for, for next week as well, that we break the commodity and dollar fever. Yeah, this reflation uh, trade, it, it's fine as long as it's really kind of following global growth expectations and things like that. Um, really, uh, just outsized moves in individual agricultural contracts and things like that, I think uh, it makes it seem as if there's a little more behind it in terms of just fast money grabbing on these things. And, and you know, it, it has an inflation push aspect to it. But I do think that uh, it's getting a lot of adherence all of a sudden, this idea that commodities uh, are, are someplace where, you don't, you know, if you're looking for something to diversify. Yeah, I don't get this guy sometimes. But I understand him. I was got to thinking about him the other day. He just tells you how it tells you how what's happening. He doesn't give you a forecast or oh yeah, this is doing this and that's doing that and all well, doing that and that's it. Which a lot of people do their videos. They'll say, well, the, the, the SPX is here and something. I don't know what his job is though. Besides that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have him in my room. So, I'm going to, I think I'm going to try to do a lesson on, on not to hold, not to hold, not to hold stocks. If you're stuck in a stock and your gut's, your gut's telling you, if you question you're in the trade, if you're in the trade and all of a sudden it starts to drop or it starts to break out, like today, you saw it, I was up 350 bucks and then three minutes later, I'm down 150. It should have took my profit when I was talking about it. My gut was telling me I'm up 350, I should take the profit. But I didn't. I sat there and watched it. And then it tanked. And then I'm, I sit there and, you know, had to fiddle my way out of it and end up small loss. And then end up buying it and making a huge trade later. But I, I took the small loss because, you know, I'm Friday. World War Three might break out this weekend. Somebody gets nuked. People, you know, the market doesn't take this serious as much as I do. I'm, I'm an anti. I don't like war. I used to be a big liberal, but not. I, I there's no way I can join their party now. The way they they argue and divide and everything. 
So yeah, that that always been playing a part of me the way I traded 2022. We were in a war with Russia. We were paying for a war. We have commodity problems, you know. It, it, and all of a sudden, this this thing, this this Red Sea over here, this in Iran, ain't causing any kind of commodity problems. That's bull crap. <laughs> they got to blow it off. Like, okay, you know, I heard a conversation. Well, we we managed that problem, so we're managing this one now, is because we learned from the last one. War. So I've been, 2022, there was a war going on. All I could do was just day trade and scalp. There's no way I was going to swing that market. And we had, a, we had one of the biggest drops we ever had. And then it caused one of the biggest runs we ever had. I mean, that I've ever seen in my lifetime of trading. I've watched, the, I was here during the Obama crash. I watched it dip every day and I watched it bounce back up. It didn't take six months for it to return to site. It took three years. These people did so bad in 2022. They had their worst record ever. 15% of the hedge fund managers made it green. 15%. This year... 2023 and 24, they've made more money than they have their whole entire career. And they don't want to, <laughs> you know, it's hard to, it's like being a rock star, you know, you get plotted every day and all of a sudden nobody applauds you anymore. You're going, oh. And I was screaming it back when they were cheap. Because they were cheap. They were so cheap. I, you know, I've been there before. I've been there before during the Obama crash. They were cheap, and I was screaming it. I screwed General Motors at 50 cents a fucking share. And I was telling people, man, load it up. This is 50 cents a share. Bank of America at five bucks. I said, man, if you ain't buying Bank of America now, A oil company that was a hundred dollars a share of stock that went down to a buck, and it ran all the way back to a hundred. When I mean, they were cheap, but they're they're not cheap no more. It's way too expensive, and I'm gonna wait for the next crash, and I'm gonna get I'm, gonna, I'm loading the boat next time when I start screaming cheap. I could have made a ton of money if I just, I, I made, I mean, I swung four stocks in 2023. Facebook. Um, Tesla. Apple. And Boeing. They were cheap. Tesla had a hundred bucks. Boeing at 120. Nvidia, gosh, I wish I'd have bought that. But they were cheap. They're just not cheap no more. And I'm not going to fall for these people pumping this market. $108. All the way up to a thousand. That is, I'm telling you, it's just, they're just way overbought. I've never seen thing turn around so fast. It just, it's, it, it's, it, it's a bubble. And it's political. 
It's led. It's 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 most. I think most of it's got to do with politics. The six trillion dollars for one. That's you know, they can't keep that off their mind. But I'm what I'm trying to say is, if 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 it's not working, you need to get out and regroup. It's better to take the smallest loss you can, because your body, your mind, and your yourself is going to tell you that if you question your trade, you you know that there's a reason. It's good to get out safe, and then later, if it pops, it pops. But if it drops, you're going to ah, so, <laughs> save four or five hundred bucks, and don't throw all your biscuits, all your eggs in one basket. Take baby steps on small accounts. Little by little, if you can make sixty bucks a day on a thousand dollar account, and multiply that every day, five times, and you made thirty percent on your trade in a week. But that's only you're only making sixty bucks, and when you're at an overbought market, your spreads are going to be a lot bigger, and you can make a lot more. And you got to have a lot more patience. We've seen a lot of megaphone patterns. A lot of them. And I haven't seen any megaphone patterns in here for three years. All of a sudden, I'm seeing megaphone. They're, all I was seeing in 2023 uh, at the beginning, I was all I was seeing was triple bottoms. Now all I'm seeing is inverse head and shoulders. And these megaphones... And falling wedges, a lot of falling wedges. Seem like they come in sequence, these patterns do, and they kind of describe what kind of market you're in. You see a lot in ascending triangles, and you're in a bullish market. A lot of rising wedges. You see a lot of expansion patterns, you're in a decisive market. So falling, falling wedge, you're, you're, you know, you're in maybe a, a sell-off, fast little shakeout or some bad news hit it or something. <coughs> you can get back in it or it's just plain overbought, hit a hard resistance and people are taking profit. So try to be safe with your money at these high levels. Now, I know guys that are making a killing I mean, they're, I, I can't, it, I've been trading 20 years and everybody's different, but I found it so easy and chartable just to trade the SPY and the SPX. I, I, thought I, can, I, can have, I can have more fun just trading them, playing music, watching a few videos, taking 10 minute, 15 minute breaks. After a good trade, coming back in, buying the dip, doing the same thing, be done in three minutes, go into the kitchen, cook a grilled cheese sandwich, come back in here, be set up right then, and not sit here and look at this computer eight hours every second of the day. But I do it. And I'm probably going to have to come to an end sometime. So I can enjoy the rest of my life. I'm 63. And I know I ain't going to be, you know, I got 20 years left in me. 30. 10. <laughs> Will I die over and have a heart attack and not spend my money? We're way overbought, and I'm not going to let these guys talk me into it. They do it every time. And then they don't admit to, oh, well, we were wrong. We're in a new gig economy. So I've, I've seen the dot-com bubble come in, change everything. 
uh, I seen the uh, 911 right after the dot com era. Then I seen wars, Kuwait, Afghanistan. I seen the the big the 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 Bitcoin bubble. The pennies were just like point zero zero one to two three bucks, and they all went back to zero. I seen the COVID bubble. Stocks ran four or five hundred percent, then tanked. I'm seeing this bubble that happened within months of something that's not even been tested yet. I've seen the EV car bubble. Stocks run from a dollar to sixty to seventy to a hundred bucks. I've seen all the bubbles and they never want them pulled back. Are you going to tell me that these stocks that run eight, nine hundred percent in six months are not going to correct themselves that haven't been proven yet? No, ain't going to happen. So that's why I've created that little watch list. I'm going to catch these both these knives. For example, Tesla, we know. I'm, you know, I haven't been trading Tesla hardly at all because it just the EV sector is 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 gone to poop. They're talking about hyper hyper cars now. You know, Ford and General Motors. They can't do the EV. The only one that can get away with the EV is China and Tesla for right now, and they're you know they're just upset about it. But we're set up here. It can definitely drop a little bit more and start to be a real strong buy. But it's on the list. Then we had AMD, big bubble on AMD. From 54 bucks all the way up to 227 in a year and a half. Big bubble on NVIDIA, 108 all the way to almost a thousand. You know, it supports right around 500. Always clean. This is Jim. May I help you? Yes, we study kangaroo rats here at the Institute of Wally Wally Wawa. Would you like to join? The membership is only $12,000 for your first month, $24 for the second year. Thank you. Okay. See, big bubbles. They're going to explode and drop huge. Now, Amazon, we've got a triple top on the three-year time frame. They're pumping the hell, heck out of Amazon to break this triple top. What do I say about triple tops? Time to take profit. Google, we broke resistance. They've been pumping both Amazon and Google big time. I do believe Google's undervalued and very cheap, but... It's still up a hundred percent, but I'm I'm yeah, I'm bullish on it. I like Google, I do. It can go higher, but when I see something break out, I'm gonna buy the support. I ain't gonna buy it now. Again, they were pumping China this week. They do it every week. And again, China did not take the bait. Knife again. They were pumping the stock at the beginning of the week, and then all of a sudden we lost all the air in the tire. 
TSM's got that new good news going on. So I did not trade it because it was already popping on the news. But now I know that this stock has, you know, it's real good news. And something that I need to keep an eye on, TSM. And we're at the 200. I mean, this could be tradable next week. This is real good news for TSM. Now we have a pullback. Any, anything more like head and shoulders? Inverse head and shoulders down here or down here would be a very strong buy at 136. So I'm waiting for it. And I'll take it on 20 day. I love this stock. That's just because I love it don't mean I want to trade it yet. Meta, way overpriced. Way overpriced. From 207 all the way to 530 in a year, up over 250%. Disney, we called the bottom on Disney. It's way overpriced. This was sell sell into the news, buy on rumor. And I was pumping this stock down here at the triple bottom when it was cheap this year, six months later. So it got the news, let it come down and hit the 63. I'd set an alert right there at 110. Catch it on the 63 EMA. Boeing still getting the bad news. We got a year, new year low this week. Boeing sucks. They're pumping Boeing. We definitely hit my spot. So we could start to consolidate and have a little trade for oh, $10, $11. Definitely set up. Boeing's ready, maybe, for the fat cats to trade it for a short $10. But it's definitely ready. You got the W here. This is what I've been waiting for. We hit it today. So it's definitely ready. Probably got triggered my alert, and I just didn't hear it. Adobe, they're pumping the heck out of Adobe. I said no. We were too much up here at the high resistance of a head and shoulders. I said, don't do it. Don't do it. And it's pulled back. Pulled back over 100 and, um, $180. We're at the bottom of my channel. I still think it's way overpriced. I'm going to take it at 453 Get it on this here where I see all this con congestion. Way overpriced. 274 up to 650 in a year and a half. I ain't falling for it. And I didn't fall for it. I said I'm going to wait for the pullback, and I did. But I like it. If I do under 100 bucks, I really like this trade. If China starts to pop, I'll go long. The Donald hit my support level. 32 bucks. SMCI, big bubble. Huge bubble. It's up thousand percent in a year and a half. Way too much. I won't trade this. I'll, I'll trade it. But I ain't calling it out now. I called it out when we first when the when the bubble bursted 
and I traded it a few times because that's the best time to trade it. People are stuck in the trade. People are stuck in it and got to get out of it. So it's still way too damn high. I mean, I'm not paying. If I was going to go long in this stock, there's no way. No way. And here's another one. Netflix, 315 all the way to 639, up 100% in a year. Hedge fund manager would be happy to get 25 out of it. Lulu took a hit. I got a 321 support level at a double bottom on the yearly. I'll take I'll go long once we hit that support level. 321. We got Lily. Another one that's been way overbought. Way overbought. It needs to drop a good hundred points. We got a strong pipeline. And Mr. Another one. 266 in a year all the way up to $2,000. <laughs> Crypto stock. <laughs> That's the biggest bubble of them all. So, we'll just have to see. Hopefully, Iran doesn't do something stupid. I think, you know, Israel's serious. It's same as Russia. Putin says, you know, it's our sovereignty. We'll do what it takes. And if that's to nuke America, we'll do it. One president screwed this whole world up. So we'll catch you all later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Josh. Y'all have a great weekend. Mannequin, thank you. Mo. Anybody else that's listening out there, just be real careful in this market. Don't listen to these goons on CNBC. That's what they get paid for. Just pump these markets. And just keep looking for the dip. We'll catch y'all later.